So there are two sort of completely independent issues coming up now. The, his hermene the hermeneutic situation that he's in, that is, his sort of methodological considerations, and then the nature of selfhood. There's no particular connection as far as I can see. They just happen to be both in the same section. Uh, maybe that's another sign of haste. Is there a connection? You, you're looking any more than any with any subject. Of course, the, the hermeneutical method is going to get you connected to everything. But anyway, let's go on and do them. And if it turns out as we talk about them that there is a deeper connection than I realize, we can, we can deal with it. So the first one is the methodological issue. And I just want to constantly sort of stress my reordering of it. It looks like finally with guilt, conscience, resoluteness, death, anticipatory re resoluteness, historicality, fate, and destiny, we now ought to have the whole of authentic Dasein in our grasp. But anything short of that, we wouldn't. So it's a good, so that's why I think you have to put all those pieces together first, and then you get to a point where you ask, what's, have we now got the, the whole of the phenomena so that we can, uh, and, and how are we going to, and what kind of whole have we got and how are we going to deal with it? Uh, and it, it seems, we remember we didn't know what whole meant uh, and why somehow you didn't have a whole at the, when he starts the problem and brings in death and the ahead of itself. I think it becomes pretty clear that normally by whole he means the total uh, structure of Dasein and what's funny is he's got the total structure of Dasein when he's got the structure of care and he's got the structure of care already in division one so it's still not clear to me what the, what is missing he seems to be using I as far as I can see synonymously Dasein being authentic being whole and the totality of the, the totalness of the phenomena being exhibited in what Dasein is doing. Uh, I'll just read you 358, one of the places where you get these three all coming together. At the beginning, well, the very first sentence of that section on the hermeneutic situation. And um, by the way, I, was, I saw... I see. Well, care and selfhood aren't in the same section. I said they were. They're just contiguous. Uh, and selfhood might as well be there as anywhere. So let's go back to now. At the very beginning on 60, section 63, so in its anticipatory resoluteness, Dasein has now been phenomenally, has been made phenomenally visible with regards to its possible authenticity and totality. And I'm pretty sure that the authenticity totality is the same as the whole. And we've now made it visible. Uh, this is connected with the thing I said at first. Yeah, but how he wouldn't be able to say that if he, if he wasn't lucky enough to be reordered by me because he wouldn't have everything there in its totality in whole yet. He'd have a lot of, lots of explaining to do about historicality at the, at the very least coming up. But, he, but he's got it the way we've got it. We've got it all total and whole. And now he tells us that when we go, as we study Dasein, we're always in a hermeneutic circle. And that's a new, that's why this is a, the hermeneutic situation. And it's interesting that he, he seldom ever makes explicit the, the sort of rules of the game of doing a hermeneutic analysis. He goes over to that very fast. It's funny how famous he is, I guess thanks to Gadamer for having introduced the hermeneutic method, when he says practically nothing about it. But he does say, when he introduces it, that, it, that there's a forehaba, a forzicht, and a foregrift, a forehaving, a foresight, and a foreconception, he gets translated, involved in a hermeneutic investigation and that it moves in a circle. And he's going to bring up explicitly the circle. But if you look for it, you can see that he's doing the four Habla, four Zicht, four Griff story um, as, uh, from the very beginning of the section. If you just, I'll read you the little pieces. The next sentence says, 
the hermeneutic situation, which was previously inadequate for interpreting the meaning of the being of care, now has the required primordiality. Dasein has been put into that which we have in advance. See, that's the for having. And this has been done primordially. Um, that is to say, this has been done with regard to its authentic ability to be a whole. See, there's the whole coming in again. The idea of existence which guides us. Well, now, stop with that. So the first thing is we've got in our for having the whole uh, structure of Dasein, and, and we, don't, we don't so much have it because we're in it. We, we are it, and that turns out to be important. Uh, you have to think, well, Heidegger's telling you, that, uh, and he'll come back to this, I will at the end, that he's authentic and that he's speaking from within a, a total understanding or experience primordial experience of what it is to be Dasein. Um, on 360, there's more about that. Um, well, I'm, I'm getting it out of the sentence at the end of the top paragraph. Every ontologically explicit question about Dasein's being has had the way prepared for it by the kind of being which Dasein has. That's a reference to the four having. That's, that says, in effect, it's from within it that Dasein is going to describe it. And then he, he comes to the four zisch, that is the you, the foresight, and th there he says, the idea of existence which guides us is as that which we see in advance, that's foresight, uh, has been made definite by the clarification of our own most potentiality, the ability to be, and, and, we've, and now that we've con concretely worked out the structure of Dasein's being, its peculiar ontological character has become so plain uh, as compared with everything present at hand, that Dasein's existentiality has been grasped in advance. That's the four concept. That, that is, grasped in advance with sufficient articulation to give sure, sure guidance for working out the existentialia conceptually. See that, so we now, that's somehow a four conception. I don't find all that very illuminating, but that he never explains enough about what these terms mean, that, that you know whether, why he's sort of got them in here, but he, I mean, I'm just telling you what he clearly thinks, that's, uh, that, they're, that he's operating out of a four having, and he's got a particular sense, that he's, he's already committed to looking at existence, which is the being that takes a stand on its own being. So we've got, we're inside of an understanding of, of being and of understanding of Dasein. We've got as our way of describing that it's being, it, that what's essential about it is that it's being is an issue f for it. And we've got as our goal to work out the existentialia conceptually sounds sort of strange to me. Sometimes he says articulate them. I, I mean, I don't know what he means by conceptual, but it's now gotten such a meaning that it sounds too, too much like a lot of intentional content. Or, uh, but all, all it means is that he's going to now spell out and describe in explicit detail the, the aspects of the existential structure of Dasein. Now, so far, and, and we're always moving in a hermeneutic circle, he's telling us, on 358. On 358? I don't, I'm, I'm surprised. Let's, well, that's totally. The circle, yeah, 350. Well, what I just read is moving in the hermeneutic circle. I, I, I just, that is to say we are inside it. Um, and that's all that we're going to hear about the hermeneutic circle for a bit. Because the, a great big issue comes up in the next paragraph on 359, and I have to talk about it where it comes up. And it, to me, it, it's very important, and maybe it isn't important to anybody else, and maybe I made it up, but, and, and you know, worry about it. But I think there are two different meanings of falling, and, or three, really. One of them means being absorbed in what you're doing. Another one means, uh, I think, being so uh, well, I, I, it'll get clear when I, I, I can only 
explain it when we're in it, so let me tell, tell you more. But he's going to explain why. Let's try this angle. That he's going to tell us right now, but I'm going to come back to it, that when you do this kind of hermeneutic study, of Dasein anyway, you have to do violence to the subject, you have to wrest the truth from the subject, and so forth. Now, that means at least you have to do formal indication. And we're going to come back to that too in a minute. But what I think is that there are two utterly different reasons that he's giving, uh, going to give us. And he doesn't have them very distinguished. I'll show you a place where he messes up, I think, right, in putting the two different ones together in one sense. And what are the two different ones? One is, coming up right now in italics, we, uh, we, the entity which in each case we ourselves are is ontologically that which is farthest. And remember, that goes back to Division One that the being of Dasein is nearest and farthest away. And that's the claim, I think, that, when, that the background of intelligibility it has to be transparent and not something you can study or not something you normally thematize and not something you can ever completely thematize. It helps to think of it as the illumination in the room. The, it's, the, just as the illumination isn't something you see, but it's that on the basis of which you are able to see things. So what Heidegger thinks is our understanding of being isn't something that you normally thematize and think about, but it's that in this famous word, the, that vor auf hin, everything is intelligible. Remember, being is that on the basis of which, that's the vor auf hin, everything is understood. And I'm saying the basis of which part of this is, is the background, and the background is pervasive and near so pervasive and near that it's hard to uh, talk about. It's it's and it's covered up in in that structural way, and that's one of the meanings of falling. Because so far, I'm just he hasn't said anything about wh why it's nearest or or why the, why what's ontologic what why what he wants to talk about is ontologically farthest away. And he's going to go on now and say something that sort of, sort of ch goes in a different direction. Our being amidst the things with which we concern ourselves most closely in the world, a being which is falling, guides the everyday way in which Dasein is interpreted and covers up ontically Dasein's authentic being so that the ontology which is directed toward this entity is denied an appropriate basis. That's, that's still compatible with don't, you can't understand the background, the, the understanding of being. Normally, you, you understand things in our vocabulary and our way of studying is, is directed at things. And that's, that's covering up our understanding of our being as we deal with particular beings. And that's one meaning of falling. A little further, the primordial way in which this entity is presented as a phenomenon is anything but obvious. Even if even ontology approximately follows the course of the everyday interpretation of Dasein, then and now you d begin to get this sort of violent language. The laying bare of Dasein's primordial being must rather be wrested from Dasein by following the opposite course t than taken by the falling ontico tendency of interpretation. Well, now. Falling is also fleeing, in which Dasein is motivated to cover up its structure. I don't know, I haven't got a reference to the word fleeing yet, but it will come around. Uh, or if it doesn't, anyway, it has to be in there, because if the cover up is an, an attempt to hide something, and there's two, there's, there's, what can what is hard to get a grip on because we don't have the right kind of concepts and so forth. That's this structural story about how it is hard to do the to have a theory of the a the, or an account a phenomenological account of the structure of the background. That I wouldn't call that a cover up, but uh, but what, whether but that he says that Dasein covers up its its authentic being. That, and, and that you have to 
do violence to find it. That's a fleeing story. I mean, the ontological story isn't a cover-up. It's just a structure that is with what is nearest is also farthest away, uh, least accessible. To, what is nearest and most pervasive is least acceptable. You don't, that isn't a question of a cover-up, and that's not a question I wouldn't even want to say of falling, though I think it has to come under his category of falling, uh, as does absorption. It's a very broad category. But when you start saying that you've got to actually violently get to the truth about Dasein, that must be because Dasein is making a positive effort to fend off the its, its and your, and, and your Dasein, uh, getting at the truth. So uh, you get this sort of, I mean, it's, I think, always in, the, in, the, in, in what he's doing. Look at the paragraph now that begins, Dasein's kind of being. We're still in 359. Thus demands that any ontological interpretation which sets itself the goal of exhibiting the phenomena in their primordiality should capture the being of this entity in spite of this entity's own tendency to cover things up. Now, that's, that's a, a, a hiding story and a fleeing story. It's not a structural ontological story, I think. It's all, it, all, it sounds too psychological, really. I, I hate it. I think the whole theme in being in time the Dasein is sort of actually involved in fleeing and covering up its structure, is uh, what Foucault calls the hermeneutic of suspicion. And I think it, Heidegger is an example of the hermeneutic of suspicion. Uh, Foucault's got this nice category that covers Freud, Marx, and Heidegger. And that puts Heidegger in very bad company, it seems to me, uh, ontologically anyway. And, and that's what he's doing right here. Because the, the hermeneutic of suspicion says that for some reason or other, human beings, and each one, Freud and Marx and Heidegger have different arguments, ha are motivated to cover up the most important truth about what's going on. And that the, the job of somebody studying human beings, whether Marxist, Freudian, or Heidegger, is to get at this deepest truth about you, of human beings that's covered up. And moreover, when you do get at it and can face it, it's liberating because a lot of the misery and distortion of social life or psychological life or just plain designing is caused by this, ten this tendency to flee and cover up. So the job of somebody who believes in the hermeneutics of suspicion is to force people to face up to what it is they're, they're motivated to hide. All of that I just wish Heidegger didn't have. I don't think he needs it. I think it's, he, all he needs is the structural point that it's hard to do a phenomenology of a being whose, that, whose basic structure is to be the basis of all intelligibility. Uh, okay, now you can say some things about this. Yeah, Ariel. It looks like you're sort of lost on this. Uh, what? It seems like, like maybe not completely, you don't completely have this figured out, this whole aspect. Well, I, I, I have figured out that he's confused. Let me give you wait, one more thing before you say something. The clearest place where the conf confusion comes out, let's see, I just wrote confused in a page number. I have to find where it follows in the normal development of things. Uh, I don't know whether to look in here or to look at all of my markings, but my markings are so... And it's going to be an anticlimax, I'm afraid, but, but uh, I, I find it very interesting, confused and confused. Oh, here we are, okay, on page 363. Okay, now, d what is distinctive, sort of almost exactly in the middle of the page, what is distinctive in common sense is that it has in view only the experiencing of factual entities in order that it may be able to rid itself of an understanding of being. That's a fleeing story. It's just trying to get rid of an understanding of being. It fails to recognize that entities can be experienced factually only when being is already understood. That's a structural point. That's one of them is a, a kind of motivated cover up, and the other one is, uh, you know, failing to do something isn't like uh, trying to get, failing to get rid of something is not, failing, I'd have to find the right 
words not to beg the question. You can't get rid of something without trying to cover it up. But you can fail to see it for just plain structural reasons. And I, so, okay, now, yes, I, I'm not mixed up. He's mixed up, but go ahead. Well, I, I, don't know, I guess, um, no, I, I, like, I like that point you just made, actually, a lot. I, I don't really, I realize that you're just shooting, and I haven't read that much either, but I, I really don't like the notion of putting him in with, with, with uh, this great mark on the basis of this, like, psychological, I can't take it so long, it'll it sort of, sort of view. I mean, I, I really like the idea more, it's like what you were just saying just now, that it's, it's sort of just like part of Dasein's way of being that it, it gets covered up. It's not like he's, it's not like there's any like sort of psychological process that pushes it down or anything like that. It's just sort of the way we are is, is includes not, not, not seeing that. Yeah, one, one of the best statements of it is of all people, Don Searle. I, I would have brought it along. He says, we are not normally in, in, in the business of dealing with the background. We don't have the language to talk about the background. And it's very hard to get to be able to get, to get people to notice it without turning it into some object. And the whole point is it's supposed to be not an object. And uh, uh, I like that argument. That's fine. You don't have to attribute any uh, sort of tendency to flee or cover up or what was this uh, that I just had, whatever that word was, what was it? Get rid of, you don't, it isn't as if there's anybody trying to get rid of anything. Okay, well, you want to say something about this? Ah, well, yeah, though you're really, you're a straight man for this because one of my favorite objections to Heidegger is that he has no right to, to base the fleeing on the fact that Dasein is, is exposed to anxiety. And why? Well, that's interesting. That's because in the end, Dasein, and this is again, the, it would be the structure of uh, the hermeneutics of suspicion. When Dasein finally holds on to anxiety, guess what? It's joyful. So in the end, it makes no sense to say that Dasein is always fleeing or tends to flee anxiety. Why would he need to? Why would it need to flee? Remember, anxiety isn't painful. It isn't sort of breaking out in a cold sweat and wringing your hands. Anxiety is a sense of the sort of basic spookiness of everything. And okay, go ahead. Well, I, I understood anxiety as uh, facing up to the groundlessness. That's right. That's right. I was trying to say. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, but, but that just re reintroduces the point. Why should we be upset by ungroundedness? I mean, this is a kind of Wittgensteinian point. I mean, it's only because we. Is it really true that we ask for the kind of ground that Descartes was asking for and Plato was asking for, and that human beings all over need that kind? The pe are the people in Bali suffering from ang the anxiety of, of, of groundlessness and rootlessness? Or put it another way, once you accept groundlessness, you can lead a happy life. You can get married and have children and climb Everest and do whatever you want. It, you, you, don't, you don't need grounds to lead a good life. Yeah. But I'll be largely critiquing Western thought. So okay, well, and then, okay, then I'll, okay, then I'll just put it into Western terms. I mean, why uh, should we think that ordinary people are suffering from this peculiar need to have grounds instead of just, what? Well, but are they, well, that's what you'd have to think, that they really are, everybody really is Cartesian, and, and moreover, that, that, and therefore not having grounds is very upsetting to them. I mean, Heider's got this sort of Wittgensteinian distinction between people who think that we're all grounded somehow and that there's in reason or nature or something the basic intelligibility that we can rely on, uh, then there are the people who see that there isn't any basic intelligibility to rely on, and they think there's, you've got to say it in German, they think instead of a Grund, there's an Abgrund. An Abgrund is an abyss. This is sort of a Sartrean thing. It looks like, boy, there's no ground. We are, we are a feudal passion. This is a, we are, it's nihilism and, and terrible. And then Heidegger says, why can't we just have an Ungrund, which is a non-ground? And that's what I'm saying. And why should we be fleeing the un, the, the, the unground as if it were an abyss? When uh, and, and the answer is somehow, if, if it's the Cartesianism has invaded our culture, then he's got another problem. 
because he says he's doing transcendental a study about Dasein überhaupt, supposedly, not just Western uh, uh, post-industrial Dasein or something. And uh, so, there, so the problem occurs all over the place. I just think fleeing is, you never should have bought it. And it starts in uh, the first hermeneutic of suspicion is Kierkegaard, I think. But, it, that, but that's a long story. Kierkegaard has at least got an interesting story about what we're fleeing. But go ahead. Uh, no, first he's, he, yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, I was just about to mention Kierkegaard. Oh, yeah? An explanation for why. Although I think it, it seems right that his sense of fleeing kind of defies the structure that would say that anxiety can be positive and that it, um, that it can create authenticity or behavior. And yet that's what he thinks. Yes. Yeah. I think but, anxiety's a good thing. Yes, but, I mean, there, there remains this, It's sort of why and why do people want to be take it easy? I mean, there there's some psychological motivation being smuggled in here, and you you can sort of push it around, but it shows up someplace. Exactly. I mean, I think a lot of what you're seeing in time, especially what's very explicit, is all the structural points that he makes. But I really do think that smuggled in there is this sort of sense, like when you read the part on Das Mann, Heidegger seems to have this negative attitude about leveling, even though he could never assert that it was somehow negative because he's not making those kind of claims. Well, uh, the interesting thing is, I think, that he thinks that intelligibility is essentially leveling, and there's nothing wrong with leveling, and that's, again, that he, when he says authentic Dasein is always in the one, uh, because there's no way, uh, I mean, tell, you've got to have the one to have any way to do anything to get outside the, the concrete, immediate situation into some generality and so forth. So he's got to... Uh, you know, accept the one. So then the issue comes again. This then why this tone of of, of shape up and and you're you're fleeing into the one. Why not just say, of course, the 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 one has got to be there, but the one is something you also have to uh, resist, but not in the sense of of the. You don't have to resist your tendency to flee into it. Uh, you just got to, it's, it's a complicated story, but I'll say it again, I say it often, work your way out of the one, not uh, by getting more and more phronomous like getting more and more able to respond to the unique situation. And even then, never completely, because there's always got to be this generality of the one in order to have anything intelligible. And so now we get this question, why the motivation to... What's the, what's, what's the bad motivation? It's to use the one to cover up our nature. And now where I'm asking again, what, what's the, how does he explain this motive to use the one to cover up our nature? I mean, it, it, it looks like, well, it's because anxiety is terrible or groundlessness is terrible or resisting uh, television and, and banalities and leveling is, is hard. But none of it seems to make any, it doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. Well, certainly you have to sort of work your way out of a kind of banality and a standard way of looking at things, which covers up what we are and everything, covers up everything practically. And now, but the question is, wait, I just slipped my mind. I have to get it back how I want to put it. Uh, Yes, you have to get out of that. Oh, I know, yes. But the idea that you have to, you, we have to use violence to get out of it and wrest the people out of it. Why don't you just... I mean, Wittgenstein manages to do a lot of this work without violence and without resting. And uh, it, it only requires violence if the people are resisting the, 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 the news you're bringing. And that's what, again, I think he has no need or right to, to say. 
once he points this out to us, we should all just say, yeah, that's how it is. I, that's hard to see, but now that you point it out, I see it. Well, that's, that's a different issue. We better put that aside. I mean, how you get to be authentic is... Uh, you, so I don't, you do it, whether you do it by willpower or not, is a deep point. We're going to come to... It's got to do with this choosing to choose issue. Uh, how much... In the background of what I'm talking about, there is going to be a problem about just how much receptivity and how much uh, activity... But not yet. I mean, this is all I want to talk right now is, and I've done it, is just talk about that I, I don't think he's motivated the, the, the violence story. Uh, yeah, I guess, Eric, but I, mean, I want to word it. Go ahead, but be brief. Okay, okay fair enough. Um, I just want to say um, it seems like maybe, maybe Heidegger is just like uh, uh, stuck, just hasn't made up his mind or, or hasn't, hasn't streamlined it enough. Well, that's what I think. Yeah, yeah. That's, and, and he doesn't need it, and I don't even understand where he thinks he gets it because it sounds uh, sort of ontic and psychological. No, you guys are monopolizing this discussion. Tyler wants to say something. To, to, to what? Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, I, I thought you would think that, and I'm eager to, <laughs> I'm eager to hear how, what you have to say about it. Which is which is what? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. That's fine. And. That's a f- isn't that interesting? I like that. But it's a funny thing. It's a third angle. Because it isn't a, I'm f- a fleeing, resisting, facing... It, but it isn't just structural. It's, it's as you say, something like uh, uh, genetic. Or ge- 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 I mean, I, I can't find the word. Developmental. It's, let's, say, let's say it's developmental. That it's some, the way we grow up and get socialized has this built into it that we are all going to want to do the standard thing. And, res- and but I'm not sure that uh, and and what it means is it's not a motivated fleeing in the sense that you're actively trying to flee, but rather at the level of motive. Yeah. Okay. 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 And and the and this violence and resting on your version is that he just has to shake you up, and he when he needs to shake you up because you're in the tranquility of saying I already know how to do it. That there's a standard way to do it, uh, and so forth. Okay, it's but. Okay, so, so we have to we have to change that structure, and that's the violence that's going to happen. Except that it's sort of in this book a kind of methodological violence, and that's not going to change anybody's structure. Uh, so you, I, I'm happy if you all just have seen that there's a problem here, and if anybody wants to write a paper about it, you can. You're welcome to do it, and I and I and I'd be shocked, but but interested to see an account that makes 
fleeing work or, or, or motivates the fleeing. What? Yeah. Okay, but wait, that's enough, because that's not going to be a cover-up, the way you tell the story. That, you, you, that's a different issue again. Yeah, you, you can explain why they resist what you're telling them, and that's part of it. But the basic claim is that, that, that the whole way Dasein sets up the understanding of themselves and the world is to hide the fact that Dasein is ungrounded and, 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 the, and the end uh, to... Uh, not have to experience the anxiety that comes with that realization. And, that, and so, and you're telling me all kinds of other stories about why Dasein has trouble facing the, structure, the, the structural things that Heidegger wants to describe. And I just want to say, well, each one of them we could discuss on its own, but I think the least tenable of all of the candidates, uh, the developmental and the perse perseverant one and uh, so forth, the least tenable is that, that it's built into Dasein, structurally across the board, that it's fleeing anxiety is the main motivation for why it has the, the wrong understanding of the, the world. Uh, th th but I'm going to go on. I mean, I, I would be very unhappy if I discovered that we'd spent the whole uh, day, day on this. So let me see where I am. There's a hermeneutic circle. Uh, And then there's a whole lot of questions I just run through that I think I just don't think he's got he's answered satisfactorily is uh, why why you believe anxiety reveals the truth that nothing has intrinsic meaning why say that it's a basic disposedness does guilt really show that all our practices are ungrounded and and what does that even mean and uh, and why and uh, let's see what else. Uh, And we have to start with the arontical everyday understanding that we have to get out of it. So let me see. I'm skimming to get out of it here. And we have, and we need, we want to understand why there there is this systematic cover up that ex obscures the structure of our being. Uh, and okay, and why isn't there enough cover up just in the way the the illumination in the room is? quote, cover, not really covered up, but uh, not, ex not easily accessible to us and describable. Uh, so well, let's see. So here we get to the violence on 2, 359. And so that we get finally to how can we know that the ontological understanding we've arrived at is phenomenally adequate. That is, how can we ever know that we're not just part of a cover-up and that, uh, that there's any, uh, that you could ever get outside of it. And now, then Heidegger's, that's when we're back to formal indication. The, the method for getting, if, if you're dealing with e any kind of uh, distortion, it doesn't really have to be a cover-up. The, but the, the way to, to deal with it, is, and if you're all in it, because you already have this for having, you're, you're not working from outside. If you're in this hermeneutic circle, the only way to get, to get out, not to get out of the hermeneutic circle, you don't want to do that, but to get clear about the structure from within the hermeneutic circle is formal indication. 
What's sort of interesting is Heidegger wrote eight pages and pages about formal indication in, in his lecture notes. And uh, on the ones on religion have a big thing about it. I could, I, if you want me to, you can ask me and I'll give you references. But, and it's hardly visible in here. And yet it does the crucial job. And I just want to show you, the translation just covers it up, misses it. Absolutely, probably the worst moment in the translation, it seems to me, is where he says at the top of 362. No, that's not it. Uh, 361. Yes, 361, middle of the page. Look at this. In, in, you, how many realize that they just, when you read the sentence, you just read a, a mouthful of gibberish? And, didn't, and did you notice? Or are you so, is, is it all so much like gibberish to you that it doesn't seem like any more than any other? Look, in indicating the formal aspects of the idea of existence, that's the beginning of that, the, of the second full paragraph. What in the world can that mean, indicating the formal aspects of the idea of existence? Well, it doesn't mean anything. The German just says, for, uh, informally indicating existence, which is what he did remember way back at the beginning when he said we'll formally indicate Dasein as the being that's being is an issue for it, and we'll call that existence. Uh, and it's, it happens again at the, at the bottom at the, that paragraph, the idea of existence, which we have posited, gives us an outline of the formal structure of the understanding of Dasein and does so in a way, and that, that's also formal indicating. But there's also a place, oh, I just want to say that Joan Stanball gets it right. And uh, I think that's nice, because it's nice that, I mean, I've always beaten on Joan Stanball, but in this case, she's so much better than the translation. It just says, her translation, our formal indication of the idea of existence was guided by the understanding of being, so forth. And that's uh, straightforward and right. Okay, now, where am I? I jumped there. So, uh, so this is, we have to, so how do we do it? How do we find out, how to get, get the phenomena undistorted if, for whatever reason, and now we're just putting this under the general category, never, I don't want to say it's covered up. Not that there is a cover-up, just that it's that our experience of the phenomenon of us and the world is distorted and covered up. What do we do about it? Well, we we use formal indication. We assume. By the way, I I worried once, which I want to. I understand now. I ask myself the question: How come Heidegger? provisionally gets it right about Dasein when he gets it wrong about guilt and wrong. I mean, Heidegger thinks that we all get it wrong. Our whole shared understanding gets it wrong about guilt and death and the self we'll see today. And, and informal indication always has to start out with where things are wrong. How come when the most important thing, Dasein, is at stake, he doesn't start out with something like we're a rational animal? Or, or the, I know, a, a part of nature or something. He jumps right in and tells you the real, the right answer. Well, I always realize that's because he has uh, written the book already, so to speak. He knows the right answer. But, but what puzzled me was, uh, why then does he call it provisional? Uh, why doesn't he just say, uh, I, I know and you will be convinced by the end of this book, that Dasein is the being whose being is an issue for it. Well, I now see what's going on. There are two sort of, I, it doesn't explain altogether what, what's going on, but one, he, he's understood that we are a being whose being is an issue for it. But what's provisional is that that's our essential structure. He hasn't, I mean, something is provisional in that he hasn't shown it and he won't have shown it till the end of the book. What would he be showing? Well, that if you take us to be the being whose who essence, if you take us, if you believe that Dasein has an essence, and you take its essence to be that it it has, takes a stand on its being, then you can explain all the other phenomena. 
that's the test for the essence. I mean, the essence of gold, I if, it's, if it's 79, as explains the ductility and the malleability and the yellowness and the conductivity and, and, and everything about gold, every, every causal property of gold. And in, in a similar way, if he gets it right about the essence of Dasein, then all the other stuff in here has got to be following from it. And it explained, it, it worked out, worked out as, that, uh, as our structure. And that's what he thinks. He thinks that he knows what, what's, pr he provisionally, one of the things we do is take a stand on our being. And he's just observed that. But what he wants is to show that we have an essence and, that is, and that's our essence. That, that, and so I just wanted to say that because for me that sort of helps a little understand how unlike, see what I'm saying is unlike all the other forms of formal indignation, indigna indignation <laughs> indication that, that he's got, though why, yeah, good, you want to close it? Is that a good idea? Is it the noise or the draft or both? Okay, uh, so, so, so he gets to formal indication on, on 361, even though, thanks to the translation, you can't see it. And he's, and, uh, and he, uh, and helps us to understand something on 362, which is a confusion. What is it? Uh, six. Oh, yeah, there. This is just the next point. I mean, it's not. I'm not de deriving anything from that point. Uh, but the, it's related. The the, the 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 essence of Dasein is its existence. And now I want to just talk about that, this fact that he's using this term existence. Existence m is the name for a way of being that for whom's for which its being is an issue for it. That's why we study these existentials. Now, there's something that's going to sort of disturb you, and it disturbed Heidegger finally, and he, got, he realized he was confused. At the top of 362, he, and it's all over the place, he talks about uh, a threefold uh, distinction of existence, facticity, and falling. And all over the place you will find that existence is his name for the future projective dimension. But existence is also his name for the whole structure. Uh, that is, that's the way of being of Dasein. Well, that, that always annoyed me. And one day I discovered, thanks to uh, the fact that the footnotes are in the, uh, in the Stambaugh translation, but now I have to find where it is, uh, 315. It's right at this point where he, he, picks, he writes something in the margin. So that means in the German, 315 in the margin. I marked it. Oh, yeah, here it is. No, it isn't. Try here. Yes, he, he, he notices and he writes existence, one, for the whole of being of Dasein, and two, only for understanding. Understanding is the projecting dimension. And so he realizes that he should have used two different terms. He certainly should have. He, existence is a nice term for Dasein and, it, and the way of being of Dasein. And existentialism is already around. Kierkegaard has defined himself as an existential thinker. And doing these existentiali is all very well. Then you need a new word for the future directedness. Uh, one of, the, one of the words is understanding, but we need a bigger, a more, a broader category, more abstract. And I don't, I don't have any proposal. That's his problem. But uh, it, it, he, it, it helps to realize when you come across the term existence that it almost always means the future dimension of Dasein's activity, projection. And that, but, but of course, when you come across existentials, that always means the threefold structure of thrown, falling, and projecting. Okay, I don't have, there's nothing to discuss there. We just have to sort it out and go on. Uh, let's see now. Um, 
And now we're back to the hermeneutic circle, which he didn't name before. I named it. On 362, you get the whole hermeneutic circle going by again. Um, and you get it carefully sort of wrapped around formal indication this time. Uh, the middle, the, the second paragraph, he says, this understanding is, though he's talking about understanding Dasein's being, this understanding is to be grasped primordially only on the basis of a primordial interpretation of Dasein in which we take the idea of existence as our cue. There, I take it, existence is supposed to mean the whole, stay taking a stand on your being. Does it not then become together to come, become altogether patent in the end that this problem of fundamental ontology which we broached is one which, in which we move in a circle. And there we are, where that's the hermeneutic situation. So we go on a little. We have indeed already shown in analyzing the structure of understanding that get it so and so it moves in a circle. That was that quick run through of the, her, of the, her, of the four structure in, in division one. In spite of this, if the problematic of fundamental ontology is to have its hermeneutic situation clarified, our investigation must now come back explicitly to this circular argument. When it's objected that the existential interpretation is circular, it said that we have presupposed the idea of existence and that Dasein gets interpreted accordingly, so the idea of being uh, may be obtained from it. Uh, but then it turns out, and I, we don't have to read it all, that that's the way things work you, you've got to stay inside and you've got to do formal indication to do hermeneutics. The one place that comes out, and I think it's nice to see how that hangs together, is the bottom of 362 in the italics, which are, of course, completely mistranslated, so you can't see it. But I will read it so you will see it. Um, skimming down, starting so that it may decide of its own accord. Where do we have to start? Uh, okay. We'll let that be. We want to let that which is to be interpreted be put into words so that it, Dasein, may decide of its own accord whether as the entity which it is, it has the state of being in terms of which it should be. It's always the getting the war out hen wrong. So the state of being in terms of which it has been disclosed in the projection with regard to its formal aspects. No, it's been disclosed in formal indication. I mean, so there you can just see that that's the method you've got to use when you, you're in a hermeneutic circle. Uh, it's, in the German, you can see formal and zeigen erschlossen. That's, oh, formal and anzeigen. Yeah, that's for, formal indication is what he's doing. Uh, so now we're in the hermeneutic circle, and it does that, and that it needn't be violent. I'm just summarizing where I am. Uh, and so, so we're back to fleeing again and the cover-up story. I, I, I just wanted to show you that it's coming up again on 368. Because when I mentioned it, I hadn't, I didn't go directly to the fleeing quote because I didn't know where it was because I put it later in my lecture. Here I am in the middle of 368. The everyday interpretation of the self, it's going to do it, we're going to do it with the self, has a tendency to understand itself in terms of the world with which it's concerned. Now that's fine. I mean, nobody wants to say that we, that's the John Searle version, which is all he needs. Uh, when Dasein has itself in view ontically, it fails to see itself in relation to the kind of being of that entity which it is itself. That's fine. What is the motive for this fugitive way of saying I? It is motivated by Dasein's falling, for as falling, it flees in the face of itself into the one. Okay, so there, he's, that's the right where it says 322 in the margin. Uh, now, I'm not quite ready to get to the self yet, so I'm, I'm going to do it and get there in just a minute. I, on 363, we, all, we still have to look at something. Uh, oh, well, that's the one I, I showed you, where he, the, they build, get, ridding, get rid 
of an understanding of being and fail to recognize an understanding of being are put side by side in a way I don't think they should be. Uh, common sense misunderstands understanding, that's sure. That's because we, we normally cope with the kind of things that you understand as things. And that therefore common sense must necessarily pass off as violent anything that lies beyond the reach of its understanding. There's always this thing that, that uh, we, we, because the fleeing is lurking in this chap in this paragraph, so is the violence. So Heidegger, why am I why am I saying this in this order? So this is how this is Heidegger explaining how we're going to get to the, the phenomenon when it's covered up and so forth. And the first point I was making was formal indication. And now I've got a point. Our pre-ontological understanding of being is ungrounded. According to Heidegger, motivates a tendency to flee, which in turn justifies not taking that's not at face value. I mean this sort of this sort of just this I think this justifies formal indication. I mean in Heidegger's picture. Because it, 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 you know, guilt is, is as something you owe is covering up the fact that it's not a question of owing at all, but not getting behind your thrownness. Death as an event at the end of your life covers up the fact that dying is something you're doing all, all the time and so forth. And why are this all happening? Because there is a tendency to flee and into Dasman. <coughs> Therefore, there's a, not only is Dasman too general and banal and standard to get at the real unique situation, it also doesn't have a clue as to how to deal with Dasein. And Heidegger's explanation of that is that in order to flee ungroundedness, Dasein uh, flees into Dasman, and Dasman has a view of us as objects. There, let me see if I can... There's more to say about that. I don't think so. Uh, no, I said that. And that. And and does and Heidegger. Now, I, the, the final point is, how, how I'm still asking, how does Heidegger get to the phenomenon? Well, Heidegger experiences anticipatory resoluteness. He's authentic. I mean, what? How you get to be authentic, I haven't talked about yet, whether you do it by willpower or by grace or whatever. But Heidegger clearly sees the phenomenon, uh, and therefore he's in a position to d break out uh, or to just you know, see through, I think would be better, the ordinary way of, doing, of thinking about it and telling us his way. Uh, and Th this leads to something I want to get clear. Well, first there's the problem of wholeness. So what happens here? He does see the whole. Uh, but, but starting at right below 64. Through the unity of the items which are constitutive for care. Look at this now. The same puzzle, you know, that he should have fixed. Existentiality, facticity, and fallenness. There it's quite clear that he's using the term in a different way than he should. It has become possible to give the first ontological definition for the totality of Dasein's structural whole. So now he's got the story of Dasein's structural whole. Remember, now this is just me trying again to justify my reordering. It, the issue at the beginning of Division Two was we haven't got Dasein's structural whole and we have to do all kinds of things to fix that. But we've already got existentiality, facticity, and fallenness all over the place in Division One. Then, so what else do you get when you get the structural whole? Well, I'm not, I don't really know. I, 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 it's obviously what you get when you get when you're authentic, and you get the authentic totality. This is what he's talking about at the top of 364. By exhibiting anticipatory resoluteness, we have brought Dasein before us with regard to its authentic totality and with, it, with authentically whole. There must be some kind of inauthentic whole so that we now have it in advance 
the authenticity of the potential, the ability to be a self guarantees the primordial existentiality, is, guarantees that primordial existentiality is something we see in advance. He's still getting, if you, if you, whoever wants to write a paper on the hermeneutic, there's, there's, you know, seeing in advance is the, the fortis, excuse the foresight. The, he keeps using the terminology of, of the threefold aspects of hermeneutics just without, uh, you know, signaling that he's doing anything special with it. Partly because I don't think there's anything interesting about it. I mean, that, that he's just pushing it in here, but I mean, that there, why there are, the, I've never understood why there are these three for, for having foresight and for uh, conception, why there couldn't be four or two, but I mean, they do a good job, these three, but I bet you could think of another one. But anyway, the three uh, are supposed to map onto the temporality structure, presumably. All right, no, I don't really know. That's another paper topic. He does, never tells us that they do, and I don't know if they do. Uh, the past, let's try it, is something like the for having, because the past is the always already. He's already built that into the care structure. So that what you all what you always already in, the for sight will have to be the present of, alongside entities. That's rather far fetched, and the future one is going to be the for conception. Why? See, no, I, I, I give up. No, you can't do it. I can't do it anyway. Map it onto the threefold temporal structure. So let me go back to where I was. The, the, so now the problem of wholeness has got to be something more than just knowing this structure. It's got to be, I take it, actually experiencing fully what it is to be a throwing, falling, projecting being. And though he had the wholeness all along, he didn't have it in its richness or something, is one of the words he uses. So, Eugene, in fact, who is behind this lecture, in that he posed me on Wednesday a very hard question, but a question that we had better understand, but we can't understand what's going on in the morality part of Division 2. And that is, what's the difference between the care structure, which is uh, uh, what's always already in the first one, pressing, Always already ahead of itself. Oh, it's ahead of itself. Yeah, Al always already. Uh, I think it really goes ahead of itself as always already amidst uh, entities. But anyway, that care structure that is supposed to be, we're supposed to get the meaning of that structure. It's somehow supposed to become intelligible to us in the light of the structure of primordial temporality. And that we couldn't figure out the root of us how to distinguish what you've already got, namely the threefold temporal uh, something in the care structure. It's not always already, it's truly past, and pressing into is the future, and being amidst is the present. What does it add to say that if you understand primordial temporality, you'll understand something essential about the care structure? you didn't understand before. Remember, just to keep the big overall picture, Dasein has a structure. The meaning of Dasein is care. That means some structure that makes Dasein's way of being intelligible. And the meaning of care is temporality, temporalizing itself, or just temporality. And that's supposed to make the care structure intelligible in some way that it wasn't intelligible until you mapped it to temporality. So I just had a, a big aha this morning trying to figure it out. And I didn't get a chance to actually, I think, work it all out. But I do think it's interesting. But I can't get, I get there only sort of halfway through what I want to say about what we were reading today. So the, and, and finally, I want to say, I guess I could have said, and one more move. Somehow, once you understand temporality, you're in a position to go on to temporality. See, there are two different German words. Temporality is Zeitlichkeit. That's in here. Temporality is what we're going to be doing for the next, for the last three weeks of the course. That's in basic problems. But when you understand temporality, 
uh, you understand sort of the meaning of temporality. You understand one more level of interpretation. And that's, I just realized, and that's why I'm just going to quote it to the way to begin what I'm talking about. I, I said already a while back, without having any text really in mind to back it up, that finally what what is trying to do is to find something that explains why there are all the different meanings of being and how they all hang together with in one understanding of being. And I didn't realize it, but he's talking about this on 383 way back, back there. Um, and so he says in that last paragraph, working out the morality of God's eye as every day has historicality and within timeless, beginning for the first time a relentless insight into the complications of a primordial ontology of God's eye. I just had noticed that. What is a primordial ontology of God's eye? Well, he's going to explain that. As being in the world, God's eye exists practically with and alongside entities which are counted within the world. That, that we do, we just didn't have that name for it. Thus, Dasein's being becomes ontologically transparent in a comprehensive way, only within the horizon in which the being of entities other than Dasein, and, and this means even those which are neither ready to handle present hand can just subsist. So now even the way of being of numbers is the way of being of equipment, the way of being of substances, the way of being of numbers, all of those get clarified when you understand the the horizon uh, the, uh, is of God's eye, of the horizon of the temporal structure of God's eye. Then he says, the infinite variations of being are to be interpreted for everything of which we say it is. And that's what they all have in common. The equipment is, substances are, God's eye is, they're all kinds of sign. And now he throws in for once numbers and never mentions them again. He has to say they are too. So, so we have to say, for everything which we say it is, we need an idea of being in general. And this idea needs to have been adequately illuminated in the past. Well, that's the, we never got there, we never got there in the course of being in time. But that's the project. And he got a lot of pieces of it when you start looking for it. How he's going to tell you about the temporality of the ready to hand, the temporality of the present to hand, the temporality of being in the world, and so forth. That's all. Those all have a way of being, and they all, and their way of being is mapped in various ways on the temporality. They're all modes of temporality. And, and what so far, now I'm just skipping to where we are on 401, which we were supposed to start reading today, right? I just want to make sure we're, I'm just following the syllabus, and I tell you, trust you are too. So we're going to start reading from 401. There's something important on 401. Oh, yeah. And we should stay there on 382 because some deeply puzzled, and I think very strong headed, I, I can't make sense out of it, move is made you know, in, in, uh, in, in the top part of the He's giving his overall view. I think I could sort of understand the, the overall view of the part I read. But now look three lines down. Concern for some perspective, discovery, reckoning with its time. This is, really, this is all within time as we can be that. Skipping down to the right hand side, the top paragraph. The kind of time which is first found ontically and within time, and that's our everyday kind of time, becomes the basis on which the ordinary traditional conception of time is. We're going to read about that. We haven't done that yet. That would be a succession of matters. But time is within timeness. Now comes the funny thing. Arises from an essential kind of temporalizing, of primordial temporality. Arises makes me nervous. All up to now I've been saying each of these levels makes the previous level, the lower, the level below it intelligible. So we can make care structure intelligible basis of the, of the structure of temporality, temporalizing itself. It turns out there's even this other structure, temporality state, which is his name for the way that temporalizing maps onto all the ways of being. But what is this about arises? I think this is what makes 
arises from the central kind of capitalizing of primordial plurality. It is entrained. The fact that this is its source, and that's worshipful. Those are the two words. The translation is not wrong. So the fact that this is the source, that is, the temporality, tells us that the time in which what is present at hand passes in the case of the genuine phenomenon is the spirit. It's not anything except the words arise and source. It seems to me two different things are going on through all of this. I mean, I was having all kinds of insights today. I may, in the end, discover they're all wrong. That's why you're here to tell me so. But I think that I no longer agree with anything in black. I believe in black. So it's brilliant. It seems to me to be wrong. And it's wrong on just this idea that it's trying to explain something like the source of all these other things in time and things that might have been his. And that's his Kantian reading. And where source means something like sometimes he says, and I even say sometimes, it isn't that black is wrong. I think there must be two different ways of picking up the vision, too. And they're probably, I haven't, as I say, had time to work it out. These two are probably, for both of them, coherent interpretations. And they're probably, both have text to back them up. And one of them is the Kantian, in which we're told that the structure of temporality is, quote, the condition of the possibility of all these other forms of temporality, all these other forms of ways of being. And that goes with the crucial statement. Remember way back here, I obsessed about this when we were doing the vision form. There is the definition of being, the only one that's out there that has a lot of trouble. Oh, here we are. Yes, I am on the right track. 25. What is asked about is being, that which determines entities as entities. And then that on the basis of which entities are already understood. Now, the intelligibility story I started by talking about is that on the basis of which, so entities are understood on the basis of Dasein, Dasein is understood on the basis of care, care is understood on the basis of primordial temporality. I can understand that more and more. But you could think that there is some kind of structure which somehow, I don't know, produces, that's not the right word, constitutes, I mean, does something, determines the entities, not makes them intelligible. And that sounds, and that I think sounds very realistic. The condition of the possibility in a Kantian way, the categories that may determine the possibilities of objects and the experiences as objects. And in some way, there won't be any objects except as they are in some way organized by Dasein. Now, I'm going to show you another thing too. I'm going to have to say all this, you know, sort of blurt it out and then show it. It turns out that sometimes Heidegger says the existential condition of the possibility. I think that's the one I want. That says it's about intelligibility. But if you just say condition of the possibility, then it could sound like some kind of structure which is somehow behind and producing as a source out of which springs the phenomenon. That's what I don't understand. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there aren't these two different ways of reading it. But I'm beginning to suspect that there are. And I can only understand the phenomenological one. This is how this struck me. 
Cross it out. So I will. Because I don't know what to do with it. Have you got the German? What the, I don't know what to do. Anybody got the German? And Tyler could come to that gave this seminar yesterday. Oh dear, well, we'll cut off from the German. Could you, could you make a note to look it up? Maybe we can just cross it out. But let's, but let's cross it out until we find out otherwise. And it means the ecstatic unity with which temporality is fully temporalized itself is, in that, is grounded in totality of the structural. That is the unity of the character. Not to be mysterious, because I certainly want to lay every card I got on the table as clearly as possible. That's what you get. You get a special, you get a unity to the character from the temporality, the temporalizing itself, that isn't obvious in the character. It only becomes explicit when you lay 
think ahead of itself. Ahead of itself. I don't know why I can't remember that. There's just ahead of itself. And that's clearly future all the time. And there's always already in it. And that's clearly past all the time. And, the, and amidst entities, that's clearly present. But there isn't anything about how these are related to each other. Why does it have to be three and, and these three? And how is each one of these three related to the other two of the three such that they form a unit? I don't think that's in there yet. And that's what this, and that's already existence, facticity, and falling. That's just another name for the uh, ahead of itself, the uh, always already, and the amidst. And that, but the unity of the care structure. So we want to see what's in the, it's, we want to ground the totality of the structural whole of existence, facticity, and falling. And that is ground the unity of the care structure. And that's what temporality is supposed to be. That, okay, I mean, you get, I hope, everything will get clear. Right? That's, the, that's my idea, anyway. So the next little paragraph, temporalizing doesn't signify that it's coming in a succession. The future is not later than that. This is the crucial one, the paradox thing that Bill Blackner likes to uh, quote, too. I think it's right to quote. I'm not sure that what he gets out of it is what I get out of it. But, the ten, but there's something going on here, very important. Temporalizing doesn't signify the ecstasy's coming succession. The future is not later than having been, and having been is not earlier than the present. Temporality temporalizes itself as a future which makes present in having been a process of which you cross out that time. Uh, so now we have to understand how that happens. Uh, and what what is going on? phenomenon of something that's temporal and yet not successive, not sequential. That is, that somehow these three ecstasies are not laid out in time. Heidegger says if we thought they were, if we thought that the past was gone, the future, the present's here right now, the future hasn't come yet, then you would be putting God's sign in time treating God's eye as a thing. Somehow, you've got to understand that these dimensions are so interrelated that they don't, you can't lay them out in that successive way. And I keep wanting to repeat what I think is my big insight. It only looks, it only looks like a big insight if you've been stumped for uh, an afternoon. <laughs> it looks like it's just that, seeing that they're interrelated. I'm going to explain how. They're interrelated in such a tight way that you can't uh, separate them so that you can see them as, uh, as laid out after another. And now we can, and, uh, and if you see that, then you see the phenomenon that you look at, that is, you see a certain experience of time, which is what I'm trying to grasp, I think I have, a certain experience of time, which is not sequential in that the future doesn't come after the present or the past doesn't come. The future doesn't come yeah, after the present and the past doesn't come before the present or the past. The, so what's the phenomenon?
So we want to understand the phenomenon of primordial temporal Isaac and how it can have these three temporal dimensions, these ecstasies, and yet not be sequential. And now, now came my aha. It's a tiny aha, but I, but I it's, 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 and it's, it's a version of what Bill is doing. And I see that it happens, let's just try with the future. We're going to stick to the phenomenon of the future. What would it be to think of the future as something coming after the present that hasn't been achieved yet? That would be the wrong way to think about the future. I think you think about it that way, then it looks like the future is so, so different from the present and different from the past that you could just lay out these three dimensions. And, and, they, and well, so we want, and now, as I say, the simple aha, which I see that I've got on one level, that Bill's got on another level, and maybe somebody else has got it on the third level, is, but I want to say, I just suddenly realized coping is not gold. And that's, and everything suddenly became clear to me. I mean, it goes back, how many have had Searle? You, you know, you, you've heard me sort of fighting with Searle in, in, in the Heidegger course anyway. Searle thinks that action has conditions of satisfaction. McDowell thinks that you have to understand action in terms of the concepts. We, we, the, the jargon is you've got intentional content which, which specifies, so to speak, what it is that the success conditions are talking about. Right? So, now we all know from the, having read Division I and maybe even better if you read Marilyn Fonte, how many I forget a different Marilyn Fonte course. Some of you, okay. We, we, or maybe you just need to look at the phenomenon and you see that there's a kind of involved hoping which doesn't have success conditions. In Merleau-Ponty, it just has improvement conditions. In, I don't know how to put it, but you can uh, When you're hammering and, and in the flow, and building something, and, and, and you don't have to have in mind success conditions, you just have to constantly do what works, do what, and, and as long as things don't break down, you just uh, respond. switch and the towards which uh, yes it's like you say it's a towards which as a and you don't say there's a goal right you're working towards something but it's not like you're, you're intentionally kind of drifting yeah, yeah well, it's really hard to have to entertain a representation right. of what it would be to achieve it that's or the or tricky part in any way be consciously or cognitively in all directions towards it no, no, you sort of are directed toward it. You've got to be careful. The toward right, switch okay. is you, you want to be directed toward it, but but there's no it that you need to be directed okay, toward. Okay, that's not like that. It's, it's that, that's what I mean by the improvement conditions. You can sense when you're getting better and worse. Well, I'm using the analogy of being on the lead. You, you, all you have to do is, if you've had a lot of experience in the coping, this is magic. You're in the unready to hand coping. You have to have a goal. And you have to understand this have to keep checking whether you're on the right track toward that goal. But if you've had lots of experience, all you have to do is just go on. And as long as everything feels all right, you don't have to pay attention to anything except just keeping it feeling all right. That I think of it like an airplane, just staying on the beam. The way that the air, you don't need to know where the airport is and as your final condition of satisfaction. All you need to know is that when you get off the beam, get some kind of signal and when you get back on the beam that it stops making this whistly noise. And if you just do that, you'll arrive at the airport. And you, when you've got a skill in the domain, you've got the beacon. You've got and that you just know how to stay on track. And what you, you there's a part of the brain now that think that actually registers I forget the name of it, that registers so to speak how it's going. And as long as it registers it's going like it usually goes and should go, you phenomenally, phenomenologically got nothing to just pressing into the future. That's the jargon. Now, the for the sake of which is uh, sort of the, the towards which is, is the right way to talk because it doesn't have to tell you the goal. It just says you're going Where to. Where you going for? Yeah, yeah. And the other thing I just said is I stopped. Okay, pressing into the future 
is very important to you. Because pressing into the future doesn't have doesn't tell you that you're aiming at a particular goal or success uh, to which you have in mind. I mean, having understood that thought for a long time against John, against Dow, against Sir and Dow, I now think that it's it's the most basic level of what it is to be helping. And in a in effect, Heidegger is saying that that level, that basic level, the care structure is intelligible in a unified, deeper way than at the level in which the care structure looks like you have already had something, you're coping with something now, and you're uh, envisaging some goal. Not only just I'm repeating myself, but I want to see if I have said it, so I won't keep saying it. Uh, okay, you can say something. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the words which we're talking about. Um, it seems to me that in having a towards which, even if we don't have a conscious mental representation of something in the future, we're nonetheless directed towards something in the future, um, which is after what we're doing now. Yes, I think you were directed towards it, but I think there's two ways to understand how you, what the phenomena is. If you're uh, in, don't have if it's if it's unready to hand and it's unfamiliar, then you have to have a representation of the goal, and you're directed toward it by trying to achieve the satisfactory conditions. That's the Searle. If you have a lot of experience in the domain, you are being directed toward it. It's just you, you're you're just acting, and you're and uh, only if you get off the beam will you get any signal that you, you're not doing it right. And so and there, there's no, you don't have to have a represent, to talk to Herb, you don't have to have a representation of where, of where you're headed. And we would say, well, keep in mind, the crucial idea is, that's more primordial, that's more basic account of action than the, uh, anybody else has got. That's what Heidegger thinks he's got. But it seems like in this picture so far, temporality is still sequential. Um, there's still a present which leads into something future, and I think we ought to say some more. So that the future can't be explained as something that's not yet there that we're going to achieve. It's the, he's got a phrase for that. It's not that I'm going to something. Uh, it's not, he says, it's not a not yet now, but later. If, the, if, if what you're heading at is a not yet now, but later, you still have a, se a, a, a sequential understanding of temporality. And I'm trying to say, yes, I see, you know, I'm trying to put two parts of my life together. Yes, it's certainly true that Merrill Monti and Heidegger and their view of skill and coping don't think that it's in the, what you do is to bring about something that's not yet now and will be later, if that means that you have representation of some future condition. Let me go on. It'll help you a lot if I tell it to you as it occurred to me. Once I saw it on that level, which is, and which is, I'm trying to say what is more primordial, I'm telling you, that I used to say about Cyril in, the, in my courses, he comes in at the second level, he's out of the ground floor, and I find myself saying that about McDowell, and I think the ground floor is this most primordial level. It's a big flip in my mind, because I used to think that primordial temporality was sort of the highest, most abstract structure. I was still saying that on Wednesday. I think maybe Bill thinks that. Bill Blatner, I'm not sure. Now I think that the, the primordial is the most ground floor, the most basic structure of action. You could run the whole thing on perception, too, if you were doing that on my team. Uh, and once you see that, the whole thing starts being so mysterious. It was so mysterious to me what was primordial temporality and why was it wasn't successive. And, and it seemed to be some very sort of special kind of structure that I couldn't grasp why it was a structure. But okay, go ahead. It seems like the development of temporality can be understood as successive and linear, but then when we get to anticipatory resoluteness in the moment, a vision which is implicated by it. Through this inauthentic understanding of success. 
Times United this most primordial and united understanding of temporality, which is necessarily okay, but grounded in you something. Are, you sound like former me. That is, uh, <laughs> you keep saying the right words, but what is it? The, what's the phenomenon that you get in touch with? Well, I mean, if, if you haven't experienced something like a moment of vision, then there's no way for you to comprehend what I'm saying, right? Well, let me put that on hold. We may come back to it. I, I, I know one I can understand better in sort of getting there step by step. An important quote that I might just throw out real quick. Well, I want to stick to futural, and you changed uh, how we flip to the... Well, I did, and I did it because I think the most primordial understanding of temporality is necessarily grounded in uh, an understanding of eternity. I'm saying in what? In eternity. Eternity? I thought I was losing my hearing. Why would we? Has Heidegger ever I mean, talked about that. eternity? Yeah, that's he doesn't use that word. He seems to be afraid of that word for whatever reasons I'm not totally well, sure. Well, I'm sure there are good reasons. I mean, <laughs> whatever it is. How can the unity of temporality be understood apart from something like eternity? Well, good question. Let's write. I, I would write that on board if I knew how to write so that it was worth reading. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, let me. Anyway, let me, the moment of vision would be yeah, Wait, let's stick to your question. How we read it? How could he talk about temporality if he didn't bring in eternity or something like that? I'm the most primordial ground of temporality. The moment of vision uh, is what punctures through the linear understanding of time. And nope, the eternity, I think that, eternal no, 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 no. is revealed in something like the now, the moment of vision. It's, it's not, I mean, if, if my story is right, I mean, we'll, we'll put your story in too, but I, it's important. I'll, let me see if I'm important, because if I'm not, I forgot to turn on the thing. It was important. Okay. So over oh, people were really upset over two times now. We haven't been we haven't been able to hear what's going on. Okay, so now put that on hold. I want to try to say not that it's you're talking about something authentic, but I'm talking about simply going out the door. Where you if you're very good at going outdoors, you just respond to the solicitation to go out the door. You don't have to represent uh, what it's like to go out the door. You don't have to know uh, that how to get to the door and then go out it. To talk like Merleau-Ponty, your hand begins to take the shape of the door now as soon as you get up to go out the door. At this ground level, you are uh, always already uh, ahead of yourself, coping with the affordance of the two go out. And that's that's so far. Now, it's funny. You may be even like blacker or even in a third view. It, it looks like you want to start with this big moment of the difference between inauthentic and authentic coping. But authentic coping, I mean, going, I don't care whether it's authentic or not. Everybody going out the door, if they're good at going out doors, and there's lots of experience, their hand will take the shape of the door now, and they won't have to represent where they're heading, and so forth. Let me give you two more, because I, I, I'm really, I think, disagreeing exactly with what I used to think. Namely, that it was this very the temporality of temporalizing itself is. When we're, oh, by the way, you know, Heidegger, another confusion in Heidegger, very important and relevant here. I think I may have said it. Heidegger says often authentic and primordial. And what I want to say, and this is this I learned from Latin, you've got to separate those two. I mean, you know, we're talking about primordial, and primordial is, a, is about a certain kind of ground level coping, which doesn't require at all to be authentic. And it better be that that's the ground of all of this stuff. Because remember the discussion from two ages ago, three times or whatever, that it better not be authentic as this crucial. Because there may never be and there may never have been any authentic Daseins. And yet there are a lot of people seemingly getting along in time and coping with things that we better and we better be able to understand temporality centralizing itself in its primordial function of making uh, care and coping intelligible without having to bring in authentic temporality. Uh, so that's what we're disagreeing. Okay, I don't see why we can be possible to understand the unity of temporality without something like authenticity. Well, I'm going to show you uh, right now. I'm going to. Voila! There's the first questions. Go ahead. Yeah, um, there, there's something that's kind of 
bouncing around in my, in my head for a long time now, which you're mentioning coping, making it hard to come together in a way that's more intelligible, so I just want to throw it out there. It might be what you're thinking, but I wonder if there's any significance to the fact that just as in coping there's no representational content to the goal, there's also no representational content to the future or of time at all. Um, that I, it's, a, it's got a temporal, it's got an ecstatic temporalized structure. The question is, you're raising an important question, but in what sense is it future at all? If you go too far in this direction, but you are, you know, uh, ahead of yourself. That's the doorknob example. I mean, I, I, I'm tempted to go with something that's completely anti categorian which I know is wrong, which is, oh, well, I'm actually in time as a subject, but I just don't know. But I mean, that's completely wrong. <laughs> that's completely wrong. I'm, I'm sure of it. But in any case, I mean, I think there is probably something that's fact that there is no representation, representation of any sort of time at all when you're in the <coughs> you're right. You right. are time. That's how you yeah, that sounds good. That's what you that's are. Good. You are, you are that, that's the Dasein is time. <coughs> uh, Dasein is the world. Dasein may as well be time. I yeah, mean, it, that's it's right. Work. It's, it's, it's this open that happens to be a three-fold openness, and the, uh, all of the three aspects of which the three ecstasies are totally in the body. We are it, then. It's also our, our, it's the structure of being in the world, of course. Uh, maybe not so, of course. But anyway, I think he gets to there. You want to say something? Yeah, I was um, wondering about the phenomena where we have this unity. I, I don't know if uh, these two phenomena would do, I guess one of the two would be appropriate instead of walking out the door. For example, talking. I mean, here he's talking about the temporality of this course. Why should we go anywhere else besides thinking of a phenomena which we can see um, manifest in this course? When we talk, we would say certain words that have passed, and we would say certain things that have yet to come. Our grasp of language, I hope, would give us this idea that when I say something, you guys would retain this information, as well as expect me to say something that fits along some linguistic rule, perhaps. My, my point is simply, with um, language with speaking, we do see the unity of, um, of this already, and and they're ready ahead of itself. Um, I think you're. I think you're right. I think that's. I mean, when you take out of it what I got, and I think that's what you were saying. It's true. I think that speaking is a kind of coping in which you don't sort of plan what you're going to say next and keep track of what you said last. Merleau Ponty, I think, thinks of it as a very transparent coping skill, and it would sort of not be true to what was going on in the phenomena if you said that you were uh, ahead of yourself in the sense of having planned what you were going to say next on the basis of what you said so far. That was the phrase we don't, is that we don't want the not yet now but later kind of temporality when we're engaged in talking. That's why I think that's true. Let me go back, so I think I can get, make this clearer and keep you guys from getting lost. If we just see it on several levels, the one that Wagner doesn't say anything about the level I'm talking about, the, the most basic coping level, but he has a lot to say about the level in which they're, the, the, the for the sake of which, and in the sense in which the for the sake of which is not something that's happened, hasn't happened yet, and will happen not, is not yet now, but later. So let's talk about it. It's not only sort of the language going out the door, which doesn't have a not yet now, but later uh, story. But remember the story about being a professor. That's where, that's where Vladimir sees it. He sees that being a professor is not some goal to achieve, which isn't, which isn't in, in the present, uh, in the present you have the goal, and later you're going to achieve the goal, uh, it's, remember, you can do that before. You can have the goal, and you can have the success condition, and you can work for it, and then you can achieve them. But he, Bill is very good on the fact that being a professor is something you never achieve, it, because it's the, it structures your, all the things that you do if you're a professor, and, uh, and again, it disorders a future, which is not a kind of future, which is not yet now, and then it will become now. 
one said to which is not something in the future which is not yet now but will become now and then will become now. Right? It's something else. It's something that structures all of your experience and it's always somehow <coughs> to be done. That's the sense of in which it's future at all. Because otherwise you would just you wouldn't know why it was more future than present or past. But it's got a uh, ahead of itself. There's always more to be something. But it's not ahead of itself in the sense that it's got a representation of achieved. Okay, let me give you the last one because I mean I saw three, I bet there are more. Of course, death has exactly the structure. Yet demise is an event in the future. But dying is something you do all the time. And and dying is like being a professor. It's I mean, you never achieve it. In fact, I think it's quite clear that if you achieve it, you wouldn't be here anymore. Dying is something which is always ahead of you. You never arrive at it as if it's been uh, coming, but it, now it's finally arrived. It structures everything you do. And that's the sense we decided that death is a way of being, death is a way of life. No, sorry, dying, death, death is when you're having no more possibilities. Dying is this way of life in which you are always uh, your behavior is futural in a way that it is not sequential. That's the slogan I'm trying to illustrate. So now we've got three examples on the level of, of everyday coping with equipment, on the level of having a for the sake of rich, on the level of being having a structure of anticipatory resoluteness. They've all got a, a, a quality at the most uh, primordial level of not being sequential. Uh, and this is what I thought was the big insight. Yeah. Um, so it just, I mean, we've got this discussion in the context of a kind of against Latner's reading and trying to have another understanding. And I just, I, I'm, if you could just kind of bring this back around now to that. And also maybe this, we didn't quite read this, but we almost got up to the part where you, where there's the part that has that sort of idealist kind of sound in, in really? well, I, I did the source one. And the yeah, so right after the source one, he, he goes on to say, um, the fact that this um, is its source tells us that time in which what is present at hand arises and passes away is a genuine phenomenon of time. And then he says, it is not an externalization of a qualitative time into space as Bergson's interpretation of time. Well, I, I mean, I'm just wondering in the sense of, because because in the last few, in, in the last few minutes, we've kind of started talking about it almost in qualitative terms of like this, the way that Dasein experiences time phenomenologically, but you, you're wanting to resist any sort of idealist move that's going to suggest, so it seems like you, you're wanting to I mean, it seems like it, it, there might be a, a possibility that you're you're having a that you are sort of giving a qualitative notion to the way that we're describing time as an experience of this Dasein, while wanting to maybe maintain that what in fact you know in this robust realist way maybe what in fact is happening in the universe is a sequence of time. Oh, oh, so I'm just that's just a yeah, word. I don't know whether I want to talk about that now. But I know I see what you're saying. I mean, just seems like a worry. Uh, I'll say something now, parenthetical, but about Latin. I was going to bring it up later when we got to succession, which is the post side of the sort. We, you, you, you sort of know that you go from a, a description of uh, this kind of primordial temporality, which isn't successive, to the temporality of the everyday, uh, I guess, sort of unready to hand. Life, the kind of way you, you have, how does he put it? It's when you, it's the, it's clock time. It turns out to be it's one book before clock time. It's, it's, and remember, there's a way in which you sort of notice what, where you are in your progress and 
how do I think about this? Well, you, it's good to keep your eyes open. This is a big disagreement between me and Blackman already, and maybe they're related. I mean, Blackman says that Heidegger's trying to derive these primordial temporality. No, he's starting with primordial temporality, whatever that is. start with primordial temporality and you try to derive step by step how it get, it sort of breaks down you know, or becomes less and less rich and less and less unified as it goes to world time to science time and Bill thinks that you've got to be able to do Heidegger's got to be able to derive the five characteristics of world time which I'm not to talk about today, that's I think next time it's like, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That the significance, sharedness, that it's all the same, we all have the same now. There are, now I'll tell you so when you're reading one of the laws, if I remember, significance is there's a right time to do things. There's a time for lectures, there's a time for something. That's part of world time. There's the same, everybody's in the same now. Uh, and I don't remember the other ones. It's dateable. It's always when such and such say that we would say when it happened, and so forth. And then comes Bill's big problem. Heidegger does not try to derive succession. He's got a non-successive kind of temporality, namely we just heard about non-sequential. He has to explain how that non-sequential could become, you see, could be um, leveled into uh, a series of nouns and he doesn't do it in the book. Yeah, but I want to say, he doesn't even promise to do it because he's, now you need to think about, I've said this once before, I'm sure, but he won't be to say it again. I mean, I think that, I think, see, if you're a realist about my book, then you want to say, look, succession isn't something he wants to derive. Succession is what the, the physics deals with. It's a physical fact about the universe. That's the point. And if the fact that he fails to derive it and even fails to promise to derive it, which makes Bill's claim so weird, because you usually only fail to do what you promise to do, and Heidegger never says that when he derives it. So what would you get? You would get the following thing. You would think, now you have to make an analogy with space. I think I said this. You can, you can derive... We normally live in a space in which there's up and down and there's places and you can make all kinds of parallels between spatiality and primordial temporality. And there's a here in the space when we, that we're in. But then Heidegger says there's a Cartesian space where there's no here and there's no significance and there's no datability. They're just a homogeneous points. That's the whole point of the race extensa. And then uh, the question is, do you have to derive that from primordial temporality? And I want to say, why couldn't it be parallel with space? I even think that Cartesian space is fine for science. It's just leveled off, lost all of the meaning and relevance that, it, that we live in of spatiality. So why couldn't there be a succession of moments in real physical time? They won't be temporal because there won't be any now in them. And there, since there's no now, there won't be any earlier and later in them. And yet, uh, we don't want to derive them. They, that's the, the basic thing, the nature that, that uh, we live in. And we, we've got to be careful how you say this, but we, in a certain way, we, we lay or project, although that's all the wrong way to put it. So we are the temporal field in which things show up as earlier and later, that's world time, or show up in this complicated way of the for the sake of the, the uh, uh, present, whatever that is, uh, the abyss and so forth. Uh, we bring all that into it because we are time. So what could you say about nature time? Well, you'd have to say something very weird, which Heidegger says in the last paragraph of the book, the, uh, what is the history of the concept of time, 
he talks about the time-free moments of nature. I mean, I think he believes that, that, that just as there's space, without spatiality, and we'd be there whether we were around or not, he thinks that the time-free moments of nature, which would go on succeeding each other, whether any dog's hunt was ever around or not, that would be that would be realist, the realist time. And this is all a digression, though. I mean, you ask, and I'm telling you, but it's, it's, I want to keep, let's not lose track that he, he jumps to so what is Heidegger going to say about the, the success within nature? He's not going to be able to get there from primordial temporality. That's what he said. And I say that's right. And he's not trying to get there from primordial temporality. Yeah, and I didn't want to jump too far ahead, but it was just this notion of where he's, where Heidegger is cautioning us not to have this Bergsonian notion where we, where Bergson gives this kind of phenomenal reading, a phenomenological reading of how we experience time, and Heidegger... Oh, well, this, I, see, turn it, I didn't understand what you were up to. Turn away, what page were you it's, on? It's 382, where... I didn't understand what you were saying. Yeah, yeah, from, you have an idea that there's something... Well, it's, it's right up it's, it's on the first, at the end of the first paragraph. And I just, I mean, I'm not quite well, sure. That's, yeah, that's okay, the that's where, uh, It's right where you had already kind of said that, that there's this kind of idealist that's sort of feeling that Bill takes from. And it, and it just seems like maybe there's, just to kind of, on Bill's side, it almost seems at this point that Heidegger is saying, and we need to really take this as the source, not something that we are just, some experience that we are projecting onto some see that now. The time is within time this arises from an essential time of temporalizing of primordial temporality. Uh, arises. Maybe there's nothing so weird now I'm reading it. As arises from if you read that the way the unready to hand arises from uh, with transparent COVID, that would be all right. Maybe that's how I should read it. Let's try that. It, it arises from an essential kind of temporalizing, of memorial temporality, namely disturbance. The fact is that this it is its source tells us that the time in which the present can't arise the present is a genuine phenomenon of time. Yes, it's re- unready to handle time. It's not an externalization of the quality of time in the space. It's their sense of interpretation of time. It's not what you might have put out of the way. I don't know what to make of that. But whatever it is, what, do you know what to make of that? I know, yeah, I just, I mean, I, yeah, I, I mean, you know, we can but talk about it later. this marvelous uh, idea that maybe one can even make phenomenological sense, and I can take over these words, which seem to have a different meaning to Bill Blattner's Kantian idealism, and just say, of course, I love it. Of course, with time, with the time, this is going to arise, going to come out of that nothing big fancy going to come out of the, uh, the uh, ready to hand time. And, and the ready to hand time, uh, let's see, go back to this source. So it arises from the essential kind of temporalizing. Yeah, I think I'm ready to hand. I'm going to write that down to see if that could be right. That would be interesting. Yeah, I'm going to write that down. You see what I'm saying? I mean, there comes a, a point where you do have conditions of satisfaction, where you're in a disturbance, where you've got to go away, where you have to fix something, and that's, you haven't fixed it yet, you haven't fixed it yet, and aha, now you've fixed it, and there's a, that's how life goes. And, that's, and that kind of time arises from the coping kind of time. All I want to say is, fine, and that makes the coping kind of time the ontological ground floor from which all these other kinds of time Right, wait a second, I just want to read. The fact that this is the source, where source means simply that the way you get succession, well, not succession, the way you get earlier and later and now is by the way coping breaks down. Now, before either of you can say anything, there's on the very next page, there's something extremely relevant. I don't know yet whether it's going to shoot me down or not support, but we've got to read the first paragraph. Our preparatory analysis is made accessible in all the simplicity of phenomena and so forth. And this is looking down the kind of fashion. Far from excluding the multiplicity of primordial totality of God's constitution, particularly the demands of, he's talking about the threefold state of ecstasies. The primordiality of a state of being does not coincide with the simplicity and uniqueness of an ultimate structural element. Maybe that's anti bearers I don't know. I mean, but it would, the, the ontological source of Dasein's being is not inferior to 
powers above it in power from the outset. In the field of ontology, any springing from is degeneration. That's very interesting. I mean, that suggests that uh, you leave out more and more of the richness of the phenomena. So, there's the, so that means sort of first there's this involved coping, and then uh, that you can, when that breaks down, you get the unready to hand. And I've always been worried that that doesn't seem to me to be a degeneration. But uh, let's suppose in some it's, it's uh, let's see. something about the coping, but you leave out the unit, I guess. And uh, but I, I, I just want to notice that this kind of ontology is to say that what you, you want the primordial temporality to be the richest, not some kind of abstract structure. Because you, ontology amounts, the kind of derivation that he's interested in amounts to leaving out more and more. And I don't understand what the riches would be if it was some kind of structure, but I do understand what the riches would be if you were coping on the ground level with equipment, but it isn't uh, success conditions. You were coping on the personal level with your for the sake of which, but it's not something in the future. You're coping authentically with your demise, and that's not something in the future. That's the rich ground level, I think, that primordial temporality is. Maybe everybody understood this all along, but I don't know, I did. I had some, I was too much, I think, I, maybe I'm misunderstanding Blattner too, and I'm just caught in Kant, but I was thinking this is supposed to be some kind of abstract structure. Now I think that the ontological source has got to be so rich that all springing from, and remember that's this word in spring, on the, on the 382, springing from has gotten by leaving out. That's the, the, the generation story. And I understand that. I mean, I can't picture primordial temporality as having anything to leave out if you don't build into it what I just said. Transparent coping without, without representations for the sake of which that is a self without uh, uh, explicit sense of, of an identity, but, but, but nonetheless some, uh, something that covers your whole way of acting and anticipatory resoluteness has that structure too. Okay, now I'm sort of ignoring everybody. Uh, he wants to first because you want to talk. Go ahead. Well, is it um, succession, nothing but the leaving out of the uh, primordial future and the proneness? It's just that's what you get when you just have two, you know. Uh, Suc -suc succession would be just a meaningless as he would say, level, it's a series of moments, of nows, that has no significance, no dateability, no, what are the other ones I forget already, but anyway, you'll see the next one. All the characteristics of, of world time, that, that you can distinguish world time from universal. Universal world time is not as rich as primordial time, because it hasn't got
suggestion as taking snapshots of movement and giving it? But I don't want to go back into that. I already regretted talking to Jamie about it. I'm not very, you're talking about it. This is, we'll get to that. But it's, we have to get to it by deriving world time and from world time, we'll just add that, you know, science clock time and from clock time, science time, next time. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> I was going to switch to the past just because I wanted to, I, I was testing out whether the, this kind of interrelatedness of the unit of the dimensions can come uh, uh, Not only is there the way of being ahead of yourself that is, that, that is not, uh, not yet now, but later we talked about that, is there a sense in which the already, always already, is going to be tied up with the past and the future in a very integrated, uh, unified way? And the answer is, yes, Heidegger thinks that, he, uh, to quote uh, somewhere, I didn't find the page, that you can maybe find it. He says the past goes ahead of God's own. And that's, and why does that mean? Well, that's Merleau-Ponty making the intentional arc, which is, it, the phenomenon is, the more you learn about, say, a city, the more that city looks to you uh, sort of meaningful and with significant streets and turns and so forth. So that this past experience is, is, is 
thinking of these temporal horizons ever as earlier or later. And I say, look at page 237. Well, that's just where you get the definition of the uh, So uh, I wanted to give a look at it because I wanted, uh, this is like back to my group, aha. Uh -huh. If you can read the description of the game, which we can say in Cain, but let's just read it. The being of God's eye means, that's the first full paragraph, ahead of itself, being already in the world, as being amidst entities encountered within the world. This fills in the significance of the term air in a purely not to life of the way, and so forth. Now, I think that the way the past goes ahead of you, or the way the future never gets, is not something that ever becomes present. These two, these are examples of the phenomena that show the unity of that character, which is in the description. Just being ahead of yourself doesn't say that it's the past that structures what you're ahead of yourself into. And just being, uh, uh, what's, what's the other? Uh, Oh, and being already in. Have I got more to say about that? No, that just comes to the future. And being ahead of itself is, you can't tell from that kind of statement. Being ahead of itself could be representing conditions of satisfaction that you're trying to achieve. It could be the sort of unready to hand level. And then it would just be separate from the other dimensions. But if you're pressing into a future which is already structured by binness, which is this past that he's describing, then all these dimensions seem to be essentially tied up together. Uh, and I can't, I can't do it with the present. I don't know how to talk about the present I, uh, in, in this connection. You guys should do it. Somebody should write a paper. What would it be like to write a paper on this? It would be to say that the how the ecstasis of the present is not just a now, which is before something else that's going to happen in the future and after something that happened in the past, but it's essentially defined in terms of the, the future, but not again the now something's going to happen later, but the future as what is uh, what I'm pressing into. Somehow the present has got to be understood in terms of what I'm pressing into, and it's got to be understood in terms of what uh, has already structured my world. Uh, and I don't know how to do it, but I bet he does it. Uh, and, uh, and there's something, Bill Gladner's probably good on it. Bill Gladner says that all of the three dimensions of temporality come back embedded in the, in the present. Let me go back to where I am, and then I'll finish this one talk. So, we want to see why the already, the immense, and the pressing into are interrelated in and in. That's the sense, I'm just, now is what I promised. That's the sense in which the pair structure is described in Division 1. Lacks something which you get when you go to Division 2. And it, it it's been there all along, so to speak. But Division Two brings out the way the for the sake of is not after the present. That isn't in Division in the care structure description or in Division One. That's the professor being a professor and anticipatory resolutions and COVID. All that phenomenon in which is not here. I think that's the important thing. And then, are you convinced that or not? that there's some new level of significance and unity that's brought in once you start describing these primordial level, the primordial coping level of being in the world. Yeah. Um, well, it seems like if you don't describe that, then you just don't have care yet, right? Because care is a structural whole and you can't tear it apart. Well, that's right, but he doesn't tell us sort of how it's a structural whole. That right. we, he, that's the, all I'm saying is, you can't make sense of it as a structural whole until you introduce the, the special way the for the sake. As soon as you start saying, is it not a sequence of past, present, and future such that you could see the future as becoming present and becoming past, 
then you've got the unity. But you don't, you, from that the description itself and the claim that it's un, unified, you wouldn't be able to see that it's uh, got to be uh, non successive in, in, in this interrelated way. That's the new, that's the new. So, but that doesn't describe something that underlies care, right? That just describes care. That describes, no, it doesn't underlie care. It, well, it doesn't, it doesn't, let me see. I want to say it, it makes care in its unity intelligible, and it makes it in its unity intelligible by talking about a coping level beneath the present of hand and, and unready to hand levels, which have which make it look like you can separate out and trying is the thing that I, I'm still coming to what I saw <coughs> in Searle to achieve the conditions of satisfaction. That's perfectly compatible with this care description, but it's not compatible with this next time you hear about it where it's all we need to be now in the things. Because there's something more basic than representation and success conditions, namely the, the ground level coping has a certain kind of non-successiveness that you don't get at, at, at any other level. So what you, now I'm trying to answer you, but what did you just say? It, that means that it's the, the intelligibility of uh, the Hassan's threefold uh, care structure requires that you tell us more detailed and more um, basic coping story about Dasein and make explicit. I mean, he sort of told it already in Division One, in a way that's what you're saying. But he hasn't made it explicit and he hasn't built it in to the care description. Now, here is the challenge, which I haven't done. I challenge us all to do it. Rewrite, so to speak, what would the care description look like in terms of primordial temporality? See what I mean? That would be the test. How would you? And I'm sure that's in here somewhere. Let me, is anybody going to be able to find it? Maybe it's this thing on page 437. Let's see. Um, and let's look at the italics. I suspect that it'll be like uh, On 437, I said 73. 437. Only the entity which in its being is essentially futile, so that it is free from its death. Let itself be thrown back on the fact that you're there by shattering itself against that. That is to say, only an entity that is mutual is echo primordial in the process of having been. And, and, and the future is echo primordial in, in having been. And by handing down to itself the possibility of its air to take over its own thrownness in a moment of vision for its time, only authentic temporality, which is at the same time finite, makes possible something. No, it's sort of what you were talking about, but it's on, and it's there all right. But that's not what I want to talk about. So let's try again. What we want is not the authentic temporality, which it is. We want a kind of unity. Well, now, is, this, is, this, is it true that he thinks that there can only be a unified temporality for authentic gods? Because he's building death into the story. So all these people running around who aren't authentic don't have, uh, are not, their experience is not grounded in primordial temporality? I mean, I don't know. It seems to me you don't have to be authentic to be a professor. That is, the way that being a professor organizes your activity without being something that you can achieve in, by in the future, but haven't received yet. It seems to me, anybody, I mean, if that, that, that is, oh, that's so many things. I mean, if I take over being a professor from the one, doesn't that still have this kind of peculiar futurality in which you're always ahead of yourself and you're never going to arrive at it? Uh, you, you don't arrive at it, even if it's a role that you've taken over from the one. You just don't arrive at it. You take what you can arrive at tenure. Uh, and I would say, of course, I've got to say, though I haven't defended it, I don't know how yet, that coping with the doorknob, for instance, 
surely you don't have to be authentic to be pressing into possibilities in a way that are not based on representations and are not trying to achieve things. And already, that would seem to be a level of prim- that is structured by primordial temporality, not unready to hand sorrow like temporality where you're trying to achieve a goal. And so I'm, I'm just not thinking out loud. I wish somebody would write about these problems. And here's, here are two problems. Do you have to be to have a unified life where your three existences are all together? And then what is, how would you describe the unified life, the non-authentic Dasein? But Dasein is time, and time is a success. But he doesn't say authentic Dasein is time, he says Dasein is time. So we ought to be able to describe Dasein in a way, let me say it again, how would you describe Dasein in a way that would show the necessary threefold unity of the ecstasies, the, 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 these mutual present or past dimensions, uh, write it out as we explain it further. That would be what replaces the pair structure from on, on 237 with the primordial temporal structure, which is supposed to make the pair structure intelligible in some way that the pair structure isn't intelligible. Yeah, Can I add a couple of problems? Please. Um, so if um, if the primordial temporality is this basic level that can break down, then it's not ontological. Why, why is that? Because something that's ontological is always characteristic of Dasein. So what? It's always characteristic of Dasein if it's ontological. I couldn't understand. Say so something, something that's ontological is a characteristic of Dasein as such. Any Dasein has. That's right. Uh, it's, 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 sorry, so it's so it should be out. ontological. Temporal, temporality temporalizes itself. So it should be ontological. Yes. Right, whatever it's so, right, so it can't be something that can break down and stop. Ah, it can't, yes, it can't be something that can break down and stop. That's right. Dasein has got to be always yeah, doing it. Just as all the Dasein is always care. I take it, and this is my feel, Dasein is always temporality temporalizing itself. Now he says, maybe this is helpful, temporality can temporalize itself in two modes, authentic and inauthentic says that. But when it does, now a new question, is there a difference in the kind of unity of the three dimensions when Dasein temporalizes itself authentically and when Dasein temporalizes itself inauthentically? I presume there is. But now comes the next question. Are both of them uh, ways that you can make the hair structure intelligible or only one of them? Can only Heidegger who's the only authentic person we know for sure, have an, have an experience of the unity of the care structure? Or does everybody have an experience of the unity of the care structure? Then you're not in the business of describing it. I don't know. He, yeah. yeah. Um, there's one other problem. He also says uh, that death and guilt and the possibility of being a whole are grounded in care. And care, is, and care is a condition oh, of care. Oh, you're good to find your contradictions in this before I That seems a wrong thing to say, doesn't it? Where, where does he say that? Uh, 365. Okay. We've we, we, we got to have a list by the end of this course, and we, uh, we should try. I should try. Uh, we should remind us uh, of all, uh, I think you should try to work on with me. Of all the things that I can say that are wrong in relation to. Where is it? Uh, 365 in the middle. Um, the care structure does not speak against the possibility of being a whole, but is the condition for the possibility. Um, and then it became plain that the existential phenomenon of death, conscience, and guilt are anchored in the phenomenon of care. Wow, that is amazing. I mean, it isn't, I mean, it doesn't seem to be my problem, or our problem, it seems to be his problem, and, and right? I mean, primordial temporality temporalizing itself is supposed to be what makes the care structure, well, it's the meaning of the care structure. I read that to be, it's what makes the care structure intelligible in a way that it isn't if you don't bring that in. So now why in the world would all this stuff be grounded in care? I can't imagine. Where are we? Care is self
because look at the German first. So somehow the unity is urgent because care grounds the other things. Yeah, so it seems completely against everything I could say. So that's what makes it look like what gets more primordial is just the analysis. Like the description that he's giving becomes more intelligible and makes it intelligible. Yeah, but wouldn't it, 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 does grounds mean something different that, that becomes intelligible? That's the question. In what way? Here's, okay, here's a new question. Please, please, somebody keep track of these because I really have to deal with them. In what, in what way does the care structure ground the temporalizing of temporality? And in what way does the temporalizing of temporality ground the care structure? It sounds like it goes in both directions. And I don't know how to think about that. Yeah. Ground, I think, is a hard word to really understand the way we're using it here because care is relational, care is giving, and he was the original one that, that being gives. Well, and this is why I think bringing in an analogy like the infinite or the eternal is helpful, regardless. Well, well, back, well, he doesn't well, use, no, just let me, let me answer No, this, I can't, I would if time wasn't running out, but I'm supposed to leave in two minutes. And I, it is, I'm not just stopping you because of eternity. But because I want to make sure that I at least have to say the last word here. So let me look at my notes. Uh, the past goes ahead of us and so forth. Uh, all you know, we're all in the past. I didn't, I'm now going to begin at the beginning. I didn't say anything yet, Eugene, because I didn't think it was fair to say anything while you were gone. And besides, I didn't want to begin in the middle of a sentence somewhere. And I need help. And this is all so hard to understand. I want to, I'm, I'm sort of dialoguing with Bill Blattner. I think that there, I already started this last time. I think that there is so, there are two different, I'm going to repeat something I said last time because it's guiding me. I think that there are two different ways to understand the whole project of the temporal part of Division Two, and that is a Blattner way, which is really a Kantian way, which is asking about being as that on the uh, uh, that determines beings as beings, and he asks about so that there's going to be some kind of structure, and it's going to provide a kind of explanation. That, and I said last time, and I'm still trying to figure it out, that doesn't feel right to me. If the, the other half of the sentence is that being is that on the basis of which being is already understood. And what one ought to be getting is a phenomenological description of that, not, a, not some explanatory Kantian-like structure which tells you how come there is cause and, and substances and objective time in terms of rules for synthesizing experience, it's not, I mean, it's somehow, that's the wrong, any attempt to say that this is a kind of explanation is, it doesn't feel right. So, but, it, but then what is primordial temporality? I mean, this is the question, I, mean, I tell you, this is a very peculiar lecture in the sense that I'm going to talk about stuff that I don't really understand at all. The question really is, what is primordial temporality? And this is again related to last time. I want to say that it's a, a, a phenomenon that you ought to be able to describe, and it's that on the basis of which beings and Dasein are already understood. Uh, that's and that's very different. And another way to put the way Bill and I differ is, again, there's two ways to go. He knows that the worauf hin, 
which gets translated all kinds of ways in this translation and is hopelessly messed up. But there are two right ways to translate it. That on the basis of which, which is how I understand it, and he keeps saying that in terms of which, which is very different. He wants to explain some kind of, put something in some other words. I guess that's what in terms of which means, uh, literally anyway. And I want to say, no, no, that's not it. You want to describe a phenomenon so fundamental that everything else happens on the basis of it. That is, Dasein can be inauthentic, Dasein can be authentic, Dasein can cope with the ready to hand, and so forth. And so, and I want to relate that, and this is what I was saying before, while well, well, you were gone, Eugene, to this puzzling remark that ought to settle something between Bill and way of reading it and me, on page 383, which is full of strange things, about eight lines down, the ontological source of Dasein's being is not inferior to what springs from it, but towers above it in its power from the outset. The, in the field of ontology, any springing forth is degeneration. Uh, I'm not, I don't know what that means. Do you have any idea? But I, I want to say that it must, I mean, I want to read it. I don't know how Bill is going to understand it. Um, but I want to read it as saying, well, the richest experience or phenomenon, let's say phenomenon, is uh, temporality temporalizing itself. And that's going to be the basis on which all the rest takes place. And you're going to be always sort of leaving out the most fundamental basis when you describe all the things, the levels of stuff that can take place on it. I don't know. I leave you that. Anybody who can write a paper on that sentence, that would be very nice. Um, I'm going to go on. Uh, I want to say, and, and, and I'm, I'm trying to make a certain case, and I didn't run into anything in the chapter that just stopped me cold, uh, although I did run into a question from Eugene, which almost stopped me cold, but I think I have an answer for it. I'll get there in a minute. But uh, I want to say that the, what's the, 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 that on the basis of which everything that is understandable gets understood and everything that you can cope with gets coped with is the background coping. The background coping is a very peculiar phenomenon about which Heidegger never said anything very helpful in Division One, And I don't think he said anything very helpful about it in Division Two, except that he says it's very dark and he, uh, he can't say anything about it. But th what, it, what it is is the fact that whatever this background coping is, it's more basic than intentionality. It's more basic than any kind of structure. It's, a, it's, it's in a certain way extremely simple but hard to get a grip on. It's, the way, it's a kind of coping practice which doesn't have success conditions. It doesn't even have improvement conditions. It's a kind of coping which is just finding your way around in the world or, to take his usual local place, finding your way around in a familiar room. On the basis of that orientation, and familiarity, you can have intentionality, you can use doorknobs and open windows, you can stare at the doorknobs and describe their properties, you can do all the kind of intentionalistic things, both primordial, he, remember he has two kinds of intentionality, primordial intentionality, which is coping with the ready to hand, and um, conceptual intentionality, which is dealing with the unready to hand and the present at hand, all that takes place on a background of coping, which he says, is he says temporality is uh, not itself a kind of intentionality, but it's what makes intentionality possible. I, I can't remember where that is, but I, that's definitely <laughs> so, something that he says. And the and it's got to be unified. It it, it gives you a world. Uh, and how how to describe the background coping practices? When you're at, as they are a phenomenon, when you're actually absorbed in coping with them, is the question, I think, of this chapter, though it never comes out so clearly, 
because in the end, you've got to keep your eye on the end of the chapter to see why this makes sense. In the end, it turns out that what one wants to understand is transcendence. Primordial temporality is what makes transcendence possible. And there are three kinds of transcendence. Uh, or Well, uh, I was, I'm jumping way ahead, but now that I've started, I want to say it, so let's find where it is. Um, Because there's transcendental, there's transcendent, and where are they all? Hmm. Disappeared. So, so there's there's transcendence of the sort that goes out of the subject toward the object. That can't be it. There's transcendental of the sort in Kant, which is a structure that, that makes all, makes, holds the world together and things together and makes experience possible. It can't be that. So, but it's something which he calls transcendental. The end of the chapter Transcendental has disappeared from the book. I have to call in somebody to find it. Uh, where there's a section which we were just ready for, called the, with transcendental in the title. The one you asked me about. Where is it? It's gone, and it's because you asked me about it that we're in this. Uh, oh, I'm way, way, oh, way back there. Oh, okay, I'm in the wrong area. Page 415. Yeah, well, no, that's, there are two ends. That's the temporal problem of the transcendence of the world. That's where we're going to end up. But I can tell you, somehow if you describe this phenomena on the basis of which we can cope with and encounter anything that we encounter, if you describe it right, you're going to be able to understand how Dasein is its world existingly. That is, how Dasein isn't a subject that goes outside of itself. That would be the traditional kind of in representational intentionality. It isn't even a coping something that deals directly with things, which would be Heidegger, Merleau, Ponty kind of primordial intentionality. It's even more outside of itself than that. Just to read you the, the place where this comes out clearly. That, that, that the Dasein is the world existingly is one of the places. But now I have to go back to the very, to four, as I remember it's 477. No. Now I'm trying to find the place where he says that Dasein is the outside itself in and for itself. Well, if I did this in the right order that I wrote it, I would have all the pages. So let me stop this and go to the order. Uh, something 77, 377. I got the wrong. I went to 477. Okay, yes. So, so temporality is a kind of outside itself more outside than either the... Uh, representational intentionality or primordial intentionality. As he says right below 329, temporality is the primordial outside of itself, in and for itself. That's, all, that, that's the problem of this chapter. It, and that's also really worldhood. That turns out to be the clearing. It gets mentioned in a minute. It turns out to be the open, the there. All of those w names are the names for a phenomenon which is more basic then, and that on the basis of which all coping takes place. And, okay, the, and, and how to describe that phenomenon with, when you haven't got any of the normal philosophical tools, even intentionality, is what this weird chapter is trying to do. So, and 
I think Bill has just missed it. And I'll say another thing. I'm, I'm saying all the things that I think about it, and then I'll sort of read it in order. It seems to me that this is going to also have to answer this issue about why Heidegger says primordial and uh, authentic when he describes temporality, temporalizing itself. And there's a whole thing in which Bill claims rightly that he must just mean originary because, after all, authentic temporality is intermittent. But I think he thinks, and I'm gonna, this is what I'm going to argue, that there isn't any way for us to describe, finally, the background, pure coping of our being, or being in the world as finding our way around in the world. The best you can do is find a paradigm case of it, which is the most perspicuous. And that, that will be a case in which Dasein's temporality and the unity of Dasein's temporality will become actually experienced. It'll be a phenomenon. That's what authentic Dasein allows you to say. Lots about the, the towards which and anticipation and about the throwenness and the always already in. All of that gets an interpretation in terms of authentic Dasein. And I think the, the whole point of saying uh, both always primordial and authentic, I think he wants to say it is primordial and the way we have to describe it is through the way it's manifest and that is authentic. Now let me just read because I get always getting off from what I'm saying here. So on 385 I want to start. That's what I take to be about the background coping. Uh, so s look at the... I want to start with temp the temporality of understanding. It seems to come out clearly in that. So at the, uh, the beginning of that little section. With the term understanding, we have in mind a fundamental existentiality, which is neither a definite species of cognition or not explaining and so forth, nor uh, cognition at all in the sense of grasping something thematically. Understanding constitutes rather the being of the there in such a way that on the basis, that's I'm sure of where I've been, on the basis of such an understanding, a Dasein can in existing develop the different possibilities of sight looking around and just looking. In all explanation, one uncovers understandingly that which one cannot understand and all explanation is thus rooted in Dasein's primary understanding. And that primary understanding, I think, is this understanding, this familiarity with, with the world. Um, and it seems to be more basic more primordial than even the understanding as for the sake of which. I mean, the, there's understanding as primordial coping, namely hammering. There's understanding as the unready to hand, namely deliberating and such that he talks about. And there's understanding that's even more basic, namely the for the sake of which. And there has to be something even more basic than the for the sake of which, namely that on the basis of which Dasein is the kind of being that can have a for the sake of which. That's what this is supposed to be about, I think. But the best you can get at it, just like the best you can get at it is to talk about the for the sake of which because you, to how to talk about the, the unity of the coping practices that are constantly there in the background and make all intelligibility and all intentionality possible is something he doesn't know how to do and probably maybe can't be done. Yeah? Um, this notion of, of just like this uh, familiarity with the world which would seem to me to have a link to thrownness. Um, I remember you mentioning it way back in, in the Division One course some, actually even near the beginning um, and it really sounds not only very persuasive but necessary for the entire project here um, that we just sort of have I don't want to use the word preconception because that sounds too cognitive, but like a, I like the word understanding because it doesn't imply any sort of conception or representation in one's mind. It, it does to most people, but we Heideggerians have yeah, gotten right. over that. And, and yeah. certainly no rule set of any kind. You can't encapsulate the world or interaction with the world in a rule set. Um, but the notion, I mean, that you just be thrown into the world as like a sort of 
You're on the right track. There's a sense in which you and the world are so adapted to each other at this basic level of familiarity. That's got to do with this ecstatical structure of Dasein, which has a horizontal structure, too. The, the, her, we'll get back to that in a minute. The ecstatical structure is all, it has to do with the way Dasein is open and adapted to the world. And the horizontal structure has to do with the way the world is adapted to Dasein. And there's no distinction. I mean, they're just sort of two sides of the same coin. But, they're, but it's the nearest thing to the subject-object distinction when you, at the most primordial level, is that there, is ex there are ecstasies and there are horizons. But it's supposed to be not like the subject-object level, since somehow the ecstasies have horizons and the horizons have ecstasies, meaning that the Dasein has this threefold temporalizing structure and the world has some other uh, aspect of the threefold temporalizing structure and they can't be taken apart. They can't, they don't make any sense apart from each other. Now, why was I saying that? But, oh, just because uh, we're talking about understanding. And, and you made me think, I mean, you, you realize that from way back, again, I bet I can't turn to it, that familiarity, which never gets thematized much in Division One and or nor in Division Two goes to make up the understanding of being. That quote I like to quote from. So we're, you're very near the, the basic phenomenon when you're talking about familiarity. That's why I think that it might well be sort of the, a way of talking about the phenomena that he wants to talk about. Remember again, I just keep, what is the phenomenon he wants to talk about? It's that on the basis of which beings are understood and that's called temporality temporalizing itself. It's not going to look very much like any, like any kind of time. It's, it's not clock time. It's not world time with its earlier and later, and now it's time for a lecture kind of time. It's not, uh, certainly not physical, one moment after another time. It's not even successive kind of time. So, but it's, it's, uh, it has, Three dimension, a three-dimensional structure, and for and from and from that, oh, and and because that structure, I guess, is richer than any other structure, you get to call that, and and makes tem into all forms of time possible, you get to call that originary temporality, and that's what we're trying to understand what it is and how we're supposed to. Get any to be able to talk about it, uh, and I like this because it looks like that beginning of understanding is talking about uh, this kind of primary understanding, and the kind of primary understanding is going to be this background coping kind of understanding. I think, uh, and clearly, it's more basic even than anticipatory resoluteness. I have something on 385 that says that. The second paragraph. In the term under, if the term understanding is taken in a way which is primordially existence, existential, it means to be projecting toward an ability to be for the sake of which Dasein exists. In understanding one's own ability to be is disclosed and so forth. Uh, and that's... I guess primordially, the primordial existential understanding is what is is that authentic temporality temporal? I mean, is that temporality temporalizing itself, or does temporality temporalizing itself when it is originary existential? No, I think that is. That's one version of the way temporality temporalizes itself. That's only one, that's understanding. But they're all going to be aspects of the background coping, I think. If somebody wants to talk to me, I would be delighted, because I, I tell you, I, I think this is very important to understand this very, very difficult 
book. And I think we've got to understand what primordial temporality is, or temporality temporalizing itself, or you won't understand anything else. I mean, it's easy relative to that to understand authentic Dasein and resoluteness and anticipatory resoluteness and everything like that. That's child's play compared to this. And we don't even understand when we're doing this, and that's where Bill and I are differing, what the job is supposed to be. And, and so little, and, and, at least I think I understand in a way that I'm not sure Bill does, although I hadn't time to read more than the relevant chapter, uh, reread. But I mean, I'm not sure that Bill understands that the whole goal of this is to get a structure which covers both the world and Dasein such that you can see that it's the same structure from two, po from two points of view and capture both the, the d capture the fact that Dasein is its world existingly. That's the job, I think. Now, I saw a hand. Yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by originary time? Uh, oh, good, good. You see, how many, <laughs> how many didn't know? I mean, I, I, it's my fault that I nice somebody should speak up. It, it's the same. It's just two, the, the word is ursprünglich, and it gets translated primordial in uh, ours, and Blattner wants to translate it origi originary, or originary. Now, I don't remember, I, didn't rem I haven't any quarrel with Bill about that. It isn't as if, I think, although I'm ready to think out loud and entertain it, is it somehow sort of prejudicing the things in the direction of my trying to read it my way to call it primordial and his way to call it originary? I think I think it is. I think it is. He's already built into it that it's some. He understands the source as if, he, in some kind of idealist way, is built into it already. It, it the the ordinary kinds of time uh, arise from this, and I want to say, no, it's primordial. It isn't the origin of these other modes of time. It's more basic than all these other modes of time, but, and they presuppose it and act on the basis of it, but I don't think that's, I think that's, it's misleading to call that originary. I don't, is there any, do you have any feel for the German? The German sounds more like the originary, the That's true. And, and in the Ursprung des Kunstwerk, which Heidegger wrote later, that gets translated, the origin of the work of art. Yeah, Ursprung is just a, like, root outer Right, from. right. But I, hmm, you're right. Still, I, 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 I'm ready to just sort of take it, if, we could, if I could hear it in neutral way, originary meaning basic, then I wouldn't mind that ca calling it originary. Primordial is such a non, non-illuminating word that you just, if, to bring in from English if you try to do ursprung. So let's, um, so that's why I lapse into saying originary because it feels like a real, somehow it's saying something. However, when I worry about what it's saying, which Eugene just did, it sounds like it's saying something that I don't see any ground in the text. I mean, I see that, that, it, that all these modes of time arise from that. Now you have to go back to 383. That's why I started with 383. Arising from d seems to be somehow degenerating from. I still don't understand that. Let's we'll go back and look again in the light of this discussion. The ontological structure of Dasein's being is not inferior to what springs from it. Now, the ontological structure of Dasein's being is what? Temporality, temporalizing self, I presume, is not inferior to what springs from it, but towers above it in power from the outset. In the field of ontology, any springing from is degeneration. Yeah, and, but, and what, and what is, what it, is this on my side or on Bill's side, the idea that in ontology, springing from is degeneration. I don't get it. I mean, and then let's not go back to this. Uh, since, uh, it does, but let's stick to the question. All I want to say to you, you did the right thing to ask, and we have to make up our mind, and I think originary, I agree with Eugene, originary is closer to the German, even if it's 
further from what I want to say. Uh, yeah, you want to say more? Wait, but while you're doing that, just a second, I want to look at this and see. Look at that. It seems to be recording. Go ahead. Um, and in light of this book, too, there is a certain temporality, which I want to call natural temporality, that exists without dogma. Yeah. And this is a temporality of motions of objects and things changing with respect to position. And okay. Things. Let me say a word about that and keep that, bear that in mind. I mean, if you if you look at Blattner, by the way, Blattner is the only good book on this subject, as far as I know, and it's a very good book on the subject. That's why that that is this book, uh, Dasein's uh, Heidegger's Temporal Idealism, and that's why it's worth reading it and sort of dialoguing with it. But Blattner thinks that Heidegger's trying to derive nature time from Dasein time and fails. You are saying. No, there is a succession time in nature, and that's just basic, and it's going to be there, and, it, and, and, and it, it's independent of Dasein, and goes on whether Dasein ever exists or not. And uh, Heidegger, as far as I know, again, keep your eyes open, I don't think Heidegger ever says anything about successive time, oddly enough. He says that the, the Dasein structure, the, the of tem temporality, is not successive, and he says that from temporality he's able to derive a whole lot of the features of everyday time, and he certainly explains how, because of clocks, we begin to think of time as a succession of pure, meaningless nows, and he, he, can, he can derive sort of our access to that. Bill thinks he wants to derive that there are pure meaningless nows, and I think, and he fails, Bill says. I think he doesn't fail because he doesn't even try. But then why doesn't he tell us that he's assuming that, of course, there's a sequence of natural nows? I don't know. I mean, what I, what I really think is he thinks it's obvious. <laughs> I think he, he thinks it's obvious that Descartes uh, space is basic for science, but doesn't get at our spatiality. I think he thinks that natural succession <coughs> is basic too, and doesn't get at our kind of temporality. But you can't just say what you just said. I mean, or you can, but you're outside of this whole debate because Heidegger is certainly, if if that's what Heidegger is doing, then we've got to find some reason to think so. That meaning assuming natural succession. I think there are reasons to think that Heidegger is assuming natural succession. I think I mentioned this before. My favorite quote at the very last paragraph of the history of the concept of time, Heidegger talks about the time-free movements of nature. And that whatever that is, I think that's like Cartesian space. I think he thinks that's just there. But, and he doesn't feel he has to explain it. But you can't, you can't just start out with that. If you start out with that, you're going to get in trouble. You, you, you have to realize that Heidegger's... You've got, to, you've got to try to figure out how Heidegger could be holding on to a natural succession and why he isn't telling us. Uh, yeah. Yeah, right. But just to provide a different perspective, and maybe suggest why he might not want to mention it at all, I'm reminded, or I was reminded when I first read this, of a quote from Wittgenstein's Philosophical Investigation, where he mentions, just in a small quote, we like to say that animals don't talk because they don't think, but really they just don't talk. And I'm reminded of this insofar as I want to create a parallel and say, we like to say that things get older because time passes, but really they just get older. And there's a sense that we sort of assert succession onto nature, and things do get older and they change. But succession itself, as, as we compare it as clock time, isn't implied by that. And we don't need to even talk about succession necessarily to still maintain the idea that things will change in nature. Well, that's going to be an issue for I, either next time or the time after. We're, but let's not talk about it yet. Uh, I want to. 
I just want to say one thing about it to keep your eyes open for it. A very, just keep your eyes open and see what you think. A very smart undergraduate wrote a very good honors thesis about three years ago now, claiming that Heidegger makes a clear distinction between earlier and later, which are relative to now, and now is something we bring in to time, just like here is something we begin, bring into space. But the, there's something more neutral than earlier and later, which is before and after, which we can try to describe without bringing in a now, and that would be nature time. I, I, I mean, keep, it's, Heidegger's got a whole thing, and this is what this brilliant student found in the, the sophist lectures about how Aristotle is, is confused in his definition of time as to whether it's got an earlier and later or only a before and after. And, and that sounds very mysterious unless you keep asking yourself that whether the now depends on us and whether when it, you could have a kind of succession without it. Uh, so that's all to be put aside. First, uh, you, you in the back, then, okay, you, yeah. Wait, on 379, where are you? Okay. Yes, I think, yeah, that's an interesting quote. Uh, he does think, it seems, that, that any, any but, but of course, anybody in their right mind thinks the time goes on after they die, I mean, Kant too, and and Bill too. So the question is whether time is sort of constituted by us as going on, uh, you know, as a kind of I don't know. I I can't even think about it. That's a good point. Good point. Yeah, Tyler. Clocks, clocks go on, and calendars go on, and that. Well, that's that sounds right to me. Only because if he were really making this strong claim, it sounds like it. I should grant you, if he were really making the strong claim that uh, time, at, in every sense of time, even just brute succession, depends on us in some way. Uh, that seems strange, but on the other hand, if he said, if he seems to make the claim that uh, time uh, doesn't depend on us at all, he needs to explain it more. But but uh, but uh, but this is for next time. We are gotten off into exactly what we're not supposed to be talking about. You want to say something, Henry? Yeah. Well, well, every well, I don't mind talking about it because when you read it, you're at least be clued into what what about succession yeah um, he actually said that what is characteristic of time which is accessible to the ordinary understanding of the system where are you on what page 377 in the, the first paragraph of the okay below. where now what is characteristic of time well, I don't see where you are yet put down the timeline for 329 try above or below Okay. Temper well, go ahead then.
So what, what do you conclude about that from that? And, but the question is, I, I think the problem is, uh, there is a kind of sequence of now's temporality, all right. He's not going to deny that. The question is whether that is dependent on Dasein in some way, explained in terms of Dasein, or whether that's in nature independent of Dasein. And the question is, another way to put it is, is on this word accessible. Um, what is characteristic of time which is accessible to ordinary understanding is precisely the fact that it's a pure sequence of nows without beginning and end and so forth. That is, well, I'm, I never mind accessible, in which the ecstatical character of primordial time is leveled off. Just, hmm. Well, I don't know how important accessible is. I mean, it's clear that the, the sequence of nows is accessible to us only by way of leaving out all of the richness of temporality, temporalizing itself, and then all you get left, finally, is a sequence of pure nows. Now, there's, there's so many things to worry about there. Is it, is, is it the pure nows in nature that then we get access to when we leave all this out? I think not. I think now itself is a Dasein relative notion. And remember, uh, to me anyway, it helps a great deal to keep reminding yourself about space. If you get rid of Dasein, there is no here. But there's still uh, up and down, or, or, or at least there are three dimensions, equal and so forth, that, that whatever Descartes. There's still res extensa, but there's no now. And I think... so. The, to, to understand it in terms of a series of nows, you could only get there by having this rich notion and getting it more and more degenerated, to talk by that first quote, more and more privative, until all that's left is a succession of nows. I think Heidegger thinks that that depends on us. Uh, not only the intelligibility of it, but the ex access to it. You look worried. But I don't think that nature time depends on us because I think nature time has no nows. Now, I have no idea how you're supposed to think about a time that has no nows any more than I understand how you should think about the time-free movements of nature. But I want to say Heidegger thinks, seems to think, that there is a way to think about nature that would strip away the now and the earlier and the later and leave a kind of pure succession that didn't even have a now. Then, and, but I don't know. And it's funny how we're doing, why we're doing next time instead of this time. Probably because I can understand a little of next time and nothing of this time. Yes, yeah, Stephen. Wait, so talk loud, I can't hear you. Well, yeah, I, I, I think I'm agreeing with you. Are you a, a pure sequence of nows is what you get from, from within Dasein's rich temporality, temporalizing itself experience, in which there's pragmatic time, then there's clock time, then there's sequence of now time. All that is somehow relative to Dasein, I think. And, 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 and that's what you call present at uh, Dasman time, which I think that's right. And uh, the question is whether uh, there's a kind of succession even more basic which hasn't got any nows. That, that's, that's what he entertains in that discussion of Aristotle when he says that Aristotle mixes up the earlier and later, which you have to have a now. You, you can't have earlier than now without a now, or later without a now. But you can have before and after without a now, in some sense, 
the number series has, I mean, three is after one and so forth. And nature is going to be in some way laid out in such a way that there being a now in it doesn't doesn't make any difference, doesn't show up, doesn't, doesn't count. Uh, and again, just as you can lay out space, nobody thinks it's crazy to think that, we could, that there's a space in which there isn't any here. So why should it be, why shouldn't we at least try to think of a temporality in which there isn't any now? You're looking worried. Yeah, no, okay, but, uh, but I'm worried because I want to go back to this, okay? So here we go. Um, I, I have a, tried so hard to lay out what, the difference between what I'm saying and what Bill's saying so that you can try to decide for yourself and, with, and for me which one is the right way to look at it. So I've got, I got to 385, I say the existential condition of the possibility of intentionality is more basic even than anticipatory resoluteness. That's an interesting claim. Where do I get that? I got that out of 385, the second full paragraph. If the term understanding is taken in a way which is primordial existential, it needs to be projecting toward a ability to be what I read before, for the sake of which any Dasein exists. Uh, in understanding one's own ability to be, Dasein knows what it's capable of. It knows, however, not by having discovered some fact, maintain, but maintaining itself in an existential possibility. Why am I? What in the world? But I doesn't say anything yet about existential condition of the possibility is more basic than anticipatory resoluteness. Let's go on a little. Um, the kind of ignorance which corresponds to this does not consist in an absence of understanding that must be regarded as a deficient mode of the projectedness. Existence can be when one understands. Well, if it says what I just said it said, I don't see it now. I said existential condition of the possibility of intentionality is more basic than anticipatory resoluteness. That's a pretty clear claim. Why don't I see it? Well, I'm going to put a question mark there. If I figure out what I meant by it, I'll tell you next time if it's important. Probably isn't. So, all explanation is rooted in Dasein's primary understanding on 385. We just read that one. And now I'm wondering, if there is such a thing as a non-successive structure of background coping, what would it be like to understand it? And now I'm trying to figure out sort of, one, whether that's what we're try we should be trying to understand, and if so, whether Bill's notion of explaining it is going to help any. I'm on one, he, fi he finds this long quote about time in Heidegger's logic book, which is written a year before being, the lecture is given a year before being in time, and he says at the bottom of his 105, that is Blattner's, in logic, his book, Logic, Heidegger gives us an indication that he has something radical up his sleeve, but he does not say just what. And then it's like he quotes, already and ahead, the already and ahead that help to make up care as temporal characteristics do not concern an entity that takes place in time. And then, skipping down, because you heard that, um, I'm going to read the last part of it because it, it gets darker and darker and harder. Just, it looks like Heidegger sees that he's got something to talk about that he can't understand how to talk about it. Care is not only not temporally determined in the manner stated, that is, how. Uh, I don't know, but, but uh, care is not an uh, ontologic determined the matter, but rather cannot be temporally determined at all. Oh, of course, care isn't in time. Care is, that's the non-successive story. But already and ahead are temporal characteristics, exclamation mark. Thus, the only remaining possibility is that their time-like sense is not the sense thus far explained, but a different one. But what other sense? 
I mean, so the, 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 the kind already explained is all the kinds of temporality that you, you have when you're involved with things. And now he's asking, what about the background temporality, as I read it? And then he says this, namely, what is this more basic temporality? This is primarily dark, and we stand once again at the beginning of our considerations. Nonetheless, we have won, if not something positive, then at least prohibitively something essential. Namely, the reference to the idea that if the already and the ahead are temporal phenomena, the most natural interpretation as now time does not help us. So I'm, I'm reading that because it looks like at when he gets to the most basic time-like character, he says he, we, he, hasn't, he can't explain it. And that's when I want to say that I think if that's true, that there's a kind of basic coping phenomenon, finding your way around in the world, which is an understanding of being and holistic, uh, uh, but not intentional, then if, if there is such a thing, and if Heidegger doesn't know how to talk about it, and he never does talk about it, except to say there is such a thing, but he can't describe it, uh, then, is, it, then I would say authentic temporality is the best you can do, and because it gives us uh, the, you see in authentic temporality an instance of the unity of originary or primordial, you can have it either way, time. We can make sense of the unity of primordial temporality because we can make sense of the unity of an authentic life. I think that's, that's good. And that's why I think that he spends all this time in Division Two talking about temporality temporalizing itself as primordial and authentic is all he can talk about is the authentic structure of, tem of time temporalizing itself and its unity. He, when he does talk finally about this more basic, on the basis of which of everything, tem uh, being in being, that on the basis of which everything is intelligible, when he does finally talk about it, he says these very, very unhelpful things about ecstatical unities and horizontal unities and the way they are connected or sort of aspects of the same something or other. That's an attempt, that's, notice, that's an attempt to talk about something very general about time, not just authentic, the, the temporality of authentic Dasein, but the temporality of everything, the temporality of being in the world, the temporality of, of the clearing, the temporality of whatever, all, all these words that he's got for the disclosive openness that, that is most basically us. See, we, we, aren't, we aren't the totality of things existingly, but we are somehow the clearing or opening in which we can encounter ourselves and other Daseins and the totality of things, and that that that's what he wants to talk about. That's really what he always wants to talk about. The basic ontological differences, he calls it, is the difference between that opening in which beings become intelligible and every sort of being and every kind of intelligibility, I think. So let me go on. Uh, So he's going to describe the unity of the basic openness. And if he is, then that's not going to look like an explanation in, 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 in Blattner terms. It's not going to uh, make, uh, it's not something, it's, there's going to be no in terms of which. There's going to be a description of a phenomenon. And what you get is, I'll read the strange stuff that you get when he does it. I was already reading it, but now I've got to, we've got to be paying attention to how it fits in. Um, and that's uh, at the top of 377. All of this really important stuff happens there on 377. Temporality is not an entity. It is not, but it temporalizes itself. Nevertheless, we cannot avoid saying temporality is, and so we switch to saying temporality temporalizes and indeed it temporalizes possible ways of itself, 
These make possible the multiplicity of Dasein's modes of being, and especially the basic possibility of authentic and inauthentic existence. But they're just instances of all the stuff. But that is, again, keep remembering, it's so close to what we're talking about being as that on the basis of which beings are understood, all sorts of beings. Now let's go on. The future, the character of having been and the present show the phenomenological characteristics, the phenomenal characteristics of the towards oneself, of the back to and the letting oneself be encountered by. The phenomenon of towards, to and amidst make temporality manifest as, and now that's the ecstatic con, that's this ecsta- ecstasy story. That is, that it's the outside of itself, pure and simple. Temporality is the primordial or originary outside of itself in and for itself. We therefore call the phenomena of the future the characteristic of having been in the present, the ecstasies of temporality. Temporality is not prior to this, is not prior to this an entity which first emerges from itself. Its essence is, never mind a process of, is temporalizing in the unity of the ecstasies. That that's what I think is evidence that whatever this primordial temporality is interested in, it's what opens up a space in which anything can show up at all as anything. I want to read, I've read what, I, let's see, I've read that. Uh, yeah, okay. It, And I say on 401, he gets as near as he ever gets to saying what he wants to say. Let's see what that is. Yeah, yeah, that's where he's got... He puts it together at the middle, right where the italics is. Thus we can see that in every ecstasis, temporality temporalizes itself as a whole and this means that the ecstatical unity with which temporality has fully temporalized itself currently is is grounded you'll see where I don't know, that in the ecstatical unity and so on so is grounded the totality of the structural whole of existence facticity and falling that's the unity of the care structure and I haven't got I'm not reading the thing I want yet uh, Okay, on, on, on 402, we ought to now be able to understand being in the world. That's where he's going to put them together. The new paragraph. Only through the fact that being there is rooted in temporality can you get an insight into the existential possibility of the phenomena, which is the, the beginning of our analysis of Dasein, that is, being in the world. Uh, skipping a little. The question of the basis, which makes the unity of this articulate structure possible, remains remained in the background. So now it's in the foreground. And the basis which makes the unity of this articulate structure possible. Now, that's certainly not authentic te- Dasein and authentic temporality because they're intermittent. So Bill and I are both trying to describe what that would be. And uh, I don't really understand what Bill thinks it is. Uh, the, any of you who read... I mean, I'm trying to understand what the phenomena is. That, that he's trying to describe as temporality temporalizing itself. Yeah. Yes, well, naturally, and so is Bill, but anyway, but go ahead. That's very helpful, that distinction, but I stick to, you know, my end of it. It looks to me like if he just stops with what job does it do, he's not, got, he's not done much. I mean, that he, for instance, I mean, if he just says 
that it unifies all the modes of time and it gives us and so forth. That's fine, but he seems to be trying to ask, and how does it do that? What, are, what is the, phenomenon stru the phenomenal structure that enables us to do it? The reason I think he's trying to ask that question, I mean, I think you're right. If he stopped with, this is what it does, he'd at least have got somewhere, and that would be nice. But he seems to say, finally, I just haven't got to it yet, that when you really want to talk about it, you finally got to talk about the fact that it's got ecstasies, and it's got a horizon. That doesn't seem to be something it does. Let's go to that. It seems to be something that uh, enables it to explain the, the, the fact that we are the world existingly. We're back to that again. And he, let's see now. Okay, here we are on 416. Now ask yourself Tyler's question. Is when, when Heidegger finally gets down to as near as he ever gets to talking about, let's start on 4.15, the heading of the chapter, the temporal problem of the transcendence of the world, he gets a question at the bottom, how anything like the world in its unity with Dasein is ontologically possible? Isn't that, doesn't that look like the question about how does it do what it does? How, what, what sort of thing, I think it looks like the question, what sort of thing does temporality have to be in order for it to do the job that it does? Yes. 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 Okay, well, I, in a funny way, I agree w in a w half with you. There's no phenomena that you can point to or say anything about, but there's the something or other on the basis of which the first two things... So what's the job that needs to be done? We know that somehow get, get Dasein and world together in it completely. How, what structure enables it to do it? We know that, it turns out. I'm just talking about it in a minute. It's the ecstatic horizontal structure of temporality. And now we want to know, but we can't say anything about, what it is on the basis of which that happens. Now that's where Blattner starts talking about the in terms of which. And I guess that's what you're saying is you could stop with in terms of which if you say, uh, if you use the words ecstatical and horizontal, those are the terms. When you see, say it once again. It'll be, you can always keep saying a three-fold structure anyway. That's the, that's the only thing to hold on to. Yeah, even authentic Dasein has a three-fold structure. Coping has a three-fold structure with equipment. And that three-fold structure gets traced back and back until you get the three ecsta ecstasies somehow link with or have the three-fold horizons. And that's how it all fits at the most basic level. And you can do all that, I'm following you, in terms of the, just the way I did. And, but it doesn't seem to me sort of... That, this is a book in phenomenology, and I can't help thinking that Heidegger wants to point us to the phenomenon. And, uh, and there is a phenomenon, namely this familiarity of the involved coping, which is always going on and provides the clearing for it all. Uh, but 
you may be right. I mean, the bill, bill would turn out to be right if Heidegger isn't even trying to do what I'm asking him to do, but he's satisfied to do the, what's the job and what are the sort of equipment that you've got for doing the job and how does it do the job, uh, all at a level of terms. And I want to say, no, no, you've got to do it at the level of uh, a, a, a phenomena. Again, remember, the question is partly, is being that on the basis of which being is understood, or is being that, is, is it a structure that, uh, in terms of which being is understood, is all constantly in the background? I wish I could tell. But I think you, you I, th I like what you're saying in the sense that since I can't give any account of how to describe this familiarity, except that it's coping and it's holistic, then maybe I shouldn't even be trying. And maybe he shouldn't be trying. Yeah, I Jamie. Was just, I was just thinking, going back to the very beginning of the book, when he first introduces what far down the road he's going to do with temporality, he says, we shall point to temporality as the meaning of the being of that entity which we call Dasein. If this is to be demonstrated, those structures of Dasein, which we shall provisionally exhibit, must be interpreted over again as modes of temporality. So here it seems, I mean, it, it seems like I don't, I don't know if they have to be a phenomenon that's exhibited so much as when we really, you know, because he's going to lay out all, in Division One, he's going to lay out all of these structures of Dasein, and then, and then we'll be able to kind of see this, this pattern start to develop where we can, where, what we're going to do is, it's going to be interpreted, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily explain a phenomenon, but it's going to be interpreting these structures that we've laid out and recognizing the kind of threefold position of time. So that's more like what Tyler and yeah. Bill are saying. I'm asking for something that's ju that's just not. There, am I asking for something that th there isn't any such thing that that uh, my this on the basis of which phenomena, or am I asking for just something that we can't say anything about and he's not trying? And Bill is right about that. I don't know. I mean, I don't. In the end, I don't know if, if you're all so far apart. In a, in a way, I feel like you're wanting to point to our everyday coping and then wanting to see a phenomena somehow over over and above that or something that's going to be temporality where I think that that might be we might explain that phenomenon how in, in how we in the way that we carry out the, the things that go to structures of Dasein and then on a deeper understanding of you I mean in some ways I think that you're I think that you're it seems right to me the way that you're addressing it in terms of familiarity and coping but I think that I think that what temporality is doing here is taking that and on a fundamental level this you know, this this interpreting if we really interpret the structures that are that are in place functioning there are functioning there, we will see on interpreting these at a deeper, more meaningful level that they they come down to temporality. Okay. I think that's getting closer. Yeah, yeah. If if I don't think that makes it I I don't think that forces it to be a Kantian idealism either. Mm -hmm. I don't think I think that you know I, I final interpretation we place on all of these structures, we're going to see it in terms of this threefold structure that is temporality. But I don't okay, know yeah, yeah, I think that that's, um, I think that may be right. Let me go on, and to, to, but uh, let me see where we are. Yeah, okay, we have time. So here we are. Uh, we haven't gotten to the place where I want, where I claim that he's really trying to describe the the ultimate clearing or something like that. Uh, see, it could be, I'm just thinking, that, that, that we're trying to do justice to both. That on the basis of which beings are understood is what I keep wanting to find. That's the ultimate clearing of some sort, spa open space. And that in terms of which beings, uh, what is it, that which determines beings as beings, that would be the the other something structure that Bill is looking for, I suppose. I think we really, and, and maybe we're supposed to put them together. I mean, we discover that in turn that, that determines beings as beings, and then we discover that points us to some kind of openness, which is a phenomenon, maybe. I mean, uh, you're looking puzzled. I, what I said is puzzling. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah, and it's also possible that 
Yeah, I was hoping to say, just, I'll say yes, so that he could combine them, that he can, do, he can describe that in terms of which all this happens, and he can describe that on the basis of which all this happens. And he may either be trying to do both and not be able to or not know it, or maybe he's really trying to do both and he knows it and we're supposed to figure it out that he's doing that. Yes, it's really another way to put it is, what is, it, is, is this mostly hermeneutic or is this mostly phenomenology? That's another, isn't that the same? I mean, I say but it's got a bottom out in a phenomena that he can describe on the basis of which everything else makes is intelligible. And the hermeneutic view would say something like, I guess, it's got to be articulated in terms so that we can uh, see it, it, make it intelligible. And th- the... One of them is make it intelligible. Thing intelligible and to make it possible. And the intelligible is the story I keep trying to tell. And the possibility, and that would be some sort of realist, sort of realist way. And that which makes it all uh, possible, that's Bill's story, I take it. That's the kind of idealism he wants. Is that, or am I missing? I, I reversed what you said? I'm not sure which of two, but it's something else. Some kind of two. Yeah, two of them. Okay. Uh, I saw a hand over here, yeah. Yes, it's funny that he doesn't explain it much, but he talks about, in Being in Time, he talks about the horizon for understanding being, as if there was a place to stop. But in Basic Problems, in the part that we'll read during the last three times, he talks about how there's always a broader horizon in terms of which you should be understanding all this. And I guess that's more than what he should be saying. And given his hermeneutic approach, there's no... There's no final horizon that says now we've really got it. Uh, okay, let me go back. I mean, I, somehow I keep not finding the passages here that I definitely want to read before I stop. So let me keep looking. Um, I, I just found the part which I already said. That, that what he calls transcendence is going to be something that is not transcending from inner to outer, not a structure like that you could d- p- say much about or anything about. And, but it's, it provides... Now, I'm, now this is where I've got these things. It's, it's something that is like a space, a clearing... On which, on the basis of which, all forms of intentionality take place. And then I say, look at page 415 and see what is that where we are. Um, now I've got everything underlined on 415, so I don't know what I'm supposed to be reading. Uh, so. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to start with the italics about five lines down. That inside which Dasein understands itself is there along with its factical existence. That inside which one primary understanding one primarily understands oneself has Dasein's kind of being. Dasein is its world existingly. And then he goes through this other talk about the there and clearing, I forget where the clearing comes in, but it does. We have defined, so I'm going on, we have defined being as care. The ontological meaning of care is temporality. We've shown that temporality constitutes the disclosedness of the there, and we've shown how it does so. Uh, in the disclosedness of the there, the world is disclosed along with it. The unity of significance must then likewise be grounded in temporality. And then comes this amazing quick move in the existential temporal condition for the possibility of the world lies in the fact that temporality has an ecstatical as an ecstatical unity has something like a horizon 
and I don't, I mean, it looks like we're trying to understand the world and the there and the openness and I, in another place what he calls the clearing and it looks like we're trying to understand also how Dasein is its world existingly and I just, I mean, if somebody can tell me, maybe Tyler more than anybody, maybe, I don't know, what, where he suddenly gets this business of the ecstasies have a horizon and that's very important and it seems to do all the job that, that hasn't been done. Do you understand that? Yeah, let's all let's repeat that. Just because it's very this much is clear. The ecstasies are the whole structure seen from the point of view of Dasein. It's Dasein that has an ecstatical structure, being all, uh, ahead of itself, already in a midst, and so. But that is an ecstatical structure. Okay. And and that ecstatical structure ha- is a threefold structure and a y- unified structure since it's each of the three elements brings in it, describing any one of the three aspects brings in the other two. That's all, and that's how it gives unity to the care structure. Okay. Oh, does he? No. Ah, gee, we'll put that on hold. You realize that may be temporarily take because it turns out that even though originary temporality, which is what we're talking about, has an ecstatical structure from the side of Dasein and has a horizontal structure from the side of coping. So just as there's always a towards which on the side of Dasein with a for the sake of which, there's a towards which on the side of coping that has also got a for the sake of which. And they're different for the sake of witches and yet they're the same. Because the, 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 the for the sake of which, say being a professor, is on the side of the ecstasies, but the but the for the sake of which, when you consider not my stand on my being, but the role I've got, that's also futural, and that's on the side of the of the world. I my my stand on my being is ecstatical, but the but the role and the equipment that I am sort of defined in terms of is horizontal. I'm that's. That's good. That the that and that's that's a, and that's the sense the sense in which you can't define being a professor either as a subjective thing alone as a, or a, a, or a coping in the world thing alone, but that they're really two sides of the same phenomenon or something. That's good. That's and that helps. But where is this other use of horizon? Oh no, I'm sorry. I started to explain it. I don't know where it is in here, but in being in. Basic, in basic problems, he comes to a more fundamental kind of temporality than ecstatical or horizontal. Namely, we've got a new word for it, temporalitate, and that's supposed to do something more to explain, as you say, the way the two come together, or why they come together, or how they come together, I don't know what. But Yes, but I, that's not in here, is it? This. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's hope not, or at least let's try not to think about it yet.
So the question here is, in what sense are the excesses that the judge centralized the Uniform Horizon? Because it can't be that Horizon is a human. It has to be something else. Does he say they temporalize with inner horizon? Did I? Oh, let's, let's let me look again. Uh, lies in ecstatic, the ecstatical temporal condition of the possibility of the world lies in the fact that temporality as an ecstatical unity has something like a horizon. Not exactly within it, I think, but just correlated with it. Uh, yes, but where's the notion of a horizon for ecstatical temporality? But the other side temporary. It, it has a horizontal schema. Right? The, well, the, the horizontal schema is the threefold uh, something or other on the side of the world, which corresponds to the threefold ecstatical structure on the side of Dasein. Are, are we agreeing about that? What I just read, did that get you to where you are? Let's see. We, we Let's go back to 413. 414. 415, uh, no, 416. We've defined being as care and so forth. They've shown that the temporality consists in the, so, in the world, in, in the disclosedness of the there, and the world is disclosed with it. The unity of significance, the ontological constitution of the world must be grounded in temporality. The existential temporal, temporal condition for the possibility of the world lies in the fact that temporality as an ecstatical unity has something like a horizon. Uh, that just says, I think, what I just said something like that the for the sake of which is both uh, the, the future aspect of Dasein and the future aspect of the world, and they have to mesh. Does it say more than that? Remember, what we're trying to get is that amazing sentence at the end of the previous paragraph. Dasein is its world existingly. That's supposed to be both giving you the sort of nearest thing to the subject-object distinction and taking it back, so to speak. There is no way that Dasein and the world can be separated. The, the temporal, temporalizing itself has this two-aspect structure which is Dasein being in the world. And uh, this is what he wants to explain now. Uh, let's see if I can get any clearer or find another quote. Let's look at the bottom paragraph, first sentence. The unity of the horizontal schema of future present and having been is grounded in the ecstatical unity of temporality. The, horizontal, the horizon of temporality as a whole determines the whereupon, there's the war of war of in again, so determines that on the basis of which factical existing entities are essentially disclosed. That's, that's the on the basis of which, which I think of as the familiarity, though he doesn't say that. Um, does that help any settle this? Let me go on. With one's factical being their ability to there, the ability the ability to be is in each case projected in the horizon of the future. One's being already disclosed in the horizon of having been, and that which one says discovered in the horizon of the present. The horizontal unity of the schemata of these ecstasies make possible the primordial way in which the relationships of the in order to are connected with the for the sake of. Is that helping any? I don't know. <laughs> not, not much. Uh, you, yeah. Yeah. Is the German going to cast a light on it? No, no. Oh. Okay, I got a story about that. I mean, I, that used to worry me. And I used to think that Dasein was the world existingly, which is the, which is the Hegel side, only in Heidegger it would be Das Mann's side. That, the, and then I, but I used to think, but he says 
to my amazement, that Dasein is its world existingly. And then I decided that the way to think about it is that Dasein is a perspective on a shared world. That, that to be a there is to be, is to have, you know, it, just that. Not, not a projection like in Renaissance painting, but that every Dasein has a world which is the same world but colored differently by, could be colored differently by its moods and by its pers- horizon, or its perspective. Wouldn't that... Ah, okay. I, I marked the place where he seemed to have done it the other way too. And that's not maybe not going to help because he ought to get it together. At the bottom, at the top of 417, we've got, let me try the starting at the bottom of 416, the horizontal unity and so forth and so forth. This implies that on the basis of the horizontal constitution of the ecstatical unity of temporality, there belongs to that entity, which is in each case its own there, something like a world that has been disclosed. He's got the it's and the and the a together in a sentence. Does that solve it, or does that just sort of finesse it? I don't. Know. Well, it's own there something like a world. I see. He doesn't say the world. Now, I really wanted him to say Dasein is the world uh, existingly. It seems to me, doesn't it to you, that that's what he should say? We're all open on the one world. There, there can't. I mean, he better not think that my world is prior to the world. That will get him into Husserl and Sartre right off. Right, but if you're the world existing, and I'm the world existing, then you and I are the same. Well, no, because I am the world from my perspective, and you are the world from your perspective. Uh, so it isn't just that we are the world. We are our t- each of us is our take on the world. That's that, that's got to be right. I mean, so we're not the world because we're only our take on the world. Ah, but we are the world in the sense that uh, it's like that when you see the front of the house, you see the whole house. You, just because you see it from a point of view doesn't mean that it isn't the same house for everybody. Is that a big difference? Let me think about it. Wait wait a second. I have to think about that. Now you are the house. Uh, that's a problem. I see what you mean. Well, how are we supposed to save him? You want to save You want to help him out? That's, and that's the way you've got to get rid of right, that. Exactly. I think the way you get rid of that is through this, this unity of combining horizons in a stasi necessarily, such that Dasein and the world are always, that, that none ever, I guess, defers to the other. Okay. Let me try something, maybe the same and maybe not, that uh, I think what he has to, wants to say is the, the world isn't, is, uh, the world is something that you can be from a perspective because the world is uh, a clearing in which things can show up and there is just one clearing 
uh, but when you, when you are it, I think maybe even what you're saying, when you are it existingly, then you aren't really it in the sense that you're like the... the, the so let me read something here on 4.16, uh, right after that. I think maybe I read it, but if I did, I won't hurt. If I did, I'll read it again. Right after Dasein is its world existing, we have defined Dasein's being as care. The ontological meaning of care is temporality. We've shown that temporality constitutes the disclosedness of the there. See, that's, since that seems to be the, like the world. It isn't your there and my there. The disclosing of the there, and we've shown how it is so. In the disclosedness of the there, the world is disclosed along with it. The unity of significance, that is the ontological sig- constitution of the world, must then likewise be grounded in temporality. Uh, have we got anywhere? I mean, he doesn't. He does. Is he seems to be wanting to say that the, that each Dasein discloses the world, and that that's compatible with saying each Dasein discloses its world. Existingly, I mean, I'm just stating your problem, but it's right there within those few sentences on 416. And then he seems, and it's, I want everybody to pay attention and, and think about this. I mean, that is, I bet, I mean, the final problem that this whole thing is trying to get settled. How in the world are you going to get Dasein, which seems to be us, and once upon a time, consciousness and mental representations, all of which he denies, together without, uh, with the world uh, in a way that doesn't turn it into monadic idealism like Husserl, which he certainly doesn't want to do, like Sartre, where somehow you have to get from my world to the world. No, Dasein is always open and to, a, to a world. He, he has to get his sense that Dasein is open to and coping in a shared world together with each Dasein has to take a stand on its being and have its for the sake of which. And somehow in these th- pages right here, he thinks he's doing it. Uh, now lots of hands are come up. If you all want to help him do it, that's good with me. Yo, go ahead. Why do you say that? Well, I mean, it's not a category of representation so much as an unfolding uh, of the three. Okay, sort of. I, uh, why not say it always exists? I mean, it never is never finished, but it's sure. really always going on. Okay. Yeah, and, and it's that always going on part that is genealogically unfolding. Teleologically. Genealogically. Genealogically. Right. What is that? I mean, that I can't really understand how that's going to solve this very basic problem of how we're going to get ourselves as what was once upon a time subjects related to the world, which was once upon a time objects, in such a way that we can get in in no way get get ourselves trapped into our own stream of experience or our own perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So why wouldn't that bring along other people in the same world that they can? Well, I think we've gotten to this deep level where he's trying to explain how it's possible for Dasein to be that kind of being with. I mean, yes, Dasein is certainly in the world with other Daseins, and and it's doing that somehow in a way that's tied up with its having its own for the sake of which, and therefore its own take on the world and and everything. How is he going to get these two together? And it looks like he thinks he's getting them together right here, but we don't see yet how, how it's happening. Yeah. yeah I, I guess to resolve like, the, the question of possible solipsism or like distancing Dasein from the world and therefore failing to do it, it's just time to be done. I mean, could one say that Dasein shares the world and thus Dasein is not the world? 
yet inside of the world. But in saying that Dasein is the world implicitly, that say each individual Dasein, each one of us, could be the world existently in a different way and still share the same world. And I, I guess that would that, that would be why I wanted to also emphasize that term implicitly so much. As <coughs> though each Dasein was like a modification upon the world rather than a separate sphere wherein everything else is to a subordinate to a central Dasein. Yeah, yeah. I think somehow we've got to come up with the, and you're on the right track, the way, uh, what a world, whatever a world is, it's something that you can be in such a way as to not, as to not be separate from it, and yet not every, not be identical with every with everybody else who is the world. And we're trying, and and, and he, surely he thinks here he said something very important about that, namely the business about horizons and ecstasies. I'm beginning to think I sort of understand it, thanks to you all. But I, I'll wait till you all talk and see if I can say it. Well, I think he thinks the existing Dasein is the, is the there, is the clearing. I mean, this is the extreme emptiness of em the empty mind turned to open to this shared something or other. But, but how can existing Dasein both be a world and within the world? I mean, that's... It's, in, it's the world from within it. That's just another of the funny things. Worlds are not... Uh, that's how worlds are. I'm in the academic world from within the academic world. That's just not, not, not a problem. Yeah. That's surely got to be right. Descartes, yeah. Descartes, I mean, his problem with initiating this whole Solipsism thing is that he tried to take the two away from each other. He tried to separate the two. That's impossible. Um, so I don't think that's that much of a threat. Um, as far as Solipsism is, is concerned, I don't know how to deal with that. That sounds incredibly hard. But, I mean, maybe it's worth mentioning that, of course, the world which Dasein engages in is really the same world which other Dasein's engage in. Well, maybe, I mean, I'll, let me paraphrase it in something that sounds like it makes sense anyway, that you are, you are disclosedness, but being, you are disclosedness is your way of opening on to the world. I'm just doing my sort of perspectival thing with other, other words. Or, I mean, and, and you, what tends to mean to say you are your, well, disclosedness is somehow something that you can be. You are your disclosing, or disclosing. You are disclosing all the time, and it's your disclosing. And but what you're disclosing is a world, and worlds are, and and the world. What, what you're disclosing is a shared world with other people and shared equipment and so forth. Why can't the disclosing? Why can't you 
be the disclosing activity of of, sh of a sharedly of, of a of a one disclosed world. I'm just trying to, to find a formulation that will work. Yeah. Okay, but I mean, wouldn't we have the same problem back? Just let's start with the domestic environment, sort of following Eugene's way of thinking. Uh, what does it mean to say you are your your domestic environment, in such in, in, instead of uh, you are it? Well, that's so strange. I mean, I can say you disclose you are the activity of disclosing your domestic environment. That seems to be the right way to go. Then. Uh, but then he does say, you are, you are, and, and that's the existingly, I guess. You are the world existingly. You are the activity of disclosing or clearing a shared world or clearing. Now that's, I'm just trying to, and why does he think? Let, let me say something before I give me, I, I thought I was on the right track. I want this, it ought to come out really simple, believe it or not, if you just get the right clue. And I think I was on the right track when I wanted to say that being a professor is both something that I have to do on my, in my own taking a stand on my being, and it's a for the sake of which in the referential totality, it, and I, so when, so when I, is the for the sake of which, try to put it this way, something, which I surely am, I mean that defines me, that's my identity. I, and but my identity involves all this shared equipment, and and I, I want to say something like if you read all this about the future and the for the sake of which, you ought to be able to find out that you the da, Dasein is both self-defined by taking a stand on its being, by having an ultimate for the sake of which, and that that ha that's the ecstasy part. And that that has as its horizon that there have to be students and equipment and all kinds of public stuff, and that they sort of totally belong to each other. That you start with the ecstasy because Dasein is starts with the you with, he starts with the being and takes a stand on its being, and he thinks that's the most important dimension, the futural dimension. But as soon as you try to say what uh, you know how to describe that you immediately have to that, and that's the ecstasy you immediately have to bring in the horizon what and what is the horizon it's that sort of public shared for the sake of which and now and that enables you to say you are and, and, and how's that related to the world? Well, that's part of a big, complicated structure, which is a world structure. And you've got, you've defined yourself in terms of a, so to speak, piece of that world structure, described as you're for the sake of which. And you really are that. I'm trying to bring in the identity story. That when you get your identity in terms of something in the future, you ultimately you automatically bring in that there is something in the future that you're getting your identity in terms of and it's not of course the thing you're ever going to achieve it's that kind of it's authentic kind of future being a professor but is that helping i mean i think if you really try to think it out and do it the way he does it and describe the temporal dimensions of coping and just with equipment and, and, and how that is structured, as he does in the beginning, or oh, the equipmental totality, never mind the coping. You, you describe the equipmental totality, and you describe Dasein taking a stand on its being. And f way at, at the beginning, those seem totally different. 
But by the time I think you get to, I think by the time you get to this page 416 and 417, you've earned the right to say that they're not totally different, that there is some way in which you are defined by the world, but it's, but each, but you are defined in your way by the world and other people are defined in their way by the world. Is that helping any at all? Are you looking a little bit enlightened? No? But you don't think it solves the problem. All right, he shouldn't say is. He shouldn't say is the world, right? I think I, think I just wouldn't substitute discloses. If you say Dasein discloses the world existingly, or a world, or its world, I don't think it matters anymore with, with, with the notion of disclosing. Succeeding. Uh, well, and I want to say, he, if we read this again, heaven forbid, uh, all through, we'd see that the way he's setting up the ecstasis and, and, and the whole thing in terms of Dasein taking a stand on its being and how it's throwing and how it's coping in the present. And he's describing the world in terms of having for the sake of witches and significance and a throwingness. He will be setting it up so that these two structures are not just parallel, but they are like two sides of something. I, I think he's done it. I, I mean, I'm, what I'm thinking is maybe for the first time I, I've un, I'm beginning to understand why he thinks he can just suddenly tell us in italics that every ecstatic unity has something like a horizon and think that that tells us the Dasein is its world existingly. Uh, it's cause, and, and I think that's what the sort of thing he's been trying to achieve. Okay, now I told somebody over here somewhere, bef- yeah, And that's that, but then I mean, what what Eugene is always worrying about is, if, but when the chips are down, even with my disclosedness talk, are you saying that you were your disclosedness, or are you saying you're a disclosedness? Are you saying you're the disclosedness? That's where the the old subject object thing is around, and he's trying to define significance and worldhood in su- and uh, in in such a way that they are. Intim- so intimately related to Dasein and existing and taking a stand on your being as a way of disclosing that you can understand how we can all be different and yet be all open. We are all, we are all somehow different openings on one world. That's what he has to show. And I, I think he thinks that he's shown it when he's shown that the, dis- the ecstatical structure of opening and the horiz- horizontal structure of significance are interdefined in such a way, somehow. Uh, yeah, you want to say something about that? The, the view that we want to get to is it's not even that we're two sides of the same thing, right? It's like there's a Dasein side and a, a world side, or an ex- ex- ecstatic side and a horizon side, even that's the subject of this, right? Right. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's not right. I take that back. Yeah, that's part of the idea of the Dasein Hidden World, right? It's, it's, a, it's not even the one thing, it's two sides, it's somehow just one thing. Right. So, so Dasein is being in the world with hyphens, and now having gone through all of this, we have an understanding of what it is to be being in the world, hopefully. And I think that's what he thinks he's doing. Before I call on somebody else, there's a place where he relates it to being in the world, right around here. Is it maybe right exactly here? Let's see. Uh, 
I don't see it right off. So let let whoever's got another hand up. Four seventeen. You see it? Okay. Or maybe uh, having its ground. Uh, the world is transcendent. Is it being in the world? Right oh, right before that. Oh, good. That's what one would hope to find. Let's read that. The world is already presupposed in one's being alongside the ready to hand, concernedly and practically, in one's thematizing and so forth and so forth. That is to say, all these possible ways of being in the world have... All these are... Oh, sorry. Are all these are possible ways of being in the world, having its ground in the horizontal unity of ecstatical temporality, the world is transcendent. Uh, good, yes. Not transcendental, not, but transcendent, because and uh, which is too Kantian, not transcendent in the sense of Husserlian getting outside your mind, but there's the world, he says, is more outside than anything, and that's... When, when you understand that, you understand the, how you could be both have it be it's for, it be have it be you are your world existingly because there's they're so interdefined that they're not even like two faces so, that we're getting there. Hey, I thought that you would get there eventually, and I and I would learn a lot. Yeah. No, no, tell us. Oh, no, we're we're I'm ready. We can we can take it. Okay. Wait, I say that again. I'm having trouble. I mean, I think it's probably important, and so I want to understand it. But I don't yet. Do you understand how he's what he's saying differs from what I'm saying? I'm not, I don't what understand. I, what I'm trying to bring together, and what I think temporality has to bring together, is the way entities show up. Right? Well, right? well, I mean, ex- well, what, what the, I can't understand you sort of from the start because he seems to be the ecstasies are definitely the structure of temporality for of Dasein and he says and every at every ecstasis has a horizon that seems to be uh, I don't know what it is but well, how do you understand it I mean you I I understand it as I said it sounds to me like every time I've got a defining de- stand on my own being I've also plugged into some shared stuff uh, and I don't see him talking about world doing that job. The, uh, the, the, I'm looking at something. The unity of significance, which is the ontolo- ontological constitution of the world, must be grounded in temporality. Doesn't that seem like the opposite of what you were saying? You seem to be wanting to make world the ultimate thing. That Yes, yeah, that's that, that's certainly what he's asking, among other things. Uh, 
show up with a different mode of being, and it's united with different modes of being about that. Now let's look at the crucial quotes. I don't know. The bottom of 4.15, back to that, the question arises how anything like the world in its unity with Dasein is ontologically possible. Is that supporting what you said? Sounds reasonable, yeah. Yeah, I think so far we're in agreement. I see, I see, but I'm not sure that's what's happening here. Let's, in so far as, I mean, look at something else here, the top of 417. Uh, uh, whereas I'm looking for 416, so I can begin there. Okay. The horizontal unity of the schemata of the ecstasies makes possible the primordial way in which the relationship of the in order to are connected with the for the sake of. This implies that on the basis of the horizontal constitution of the ecstatical unity of temporality. That's already strange, isn't it? It looked like the horizon, more basic, is supposed to be the ecstatical, and the horizon is supposed to be connected with, e with each e ecstasy, where in italics the, the condition for the possibility of the world lies in the f on, on, th on 416. The fact that temporality is an ecstatical unity has something like a horizon. This implies that on the, now the bottom, on the basis of the horizon, no constitution of the ecstatical unity of temporality that belongs to that entity, which is in each case its own there, something like a world that has been disclosed. Boy, that does certainly look like the, the issue is, I mean, I'm not sure which issue, but I, I keep wanting to say it looks like the issue is how to get together something like their, the, the ownness and the, uh, or the, the sharedness. And I keep, I'm having trouble, we're just having trouble understanding each other. But it says it's Dasein is the world existing. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It says its world. No, you're right. It says does. I think you're all on the wrong track. He wouldn't have gone through all this work of bringing in the towards which and the for the sake of which when he talks about the world and the for the sake of which also when he talks about Dasein taking a stand on its being and getting its identity if he didn't have as the final agenda the, the dimensions of Dasein's ecstatical threefold structure with its for the sake of which amidst and thrown and the temporal structure of the world which has in it for the sake of which so lots of for the sake of which is all hooked together into significance and into uh, what I don't know some past thing and I mean, he goes to such trouble to lay those two structures out all over the place and I don't see why we, he wouldn't be cashing in on that at this point 
The, oh, oh, yeah, I want to say something. Yeah. I don't think, I mean, I, I can't, re I mean, it always bothers me. I can't, be I don't think death could be the final for the sake of which. I mean, that, that's what Sartre thought Heidegger was saying. And, and Sartre rightly said, but who in the world would live their life for the sake of their death? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. So the, the, I think the ultimate for the sake of which has got to be your identity, your defining uh, understanding of who you are or embodied understanding of whatever it is of who you are. And uh, the, the fact that the future is a for the sake of which in the world and is a for the sake of which in, for each particular Dasein, that's got to be a clue that these two are not, are not even two aspects, as, as, as Eugene said, but they're, they're the same thing taken up by the only thing that could take them up, namely Dasein as being in the world. And that's what he thinks he's done. Uh, uh, okay, I, I'm, we, we still have, I don't, well, let me, I don't know, before we go on, let me, I don't want to come back to anything that I was going to say here, but I think we've gotten to much more serious business. Um, I will tell you in a minute whether I think there's any reason why I have to go back to it. I said that. Go ahead, say something, yeah? I like that. I, I, my mistake to say aspects. They are the same thing. The for the sake of which, of being a professor. That's, it's, but it's, something that is both serving two jobs, namely giving me an identity and giving me lots of equipment to play around with in order to have that identity. Why can't we say that? Those aren't two aspects because there's much more tightly. I couldn't be a professor without this equipment to play around with and it wouldn't be equipment to be a professor if I didn't have it as my identity. Is that, is that getting it? I mean, that's just, I think that's the clue that you gave me somewhere along the line, yeah. 417, okay. Okay. I don't. I want to have to see where you are before I can understand what you're saying. The bottom of 417. Hmm? Rather we must ask. Is that in the bottom of 417? Oh yeah, the very, very, very bottom. I got it. Okay. Rather we must ask what makes it ontologically possible for entities to be encountered within the world and objectified as so encountered. This can be answered by recourse to the transcendence of the world, a transcendence which as an ex ecstatic horizontal foundation. Well, that seems awfully important, all right, but let's, let me look at the next paragraph. Everybody read the first paragraph on the top of 418. There's, that's the place where I was looking for being in the world, where being in the world is traced back to the ecstatic or horizontal unity of temporality, the existential ontological possibility of the space, basic state of Dasein is intelligible. That looks like the bottom line, that you've got to understand how being in the world with hyphens can be Dasein and can be the world, all, all in so much the same thing and yet so different is... is what he's doing there. Uh, I wanted to go back, though, just a little before where Stephen started reading, because there's lots of talk about its world, and, the, and that's always a clue that something important is happening. The three lines down. What is rather the case is that factical Dasein understands itself and its world, that so seems like a perspective, ecstatically in the unity of the there, 
see, what is rather the case is that practical desire, understanding itself and its world ecstatically in the unity of the there, comes back from these horizons to the entities encountered within them. That's what sort of what you're talking about, maybe. The entities get in there. Coming back to these entities, understandingly, is an existential meaning of letting them be encountered by making the present. That is why we call them entities within the world. So we've, we've gone from its world to the world in sort of the way I would like to do it, if I, but it doesn't happen here. The, its world being the world of a professor and the world being the, the world of a professor. They're, they're the same, and yet they're different. That is why we call these entities within the world. The world is, as it were, already further outside than any object can ever be. That doesn't seem to help. The problem of transcendence cannot be brought around to the question of how a subject, well, that's sure. But may, we want to know what makes it ontologically possible for entities to be encountered within the world. Well, that doesn't help any. Uh, does it? I, I don't think so. Uh, what's the conclusion you wanted to draw, Stephen? I got... Yes, it does seem to be in a kind of Tyler ballpark where the, we're talking about the entities in the world. We might as well be talking about the way of being of entities in the world. Um, all I can say about that is that that seems to be a sort of spin-off from the more basic problem, which is the problem of how to understand being in the world and, and how to do it in terms of the ecstasies, which, remember, are the temporal structure of Dasein, and the fact that, the amazing, crucial fact that, they all, every ecstasis has something like a horizon. That, and that, that horizontal schema, and it's, and then he, let's go on, the schema, I'm back on 416, the schema in which Dasein comes towards itself futurally, whether authentically or inauthentically, is for the sake of itself. The scheme in which Dasein is disclosed to itself in a state of uh, mind in, in Befindlichkeit as thrown is to be taken as that in the faces of which it's been thrown and to which it has been abandoned. This char- that's the characteristic of the what has been. In existing for the sake of itself, in abandonment to itself as something that has been thrown, Dasein as being, along, as being amidst is at the same time making present the horizon of structure of presence is defined in order to. He's, there he's just bringing together, it looks to me like, the, these combinations where the temporal future characterizes both Dasein and the world together, and the temporal present the same, and the temporal past the same. And does I get any better? The unity of the horizon schema of future past future president having been is grounded in the ecstatical unity of temporality. Notice the priority of the Dasein way of talking about it. The stand on its own being seems to be what's finally the bottom line. The horizontal temporality as a whole determines the upon which factical entities are essentially disclosed. Hmm. I'm just trying to see if whether this is now pro Tyler, pro Blattner, pro Dreyfus. I can't remember. All these positions are sort of merging in my head. Does that what I just read support what I've been saying or not? Uh, let's try. I mean, here's more of the same talk. I just keep, I've marked it all over the, the, on 417 that just as the present arises in the unity of the temporalizing of temporality out of the future and having been the horizon of presence temporal, now we're on the horizon side, that was the ecstasis side, the horizon of the present temporalizes itself equa primordial with those of future and having been. In so far as Dasein temporalizes itself, a world is too. And temporalizing itself with regard to its being as temporality, Dasein is essentially in a world by reason of the ecstatico horizontal constitution of its temporality. I, I keep wanting to say the real issue seems to be how Dasein can be being in the world. And the issue seems to be to state these three, this threefold structure, both in a world way and in a, in, a, in a take a stand on your own being way. And I'm not sure that's a big deal difference. The,
that isn't something that plays a big role in here. It doesn't even get mentioned, does it? Yes, it's right. It's got to be along, uh, amidst, let's say. Dasein has got to be amidst entities. That's the present structure. And that stri- present structure is, again, both sides. Dasein can't be amidst entities ecstatically if there aren't entities out there to be amidst horizontally. It seems to be the same story again. I would have thought the alongsideness has both in it. That is, the, both, it, if you can't be alongside it, if it isn't there, and if you aren't there. See, yeah, I, mean, I see what you're doing, and, and the funny thing is, I like it, but I don't think it's the thing to be doing here to bring in sort of nature and so forth. I mean, here he's talking about equipment, uh, that is, stuff which has its own for the sake of which, which electrons don't have, and he and he's putting it that way on purpose so that the two get together. He has, I mean, I think he does have the. I think it's on four fourteen. That he he got the, the how the theoretical how entities can show up for pure discovery that's in the vicinity, but having done that on four fourteen he goes on to the temporal problem of the transcendence of world, and that seems to me to leave <laughs> leave behind the question about electrons. I don't believe it. I don't believe it at all. I think the question of transcendence is all over the place. In fact, I thought we just, this chapter began with talking about transcendence. Now I don't know. That might be true. I, I find what you're saying perfectly relevant to what's going on on page 414, where he's talking about science and, and, and the unready to hand and the whole... Con- how does the name of this chapter? Let's see what, whether it's got trends. The temporal meaning of the circumspective concern modified in theoretical discovery. Seems to me that's just one issue, and then there's this issue of the problem of the transcendence of the world, but we've got to stop. I saw one hand that I won't keep people from talking, but it's time by my lights that we've had enough, and I think, I think it's been very helpful. I'm not sure how I'll feel about it tomorrow, but thanks for trying, and, we, and the next time, we, let me just tell you what's happening. See, we're one whole thing behind because I fell into this dark hole, which I now feel I've sort of been pulled out of. We haven't gotten to the ordinary conception of time, which was supposed to be today, so we're going to do the ordinary conception of time next time. You'll be happy to hear, if you're all brave, put, put up with it. It won't be abstract like this. It's very sort of down-to-earth description of everyday life. Okay. We should start. I'm going to make a brief speech to the podcast people who are listening. and who, or if, if any of you are still here to, who ha- haven't given up on us, this time we're backed up with two backups, but uh, and I'm sure we're going to get something. Every time uh, up to now, up, uh, something absolutely unpredictable has gone wrong, and either the backup person wasn't here or the uh, MP3 player just stopped mysteriously in the, after a few minutes of recording, and, but I'm, I'm convinced this time you, if you'll stick with it, you'll be able to hear it. Now, we're going to go back to the issues we had last time. And the overview of the issue for today is still whether Heidegger is a temporal idealist. Or still, I guess we didn't have that yet. And did we have it at the end last time? I don't remember. We did. I, okay. Uh, does temporality depend 
on Dasein, and then does nature time depend on Dasein? Yes, we got up to nature time last time, so that if there were no Dasein, there'd be no nature time. Can Heidegger derive the characteristics of everyday temporality from the fact that Dasein has a non-temporal structure, non-successive structure, is a kind of being that has to take a stand on itself and it has to do it by activity, by coping with things for the sake of some ultimate role that it has. So we, we, we know that date, we talked a lot about how dateability, significance, publicness, and spannedness all derive from that, that the fact that not, not only do we have to take a stand on ourselves in our activities, but these activities have to be coordinated so that they form a sequence in which you get one thing done before the other in the right order, and that they have uh, meaning, that they are shared so that they're all in this public same time so that the, they can be coordinated and be, for instance, simultaneous with each other, and they are span. We, that, that was all what we talked about last time. And that's all required to, to coordinate our tasks. Uh, and now the question is, Blattner then says that um, Heidegger has to derive this se the sequential order of uh, our practices from the kind of being we are, namely the being, from, to put it shortly after this, from um, originary temporality. That's, that's short for being the kind of being that has to take a stand on its being and can only take a stand on its being by act activities toward a uh, role of what of. So the question is, can uh, Heidegger actually show that you can get the, our world coordinated activity structure somehow, which is certainly a sequential structure, from this non sequential structure, which is uh, Dasein uh, as, the, as temporality. And then comes the issue with. Blattner, which is always in the background because he's clearly the best, but he might be. It isn't clearly wrong, but this, yeah, I'm going to try to say at the end. I don't. I don't think even Heidegger knows for sure what he wants to say about this <coughs> issue. But uh, at least we got to decide whether Blattner's making a convincing case or not. That one, Heidegger wants to be a temporal idealist and claim that not only the the intelligibility, but really the structure of all forms of temporality depend on originary temporality. Uh, and can he, can, he get, can he do that? And uh, Blattner argues that Heidegger can't do it. And after much discussion with, in, with, with people over this matter, the, what, what Heidegger can't do, according to Blattner, which he has to do if he's going to carry out his idealism, is show that the, fa the, the way our practice has to be ordered sequentially so that I have to type my lecture before I can come here and read my lecture and then I, only then can I go home and relax and so forth, that, 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 that the, this sequential structure is re itself follows from the kind of being we are. It can't be that, as I think it is, and I'll come back to this, I mean, the alternative would be, well, there's some aspect of, the, of all this world meaningful activity, which certainly d depends on Dasein, and wouldn't be there if there weren't any Dasein. There might be something about nature and nature time that, n that doesn't depend on Dasein, and that accounts for the fact that Dasein has to lay out its practices in this sequential order in order to take a stand on itself. That, that 
both sides agree in what I'm saying that uh, when do they yes both sides agree that you can't make an argument uh, from the originary temporality to the fact that our practices have to be sequentially organized and Blattner concludes from the fact that you can't make that Heidegger can't make that argument work that Heidegger's idealism fails, that being in time fails, that early Heidegger fails, it's a big disaster. All follows from that according to his book. Uh, then the other possibility, my side, is yeah, it's true you can't get the, the sequential ordering of our everyday practices out of the notion that we're of being taking a stand on our being by way of those practices. Then, may, then I think that shows Heidegger is a realist, that there's a constraint on how we order our practices that comes from something like time, some kind of nature time, some kind of sequencing that is not dependent on us, but which is together with the way, the, the way we have to lay out world time, I mean, sorry, together with the way we take a stand on itself, put together with this constraint, from nature would give us the, say, spannedness of world time, which is the hardest for uh, Heidegger to get, according to Blattner. That is, the, again, the sequence of, na of series of nows. Um, so, so now that's what I want to argue about, and that's where Aristotle comes in, which was today's assignment. So if you did what the uh, syllabus said, you read the whole sh section on Aristotle's view of time in uh, basic problems. Is that what you did do? I mean, I just want to make sure that we're cor correlated. No? Uh-oh. Just a, a quick announcement. We didn't actually order the book. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Please. Yes. A time out for this important announcement from Tyler. I, I just didn't order the book. To begin with, big mistake on my part. So, so the pages that you, but some, you must, if you've been doing the assignment, have bought the book. And I suppose in the back of my mind, I thought if ever there was a book that anybody interested in Heidegger had better buy, it's this. It's the most clear and worked out uh, story of, uh, from being in time, but carried further and deeper and in more detail and more clear than the book, than being in time, and more historical than being in time. How many have basic problems? Oh, well, good. I mean, I, get, I think that's good. I don't feel at all apologetic. Only the, I guess I should apologize for the fact that you might have had trouble getting it. How many had trouble finding it? Well, that's interesting. So where was it? Tyler, do you understand this? I mean, here are the whole there are 40 people or whatever, these 30 or something, who had no trouble finding it, though we didn't order it. How do you explain I that? I last semester. I think it was you ordered it last semester for Division One. Oh, really? I think so. I, th I think I got it. I remember, I think I was in the book. I would have certainly put it on a, on a, on a list of re uh, recommended. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but now it's really, in effect, required right. because the assignments are in it. Well, it all ends happily, Tyler, uh, except you did a lot of work, it looks like, that I really appreciate, even though it turns out that... Well, yeah, if people want, the, if, if anybody hasn't got it or knows anybody who wants 50 pages, 50 crucial pages on Aristotle from, being, from basic problems, they're in Tyler's mailbox. Okay. Now, the role of Aristotle in this is, well, have I said anything controversial yet? Because I don't want to go into Aristotle if I've already said something that you don't understand or disagree with. I think I'm just summarizing where we were. Okay, Aristotle on temporality may well be the clue to what to think about this idealism issue. I would say it was surely the clue, except that I'm not even sure that Heidegger is sure that it is. But it's certainly an important element. And to, under, to explain this, I have to give credit to where credit is due. I owe a lot to uh, Derek Baker whose uh, honors thesis uh, about three years ago now was on, the, was on, tried to show that you could at least make a case for Heidegger being a, a temporal realist of some sort, which we'll explain, 
based on what he says about Aristotle in these 20 or 25 pages or whatever that we read for this week. So, uh, so, so now I'm going to talk about the Aristotle part. Aristotle sees, according to Heidegger, that whatever time is, access to it depends on us. That we experience time not just as a series of nows, before and after, but as now is ordered as earlier and later. And earlier and later makes reference to our experience of now and our activity. So now I'm going to now take your book. I, I just there are certain passages which it seems to me anyway we have to just read carefully and think about. The first is the, and this distinction is the basic distinction that he's got in this Aristotle chapter about which everything turns is the distinction between before and after and earlier and later. If you don't sort of hold on to that and get that and see that Aristotle's got it and that Heidegger thinks it's a good thing that Aristotle's got it, you can't understand, I think, what's going on. So, and what's the difference? Well, earlier and later is always res with respect to some now. It's earlier than what's happening right now, and other things are late, will come along later. Something earlier has already happened, something is happening now, and something will happen later. And the before and after, we're going to read the passages about that, are, is a much more uh, general and formal notion, and it doesn't, and it gets defined without bringing in now, or it's intelligible without bringing in and now and earlier and later. That's what these quotes I'm now going to be reading you, I think, are saying. Let's see if this is broken down yet, or whether we're still actually recording. No, I think we are. Okay, 242, the middle of the page. The comparison which, what is that aliosis? I forget. Somebody tell me. Shows that this, oh, read from something. Find the Greek, so when I was reading it, I understood it because I was reading it in context, but I don't know where the context is. Nobody know Greek? We don't have to find it in here. It's a Greek word. A few lines above? Uh, I don't see it yet. Tell me where. I still don't see it. I mean, about ten lines down. Another form of motion, that one? Yes, for example, ah, aiosis, whatever that is now, would become becoming different in the sense, now we find out, it's becoming different in the sense that one quality changes to another, like something that was red can gradually turn green. Uh, one particular color to another, and here too there's an advance away from something towards something. That turns out to be the formal, most general way of thinking about it, and uh, before and after turn out to be a way of thinking about, I mean, comes under that notion. I mean, the, obviously the before is, uh, it's away from the before and toward the after. But, in, but we, you notice there's nothing about earlier and later in there. Um, we shall call this structure of motion its dimension taking the concept of dimension in, in a completely formal sense. See, this is, he wants the most general notion, in which spatial character is not essential. That is, you know, change is more general than change of place. And he says the change of color is equally comes under this notion. Uh, dimension expresses a general notion of stretch. I haven't looked at the German, but I take it that this stretch is the spannedness of the, of the being in time version of this. Uh, extension in the sense of spatial dimension represents a particular modification of stress, uh, of stretch. Hmm, no, I'm wrong about the spannedness. I guess we'd have to look. No, nobody's got the basic problems in German in front of them, I imagine. Uh, if it, it, it shouldn't be spannedness, I guess, because spannedness is a temporal notion, the way Heidegger's using it in being in time. It's one of the temporal features of the the world, and here it's so general that it isn't temporal 
at all. It's much broader. It's, well, temporal, I guess it could be. No, maybe that's the point. The general notion of stretch. Let's try this on away from something towards something. That's stretch. Spannedness. Now, is away from something towards something spannedness, or is spannedness something that has space built into it already? I don't know. Anybody know? I don't, I'm not saying a big deal depends on it. It would just be nice to have our vocabulary straight. Uh, der Strecktheit is certainly the, the, the spannedness, but since we don't know what... So anyway, there's some kind of stretch, and that is from some, something toward something. That's all he needs. So extension in the sense of spatial dimension then represents a particular modification of stretch. Now, that may be spannedness that is this particular modification. In the case of the determination of, and then there's some more Greek, we should rid ourselves completely of the spatial idea, something that Aristotle did too. A completely formal sense of stretching out is intended from something to, to, to something. So Aristotle's got this very general notion uh, in his view of time. The, now next go to 246. There's a whole lot in here that's interesting. But it, it's all it's in about four pages that the crucial moves get made. So, uh, and this is all when he starts talking about the proteron hysteron and whether the proteron hysteron in Greek is about the earlier and the later or the uh, before and after. And Aristotle is pretty it has a distinction, and Heidegger thinks he doesn't stick to it very well, but it's a very important distinction. So uh, let's start with the first full paragraph at the middle of 246. In one place, Aristotle says about proteron, hysteron, a bunch of Greek things, <laughs> it is, first of all, in place, in change, in sequence of places. He's thinking of before and after here, as still wholly without any time determination. See, Heidegger's getting very careful to try to separate early and earlier and later from before and after. Everything hinges on getting that across. The, I'm going on. The Aristotelian definition of time can also be formulated at first in this way. Time is what is counted in connection with motion, which is experienced with respect to before and after. But what is thus counted is later unveiled as a series of nows. The now themselves, however, can be expressed and understood only in the horizon of earlier and later. So there's all the, there are these two horizons. By the way, I don't know if this is... It always seems hard for me to grasp when it says something like that, understood only in the horizon of. I, I think you could just as well substitute in terms of earlier and later. Uh, is that right? Is that right? I don't know that in saying in the horizon of... Is this, it's not the fancy horizon that goes with the uh, ecstasies. It's, it's much more just normal use, if there were a normal use of this sort of notion of horizon. In the context of, on the basis of, the best I could do was in terms of, but whatever goes in there. Uh, in, uh, so the before and after... So with respect, the with respect to before and after and in the horizon of the earlier and later do not coincide. The second is an interpretation of the first. Well, that's beginning to look like before and after is more basic and you could have a before and after without an earlier and later or you can have a within an interpretation of the before and after you can bring in an earlier and later but it's complicated because the nows seem to be sort of... I don't really understand all this. That's what you're all supposed to help do. The nows seem to be already somehow implicit in the before and after. What this sentence boggles my mind. But what is thus counted is later unveiled as the nows. So here you are counting uh, the change from before and after and you're doing it by, I guess I sort of understand it. Now it's red, or now it's greener, now it's even more green, now it's completely green, as it's changing from red to green. And the way you count it is by 
uh, so um, selecting stopping points and, and saying now it's this and then now it's that and now it's that. And how can it be that the now is unveiled as if the now was there all along, but the earlier and later is an interpretation of the before and after? Uh, and the earlier and later is the now part. That now it's this, and then, well, is it? Let's see. Um, have to so before and after, you're counting before and after. You can't do it without using nows, I think. And nows have already got, and yeah, and it's all puzzling. Have, certainly the nows have already got an earlier and later character, haven't they? They're, they're earlier than this now and later than now somewhere some things are earlier and other later is so what's more basic than what you see what it, you see what's bothering me I don't know uh, is there a before and after I would have I just except for this sentence that the it's unveiled what but what is thus counted as before and after is later unveiled as the nows that's what bothers me why isn't it, say, interpreted as the nows? I mean, it seems to me everything is packed into that unveil that says, aha, the nows were there all along. And what's been the argument that, the, that in order to count the before and after, I, I don't impose a bunch of nows. I actually expose a bunch of nows that have been veiled up to then. Come on, somebody's supposed to help me with this. That's why you're here. This is a seminar, not a course, uh, in my mind, not in not in the registrar's mind. Uh, well, I'm going on. I, it may not make any difference. Uh, somebody's got to uh, try. Okay. Oh, well, that would be good. I mean, I would be happy to unveil the for and after, but it looks like he's saying he was unveiling the nows, doesn't he? We've got to go back and look. I mean, if he didn't, that would be tr then I wouldn't have any problem. But it's, it, you, then I want to say the before and after doesn't have any nows. It doesn't make any reference to somebody who's in the middle of this uh, uh, counting them. And uh, you, can, you can put in the nows and you can count them that way. You can count the before and after with nows. But if you once say they were veiled, that is covered up, well, the, you seem to me to beg the question. You said that the, there's this whole Dasein relative now ref, uh, uh, element that's been there all along. That's just the question. Well, you see, it, yeah, Tyler, do you understand my problem? That's what it seems to be saying, and that doesn't. We don't want it to say that, do we? Ah, I see. That's a good step, maybe. Every before, and I thought, yeah, yeah. Before, uh, there must be a present before which such and such, and after which such and such, and that present is what we're going to name as the nows. But it's not nows yet, so to speak, but, but it's what sets up the possibility of the now. And so saying it's the veil nows, that's not quite right, but it's close enough, the way you fix it. There is in this, just in counting the before and after, the condition for saying now is already involved, something like that, I guess, yeah. It, Yeah, does that make a difference? So when you 
Because, because putting it in terms of our experience, you mean then the now comes in from us, whereas the before and after doesn't have the nows in it. Uh, that might be a good idea too. I mean, maybe we could put you and Tyler together. I mean, so we're not counting the, we're in counting before and after. There's already a, a, a present in which something is before and something after. And we experience that as, as now. Is, is that what you think? Uh, Okay, motion, yeah, which is experienced with respect to before and after. And so, so this experienced in there, I was going to quote that quote next. Yes, that makes a big deal. Uh, so I mean, all this, I mean, saying the nows are unveiled is sort of unfortunate, but, when, but if you're getting it, if you're saying in the experience the nows are unveiled, the, the, that, and not that not the through your experience the nows are unveiled in this stuff that would happen whether you were experiencing it or not, but that when you are counting, in your experience of counting, then the nows are already implicit. They're, they're, they're veiled. That's, that's how you want to read it, if I understand you right. I don't know, but let's go on. I mean, there are going to be sort of holistic puzzles all along the way, that any one of which we can only try to deal with if we look at all the others. So let's, let me look at the others. Where are we? Um, the, the nows themselves, however, can be expressed and understood only in the horizon of earlier and later. So when you've got this experience of counting, you can only express and understand what you're doing by bringing in earlier and later, it says. The with respect to before and after in the horizon of the earlier and later do not coincide. The second is an interpretation of the first. The in your experience, i now going to add. Um, okay, that's... I'm just reading the quotes that I think we have to take account of. That might be it. No, one more. And it may be the one you just read. No, I don't think so. But anyway, the end of the previous paragraph, 1, 246. As counted, now we got to the nows. The nows themselves count. I, that's puzzling, too. I, I, I don't think that's some kind of pun, that as counted, the now, nows themselves matter. That, that isn't what it's about, I'm sure. As counted, the nows themselves count. When I try to understand that, I think about the clock and that there is, now the hands are here, now the hands are there, uh, and it's the, and so we add up the nows. Is, if anybody has a better view, they, the nows count the places. So now it's five, now the hand is at five, after now it's at six after now it's at seven after so the nows are counted by us now it's here now it's there and the nows do the counting they count the places now it's at five now it's at six Is that, I think that's what he's saying they count the places so far as these are traversed as the places of the motion time as erythmos where what did we did you find out what that meant I think time, yeah, that must be the numbers that's counted, right. Time as number is the counted that counts. Did I get it right about the counted that counts? Has anybody understood what I said or think they could say something clearer? Uh, okay, well, oh, if you can, always come and jump in and do. Okay, the, uh, the counted that counts. Aristotle's interpretation of time matches the phenomenon extremely well. I think that's I put that quote in here for that. He's not criticizing Aristotle. He's saying Aristotle has got this in, in making this distinction. Aristotle is doing a very good job of explaining both aspects of the way we uh, understand time. If he's criticizing Aristotle at all, it's because he thinks Aristotle hasn't sorted them out too well yet. But I don't think he's criticizing Aristotle at all. Uh, so, at least not yet, maybe in, in, a, in a minute. So, on 247, at the top, 
primarily proto-round hysteron means for Aristotle before and after in a sequence of places. It has a non-temporal sense. This is again, notice, not earlier and later. The, but the experience of before and after intrinsically presupposes in a certain way the experience of time, the earlier and later. Well, we've already gone through that under that now story. I think that's the same mysterious thing, that there's something implicit, presupposed, if you think you're just dealing with a sequence, if insofar as you're counting the sequence, you already uh, have, you already have to experience time as earlier and later. I'm taking over the experience part. Yeah, good. So which, Tell me things. Which does he well, I think it's clear that I, but I, I mean, I hope it becomes clearer. So, but, but, I, I'm, I'm convinced that he thinks that before and after is more basic. Let me not have any cards up my sleeve. That a lot, everything's going to depend on this for realism, idealism issue, because no doubt there's no earlier and later except when we're around. That I'm assuming that. Because the, we're putting ourselves at some point in the story, and like in space, they're, they're, like the here in space depends on us, the now in time depends on us. So, and but they, they don't have to uh, bring. We don't bring ourselves in so directly, and I'm maybe not at all, to make sense of the before and after. That way, so that so I want the before and after to be the realist one, and say some kind of dimensional formalish before and after would be there whether we were around or not, but it's only when we're there counting that there's earlier or later. So I want before and after to be basic, and I'm ready now to have to amend that to say yeah, but the experience of before and after already has in it. A, a sense of an earlier and later. That's what these two mysterious sentences say. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think an example of that might be like a miles on the highway, like miles through the east and east through the east, four, two, eight, five, where there's a non temporal sequence and you can count that in foot time and set market? Uh, and if there's a before and after the sequence, which is independent of time, the first experience of that sequence, you have to experience the same experience. Good. Yes, that's exactly what I think it is. Any, any such sequence at this formal level. Uh, is going to be li can be laid out in terms of before and after. Finally, just a, a mathematical sequence: bef two is before three, and uh, after one. There is some kind of before and after, and if you're going to be a realist, you're going to have to think that there's some kind of before and after in nature that would be there whether we were there or not. And that better not be. I, that's surely not going to be that things are earlier and later before we're around. Yeah. It works because there's a towards and from. I see. Oh ho! I was wondering too when Eugene said that. We we get, there is a direction. You're putting down the signs and, and you're putting down the signs. You can't just put them down at random, and you can't switch in the middle. You got to, you're showing the way from I don't know Terre Haute to Haute, Indianapolis, where I come from. You wouldn't. It wouldn't work, or it would still. You it wouldn't. I see. Wait, you're loud so we can put uh, it. The sequence isn't the, 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 like the green sign. That's, those are just the signs that mark the sequence. The sequence is the actual directions of, of those. I mean, it makes sense that you have to presuppose some direction of the set, but I don't, but I don't yeah. know how we get a sequence of places in the before and after. If you don't have something like that. Like how do you start? What, if you have two places, you have to get a sequence of time and the after the sequence of time. Yeah, I don't see how we can invent something that's pure direction. We need to admit directionality to nature as well. Oh, uh, if we bring it over to nature, I see that might be a problem, how the road is going from Terre Haute to Indianapolis and not from Indianapolis to Terre Haute, right? Yeah. Unless, unless you bring in this complicated business about whether time is reversible or not, and I think we probably should be solving this phenomenologically, not worrying about that question. You want to say something? Or did I preempt what you wanted to say? Uh, yeah. Time of time for you 
Ah, oh, ho, oh, you can't <laughs> reconcile it as an understatement. That's supposed to be what makes it possible, what gets him to the time free movements of nature is that they would be before and after movements, but not earlier and later. Uh, that, that would be the idea. Uh, yeah, that's, and of course, but there's sort of verbal thing. It, he does say both the before and after and the earlier and later are something like aspects of time. And, and Aristotle sees that. Or, and uh, I think later he's going to, when he says time-free movements of nature, he means movements of nature that you would have whether Dasein was around or not. That's, and so I'm trying to make sense. We're trying to make sense of what it would be like to have something like that, which, we, which had some kind of order, but did not the kind of order that requires us to be put in the order. I, I think it's very important to keep thinking about space. I mean, the way the here in, in space and the now in time have this characteristic of absolutely depending on us. There's no here out uh, in space, and it's not clear what to do with now in time, but it's certainly not our kind of now, whatever it is. And, th and then, of course, but you can have about space this abstract three-dimensional Cartesian story in which points are uh, n uh, have a certain spatial distance from each other but they can't be, this is all back to division one, they can't be near or far from each other if that's, if you're going to make that relative to how e available to us near and far and uh, so there's a lot of stuff in space, Cartesian for non, for exist, a lot of stuff for spatiality which is existential space, namely it's got a here, it's got places in it, it's got distances in it of a non-measured, of, of a kind of relative to our effort sort, and so with temporality you've got now, and you've got some, hopefully, that we can make sense of, abstract form of sequential order, and you've got that whether we're around or not, just like Cartesian three-dimensional space, it's easier to imagine it's around whether we're around or not, and th but it has no air in it. Uh, okay, you want to say something about this? You, you look like you did. No? Yeah, I don't know. I guess you were just your hand. Well, I mean, I've got ideas put around, but I'm not sure how, how, how much I'm on the right track. I was going to ask, I mean, because obviously there's some jump from before, after, to earlier, or later, when we get put in the picture somehow. Um, so I mean, you can experience it differently. Um, and I mean, I think it would be really important for the clar clarifying this would be kind of what, on the basis of what that jump is made, kind of. Okay, yes, I think it, but the trouble is that's very murky, because in, when I try to think about it, I think it's about the now. I think earlier than now and later than now is the way earlier and later work, and we bring in the now, and the before and after as this, what is it, from, from toward, I forget that exact formulation, where is it, the, you know what I mean, I read it earlier. Oh yeah, that's right. okay. The from something to something uh, that doesn't seem to have to have a now in it, uh, and that's how, that. The trouble is, what haunts me constantly is to try to figure out what in the world the now is when it's not the kind of pragmatic now, which is the earlier and later, where you can, where it depends on uh, how you know you you get to decide how long the now is and what counts as earlier than this now and later than this now. It, and whereas in somehow there's not going to be this now related to our projects. Now in, you remember this, I mean there's so many, remember that now in world time is uh, all he says relative to our projects. Again, that always comes as a surprise, but it's now we're in this class and now we're in the semester and now we're in the spring and so forth. and and, and now I'm trying to explain this sentence. It's all relative to what we're up to. And whatever the now is in, in nature, it isn't. Well, then what is it, a nanosecond? And how, or, uh, 
a nano nanosecond. I mean, you just can't picture what a now is when it's not in the in some span of activity, and that's and that uh, that that's just related to how, how much sense you can make of a before and after uh, without. I can't make sense of a before and after without a now in nature, and I can't make which would, but I think you have to, and I can't make any sense of what. See, see let, let me put the problem. So it looks like, in science anyway, which is supposedly thinking about nature, you've got to bring in some kind of now, which isn't a pragmatic kind of now. That's you know relative to our projects. But there must be some kind of now, because now the universe is, I don't know, 10 billion years old. And it looks like it started back at the first now. And that, what that is, I have no idea. Right. I like your intuition here, actually. Um, I think it's worth looking into. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, I like the space analogy, too. You know, if we're not in space, it doesn't make space, like, meaningless or... or it mean, yeah, it doesn't make... It, it's yeah. just, there's no real, there's no reference point. That's right, word. exactly. You, all you can say is, at this point in the universe, there is X. I think with time you could do the same kind of thing. I think you could say, on you know, this at this point in time, this happened or this happened, and it's not like this point in time relative to me. It's not like you know, 1,000 BC relative to me now that this, this okay. happened. But, but this point in time has got the same. Is it a pragmatic kind of point or is it a nanosecond kind of point? And the same thing happens with here, of course. Yeah. How, be, how much is here? Uh, the, the, where the GPS has located me or here in this classroom or here in the university, it has the same... Get, it, here's and now's de normally are defined in terms of our practices. Uh, and the idea of a, of a here that doesn't make any reference to our practices and then a now that doesn't make any reference to our practices is really weird. But I don't have more to say about it. If anybody does, yeah. I'll just kind of frame it in the broader context. Uh, would we have to admit that Heidegger's temporal idealist if we cannot come up with a now that's somehow found in nature? Is that the whole issue? Oh, uh, let's see. That I. Uh, no, I think that's sort of upside down. But I'll have to think a minute. We. We would have to admit that Heidegger was a temporal idealist if d nows depended on us and we couldn't make sense of a nature that didn't have its own intrinsic nows. Then it would follow that there wouldn't be any nature if we weren't around because we have supply the nows and the nature has to have a now in it. But, it, but I want to say the other way is somehow if you could have a view of nature as such a kind of abstract ordering that didn't make any reference to any of our purposes and, then, and didn't have a now in it, that would be an argument for realism if you could make sense of it. That gets us to the time-free movements of nature only where that means that uh, our kind of temporality do doesn't the movements in nature would still have a before and after, but I think, but they wouldn't connect up with our temporality, which is or the earlier and later kind. Yeah, Tyler. Ah, you're, you've said that before, but that's always interesting. That's the sun going by kind of story. Yeah. 
Yes, that's what I think too, and I think that's what Heidegger and, and Aristotle think too. Good, good. That's what I think too. Yes. Right. Ah, 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 I see now what you're saying. I misunderstood you. So there ought to be a kind of present at hand now. That was what it would amount to. Stripped of all of its significance and dateability and everything that, that goes with, with world time and with earlier and later. And, and it may have something to do with clocks, you know, that we can get there by counting uh, the, the movement in such a way as... But I don't see still how we get that. We, there's no now on the clock. <laughs> and th th so we got the same kind of puzzle to say now it's five after, now it's six after. Uh, I don't know. But I think... That's the earlier or later or both kinds? Both of them. Both of them, okay. Aha, uh -huh. I see. I'm not sure whether it's me or, or Heidegger. I may have introduced this into the conversation, that I, I was assuming that there is no now in nature, uh, on, mostly because there's no here in, in nature. But that may just be a, a false analogy. Uh, it certainly is tempting. But, so there's, you, there's just a different kind of now between the world-defined, contextual, pragmatic, uh, counted by us now, you're saying, Tyler, and some kind of something in nature, which is what? A, a different kind of now, a present at hand now is all I call it. So it's talking about pure, pure change in nature. There is change. It's the way it's I like that. I guess I, well, that's, that's, that's what I think. So, so, good, but then I don't know why you need to bring in a now. Yeah, you have access to pure change. Why not keep a now for earlier and later? Uh, I see. Well, I got us into that. I mean, partly because I don't know Ariel or somebody got us into this. That, uh, that well, which. I your lead. Yes, I, I'm, I think you're right. I, I led you into this. Uh, but I was, at, I was just saying how puzzling it is to me what a now in nature would be, and now I, and, and I think what you're saying is we shouldn't be expecting to find a now in nature. Good, well, that's what I want to say all along. Good, okay. And then, uh, if, uh, but, but then I said, but, but we have to be able to say somehow, now it's X billion years since the Big Bang, as if somehow we knew what we were talking about and as if it was the same sort of clock now on a great big clock that we normally use. That's why I said clocks seem to have a lot to do with this. Somehow, once you get to the clock nows and count them, and it looks like they, those are present at hand now, and it looks like maybe the universe can be treated like a big clock. I don't know. Uh, anyway, let's go on. <laughs> this, I, I'm sorry that this is so hard, and maybe it wouldn't be so hard if I understood it, but I, I'm, I can only tell you what I can see here. Um, okay, on 247. I think, did I read this already? For Aristotle, top of the page, for Aristotle, before and after in the sequence of play, uh, it's primarily Proteron Hustron means for Aristotle before and after in a sequence of places. It has a non temporal sense, but the experience of before and after intrinsically presupposes, in a certain way, as I just had read that, the experience of time, the earlier and later. And there the emphasis has got to be on experience. That's the same as the veiled story, only it's not so misleading there. It, it's, it, the presupposes is like the, the veil. It's, if you're going to have an experience of the before and after, then 
you've got to already have an experience of the earlier and later. Isn't that interesting? An experience that in the universe, it looks like, the, it's the other way around. That the, if you're going to have a before and, a, and after, you've got to already have, sorry, I just misspoke. It, in, in, let's go do it again. In, in our experience, it looks like you can't have an experience of the before and after that doesn't presuppose already earlier and later. But in the universe, it looks like you can have, in fact, going on, something which can be described in terms of before and after, but doesn't have any earlier and later. So in experience, that maybe the, the sort of dependence goes one way, and if you're a realist anyway, in the universe, the experience would, the, the, the phenomenon, the phenomenon isn't even right, the, not in the sense of experience. The, the, the facts would be, I don't know how to even describe it, what you are talking about would be independent of earlier and later, and then get interpreted by us, brought into the world, so to speak, as earlier and later. He seems to think both. And it's, not in, it's not a contradiction to think that in the universe, let's just repeat it, there could be a, a, an abstract sequence of states of the universe, and we experience them in terms of now and earlier and later and bring them into the, our world time. And uh, that's, that's a sensible thing to think, or at least I think it is. And you can still say, yeah, but when we experience them, we first uh, most basically have an earlier and later pragmatic uh, experience. And we then, uh, by leaving a lot out and theorizing, uh, get to the, uni the, the, the universe ones. Let's try that. Let me go on. Let me see where we are. Um, I, I want to read one more thing on 247. Um, because it gets us with a now back, unfortunately, but I have to read it. The, the now, I'm going to start at the end of the top paragraph. The now is the limit for what has gone by and what comes after. That's something like Tyler's earlier version. That it's the, it's the, there's always going to be this borderline between them. I don't know. Let's go on. The now which we count are themselves in time. They constitute time. The now is a double visage which Aristotle has that long thing to say about. Time is held together within itself by the now. Time's specific continuity is rooted in the now, but conjoint with respect to the now. Time is divided, articulated in the no longer now, and the earlier not yet now, the later. It is only with respect to the now that we conceive of the then and at the, t and at the time, the later and the earlier. Uh, that's all I was assuming that. We were all assuming that, remember, that, that the, in an earlier and later layout, it's always in, with respect to the now that these are earlier and later. Okay, I have gotten to the end of that page. So, and, and where does Aristotle then get us? And why have we gone through all this? Well, it may be that Aristotle is telling us about access. That's, I would like that. If Aristotle were telling us that there is some kind of uh, before and after which we get access to by way of earlier and later, that would be interesting. And I think maybe Heidegger is saying this at the bottom of 256. Aristotle's definition of time is not in any respect a definition of the ac in the academic sense. It characterizes time by defining how what we call time becomes accessible. It is an access definition, an access characterization. The type of definendum is determined by the manner of the soul, possible access to it. The, the counting perception of motion as motion is at the same time the perception of what is counted as time. Uh, I'm not sure what that's all about. I can see this, that this access definition is very different than something like a condition of possibility. It's, it's the realistic one. I mean, if you think that uh, we're talking about the conditions of the possibility of, temper, of time, 
w in all of this, then of course it's going to all turn out to depend, depend on us and we're in Kant. Uh, but uh, that's not Aristotle. Aristotle is telling us something about the structure of our, of our experience that gives us access to something actually happening in the, in the cosmos, I presume. And let's read the next paragraph. What Aristotle presents as time corresponds to the common pre-scientific understanding of time. By its own phenomenological content, common time points to an original time, temporality. That's Heidegger and Aristotle, everybody can agree on that. This implies, however, that Aristotle's definition of time is only the initial approach to the interpretation of time. Remember I said, I think he agrees with Aristotle, but I think he somehow, he's not going along all, he doesn't think Aristotle's got it all right yet. The characteristic traits of time as commonly understood must become intelligible by way of original time. So that's what Heidegger contributes that Aristotle hasn't got. Aristotle just takes for granted the characteristics of world time. Heidegger says we, he can explain how world time gets I don't know, laid out by Dasein that it, how it depends on originary temporality. And Aristotle hasn't any clue about that. So what I was writing, I don't know where my notes say this, but what I was writing about this was, it looks like, what, what, what I would want to say it looks like, is that Heidegger's got it right about world time, which Aristotle doesn't understand, and that uh, Aristotle's got it right about nature time, which, uh, Heidegger may or may not understand. I don't know. Oh, but there was something behind that that I was trying to get at. Just a second. Aristotle's Aristotle's got it right about world time, uh, sorry, nature time, because he's got it. He can distinguish the before and after from the earlier and later. But all he's got about the earlier and later is world time. Period. Oh, now I remember what I was going to say. And. Heidegger claims he's got a story about how you can derive or make intelligible world time from Dasein's existential temporality. And now we're back to, and Blattner says, well, Heidegger wants to do that, and he can't even do that. I mean, he, he, he can't really get from our, temp, our existential temporality to the structure of world time, uh, he, ha can't, he can't explain how our that and how <laughs> he can't explain that our that that uh, no look how many, how many, he he can't explain how sequentiality is required in our world practices from existential temporality. The only way to understand, I think, I know this is me versus Bill. So Bill says, I'm back to that again, so Heidegger was trying to do it and he couldn't do it and he failed. I grant Bill that Heidegger was trying to do it. This very quote says he's trying to do it. He has, that Aristotle hasn't seen how you're going to make all of this intelligible in terms of originary time. That's what Heidegger was going to do. And I agree with Bill, he fails to do it, but I want to say, of course he fails to do it. There's got to be some natural constraint that it requires that our practices be ordered in a certain way, one thing after another. You can't eat a uh, poached egg before you cook it. That's not something you're going to derive from the, and, and, and all kinds of stuff like that. And the very fact that every, we're constantly having to take account of the order in which the things can happen, that seems to me got something to do with this constraint that's put on us by nature. Nature something. The, the time-free movements of nature, maybe. It's very hard to know what it is, and it's very hard to know how it does it. But I want to say Heidegger, I want to say Bill is right, Heidegger can't do it. That, that means that Heidegger's project as an idealist, insofar as he's got that project, doesn't work. But now I want to add a new thing. 
it's not obvious that, that, that Heidegger's got that project. And the, I'll, I'll, let me go on and do that before. Well, no, I, I, I stop where I am. Go ahead, Jane. I, I was just thinking, going back to Dean and Time, this is kind of on your side with reference to Aristotle against Bill's side. And just going back to section 43, where he says, he's talking about Aristotle, and he says, if what the term idealism says amounts to the understanding that being can never be explained by entities, entities, but is already that which is transcendental for every entity, then idealism affords the only correct possibility for philosophical problematics. If so, Aristotle was no less an idealist than Kant. But if idealism signifies tracing back every entity to a subject or consciousness whose sole distinguishing features are that it remains indefinite in its being and is thus characterized negatively as unthing-like, then this idealism is no less naive in its method than the most grossly militant realism. Uh -huh. So in there, he's, I mean, I think okay. he's talking yeah. about, this is more general, it's not just specifically about time, but it's what he's yeah. like yeah. about Aristotle is, I mean, it comes okay. back to being for, for Heidegger, but that doesn't mean idealism, it doesn't... Okay, well, let me, I mean, I think what you're saying is true, but I think it's, it's misleading in, in the following way. It sounds like idealism is either a trivial claim that our access to stuff depends on us. Isn't that the first one? I mean, that with where, where Aristotle even turns out to be an idealist. Yeah. What's the, what's the, it's a very minimal kind of idealism. If, do you want me to read that first sentence? Yeah. Uh, if what the term idealism says amounts to the understanding that being can never be explained by entities, but is already that which is transcendental for every entity, then idealism affords the only correct possibility for philosophical Okay, well, that's not trivial. I'm glad I asked you to reread it. No, that's just good basic Heidegger. The disclosing of anything depends on us, and that's okay, and it's only idealism if it becomes empirical idealism or psychological idealism where you try to understand it in terms of our mental states. And, uh, and if it's the further claim that it's, it's, it's not just our being, our the way that entities become intelligible that depend on us, but, this, but it's the, what, what he's rejecting here is the stronger claim that the, this, the strong form of Kantian idealism where, where it all traces back to subject and consciousness. He wants to say... Yeah, that that's, that's definitely not. Can now, let me do before... Uh, can, but can we have a simpler test? I've been sort of just asking the question... What, it, what is there about time and nature, natural time and world time that would still be there if we were around? I mean, never not we as mental machinery or psychological states, but if Dasein were around. I mean, we, what, what he's trying to figure out, or what we are trying, I'm trying to figure out, is what sort of temporality would, would go away if there were no Dasein. We know publicness, significance, spannedness, Datability all goes away if there's no Dasein. And, but the question is, is there any other kind of temporality, and that's this universe kind or natural kind or something, which uh, doesn't go away and, in fact, is necessary for you to even have the kind of world time you do. That's the realism version. And all, but I mean, that's just, I'm just trying to say, that's the, what you have to keep in mind. Heidegger's... Heidegger is trying to say, I guess. Well, I mean, no, I'm, I'm so confused because I'm not. There's, there, it looks as if Heidegger wants to say, Heidegger, that he is a temporal idealist in that he thinks that uh, not only does world time, that he thinks the world time is totally explainable in terms of Dasein's self stand activity. And uh, th if that's what Heidegger is trying to do, then I think Bill is right. He fails to do it because, again, there's a kind of constraint on how to organize our practices, which doesn't come from our standard and our own being. Uh, but I'm not sure that Heidegger is trying to... And if, he d and if that's what Heidegger is doing, then Heidegger is trying to be a temporal idealist and failing. That's Bill Latner's thesis. I don't, uh, I guess I, I'm confused about this thing. Is Heidegger trying to do that? To, to derive without residue the way world time works from 
this the temp contemporality. Uh, you think so, I believe. Yeah. yeah. That sounds like it's part of the idea of calling primordial temporality primordial, right? Originary and primordial. Okay, well, how's this? I mean, I, I, that's a fair question. I th well, the way I think about it is, well, it's primordial and originality of all the sort of temporality that we experience in, in the world, namely those four characteristics and what happens when there's some kind of clock and how we measure it by the clock. He's got a story about how he wants a story. Let, let's stay neutral with Bill, with, with, as to whether it works or not. He wants a story, I agree with you, to, about how all of that is intelligible on the basis of the being that takes a stand on its being. That's certainly his project. But now that I've forgotten the other half of my sentence, just a second. Uh, oh, yeah. But I don't know whether we have to think that, it's, that for it to be primordial, it has to be accounting for, the na for nature and a constraint on that other thing. Why couldn't it just be primordial of the kind of time that we understand and is in, which we live in and is intelligible to us is based on uh, uh, temporality? And he understands that. And nobody has understood that, and not even Aristotle. But I mean, do you have to make it so primordial that it gobbles up nature, time, all, uh, and all constraints on organizing our practices to make to make Heidegger's project? To, is that Heidegger's project, or is it only that he's going to explain all of world time uh, and all derivative, primitive versions of world time, like present at hand, clock time, all in terms of uh, either our uh, yeah, or in terms of our taking a stand on our being. You look, yeah. You so we were saying that you can't do that, right? You were saying the reason we have to bring in nature is because we can't account for that's it. That's, yes, but that's a different point, isn't it? One, what is he trying to do? Well, I think, I see, uh, he's, he's trying to explain all the world time. That would be what it was to do a primordial, to find primordial temporality. And he, can't, and therefore, now let me see, so, and if he's trying to do it, then he's failed. But, now, now I keep flipping back and forth, and I'm going to read you a passage in a minute where you can see that he, uh, I think Heidegger flips back and forth, but let me try to say this. Uh, if he thought that he could explain all forms of time, including natural time, in terms of the uh, temporality, he'd be a kind of strong temporal idealist, grounding it all in Dasein. I think Bill thinks that's what he's trying to do. I want to say no. Well, all he wants is to ground world time in Dasein, but he can't even do that unless he buys into this constraint, which is natural time, and then he can have his world time, but he can't have, and he can still have his, his kind of primordiality, namely all the aspects of world time, uh, a certain, no, a certain bunch of aspects of world time are all gonna be dependent on there being Dasein, but there's gonna be this fundamental uh, general successiveness that is involved in all this world time that he can't explain. So what is, what's the bottom line? That therefore he can't be a strong kind of temporal idealist, but he could be a, a kind of, uh, I don't want to call him an idealist. He's going he's to be a, I don't know, there's no word for it. A phenomenological analysis of temporality in which he does what he does, stick to the phenomenon. And he's, he doesn't want to be called an, either an idealist or a realist. Uh, Jamie is very strong on that. And that is, he's, he's not going to claim to be doing metaphysical idealism and get everything out of Daseins. And he isn't going to claim to be doing uh, a kind of metaphysical realism in which he's going to give you, uh, well, I think he's coming closer, but, he, but to give you uh, a story about 
what there is that's, yeah, I think he's, no, I take it back. He's not going to be doing, <laughs> Jamie and I have been re having this discussion for the last semester. I really want to make him a metaphysical realist, but Jamie kind of rightly says that Heidegger uh, never, is not sure that that's what he is or wants to be. Using a sentence that I found to my, this miracle sentence, can you quote it? That there's a place, I was coming to this, where, hi, well, no, let, let me get there step by step. You must know the sentence I mean. Okay, let me, the, I, I know how to set up that sentence, but before we do, somebody else had a hand up. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's interesting. Very interesting. Who knows? Let me think about it. Yes, he does say that primordial temporality is finite, right? It's got the thrown unto death structure, uh, in, right, built into uh, temporality. Uh, and now, and he says that it's a kind of some deep cover-up and misunderstanding and fleeing to claim that time is infinite. He doesn't, he thinks that, you, you, you wrote about that, didn't you, or are you? I left it out in the end, but yeah. You had, okay, and he does hold that. Yeah, the, the now, and he isn't so weird, I don't think, as to think that he's proved that nature time is finite. So what does he think, what does he think about nature time? Does he think that it's that it's infinite or might be infinite or I think he I think he better. Okay, you're just helping me set up the fact that there's on the when you get to the bottom line he doesn't know what to think. That's the amazing amazing fact. Now, on two fifty four, it you get it first said by about Aristotle, and then you think, well, he's setting it up to answer these these seemingly rhetorical questions. But when you wait to see what his answer to these rhetorical questions are, it turns out, he says, I don't really know. But let's get to that. First, the middle of 254. Uh, in the middle of that paragraph, where the little number 47 is, time is what is counted. There is no soul and there is no counting. Nothing that counts. And if there is nothing that counts, then there is nothing countable and nothing counted. If there is no soul, then there is no time. Aristotle poses this as a question, and at the same time stresses the other possibility, whether time perhaps is in itself, in what it is, just a motion, can, uh, sorry, is in itself, in what it is, just as a motion, uh, <laughs> dyslexia, I have to try again. Whether time perhaps is in itself, in what it is, just as a motion can also exist without a soul. I mean, that is, time just is what it is and doesn't depend on us. And Aristotle considers that. He asks that question. But he emphasizes that before and after, which is constitutive determina which is a constitutive determination of time, is in motion, and time itself is, what is that word? What is counted, right? Time itself is what is counted the before and after as counted. Let's go, all this is, Aristotle's getting very confused or worried about this. To be counted obviously belongs to the nature of time. So if there is no counting, there is no time, or the converse. Aristotle doesn't pursue this question any further. He merely touches on it, which leads to the question, how time itself exists. We see by the interpretation of being in time, the time is the embracing of that in which natural events occur, is, as it were, more objective, and uh, on the other hand, we also see that it exists only if the soul exists and so forth. And it looks like he just doesn't. He's saying, yeah, Aristotle's right. This is very puzzling. It looks like the time must depend on us because we're the ones who count. And even the notion of counting depends on us. It's unintelligible if, except by bringing us in. And if, if time is what's counted and it's unintelligible to have counting or countableness without us, then time, all time, depends on us, and yet he wants to say, well, it looks like maybe the before and after doesn't depend on us. Um, and he doesn't, he doesn't say that Aristotle takes one side or the other. He says Aristotle uh, just raises these questions. So then you ask yourself, well, which side is Heidegger on finally? Is he a metaphysical realist who says the time, some aspect of time doesn't depend on us? Or is he... Uh, Dasein idealist 
who says that finally all intelligibility and all temporality, uh, all the intelligibility of temporality and even all the temporality uh, depends on us. That's the idealism way. Now, can you quote that sentence exactly that's in your thesis? I don't, I don't have it exactly. Neither do I, but it's something like, I've been trying to figure out, I'll try it, you help me. I've been trying to figure out whether temporality is an ontological metaphysical, has an ontological metaphysical significance. That would, and I take that to mean whether it has, whether you could be, whether it makes one a metaphysical idealist or a metaphysical realist. And, and then he says, and I am unable to decide. What, what year is that? It's 35 about, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, so it's pretty amazing. It's earlier than that. Yeah, I see. Yeah, 30 maybe. Yeah, yeah. But after this. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's amazing. That, that, but sort of gratifying. That is, we're beating our heads against the wall trying to figure out, one, what Heidegger believes, and two, what's right about this issue. Of to what, what's the issue? To what extent time depends on us as qua Dasein, <coughs> well, what aspects of time depend on us qua Dasein and what aspects don't, while we're trying to figure out, one, what Heidegger thinks about it and what's true about it, it's clear that Heidegger hasn't got a settled thought about it and he doesn't know what's true about it and I, we don't either. Uh, Tyler, I wish you would help us. You've got more thoughts on this than anybody. Yeah. He takes a stand? Oh, let's look. Let's, where is it? Let's read it. Yeah, there's an italics here about the how. Oh, way down the middle of the page in 255. Okay. Oh, but we knew that. Isn't that sort of obvious? That, I mean, that, fine. I mean, that's what, that's, nobody, I, I, let me gloss that. That is, nobody doubts that world time, that's the phenomenon of time, is interconnected with the concept of world and with the structure of Dasein. Uh, isn't that just a statement about experience again? I see, what is that? Taken in a more original... Could we see that in fact the phenomenon of time? Well, isn't that... I mean, what, what did Aristotle miss? I haven't read the intervening sentences, but given what he says on, about, on 254, I would have thought that the, the phenomenon of time in the more original sense, namely the world time, is... Uh, or time in a more original sense what more original than Aristotle saw because it, the, the whole intelligibility of the temporal structure of experience in the world is that or more original sense. And, uh, that's, and that's what's going to be, then he's going to go into the whole story about the, the clocks, but, but not just the clocks, but about the structure of significance, dateability, spannedness, and publicness, and the story about clocks. And all of that is what Aristotle supposedly missed. Uh, I, I don't think that sentence in italics settles the, the things that shows that Heidegger has discovered. This, you want to read that, the, not only that the, this more original time is temporality and moreover it explains everything. So let's see, given that the Dasein exists, is in a world, everything extent that the Dasein encounters is necessarily intra-worldly, contained by world. So we shall see that in fact the phenomenon of time takes in a more original, taken, is interconnected with the concept of world and thus just, oh, this is tied up with who was saying, yes, this is tied up with the whole sto notion of world and, and disclosure and, and being and so forth. Uh, and if it weren't for the fact that he, you can get outside of the world, according to being in time, when you do the big switch over, this would be really a strong 
idealist claim, but is he going to say that time in, the mo in an original sense is interconnected with the concept of world? That's true. I mean, we're not going to get rid of that. Time as the non-successive structure of Dasein, that's the most original sense, is supposed to allow us to deduce the temporal structure of the world. That's what we all think Heidegger is trying to do. Whether, see, I wasn't clear about this before because I was too many things on my mind. But, and Bill says that's what he's trying to do, and he's trying to do it without, this is something that came out in a discussion with Eugene, and, and that's what he's trying to do, and he's trying to do it for everything, including even nature time. But you could say, well, what he's trying to do is to find this originary sense of time, namely us, does, we are time, in the, in, the, in the sense of temporality. He's going to find this temporality, and he's going to show that everything that has to do with the world is tied up with it. And that might seem to be total, except that we know that he thinks that the universe and the world are two different things, and that we can get out of the world into the universe if we do the kind of uh, uh, switchover that, that pure theory gives us. So we shouldn't conclude from this italics the strong Bill Blattner idealism that even nature time is unintelligible. I mean, let me just say one more sentence. It, if this access story makes any sense, if, if Aristotle is trying to do access theory, and it, it, it might even be intelligible. I mean, why couldn't it be the case that nature time is a kind of a pure before and after of some sort, the time-free movements of nature and so forth. And moreover, we can gain access to that by going through the whole of world time and leaving it behind, so to speak, we will, we will be able to have access to that kind of time, namely the whatever kind of pure time physics finally tells us is out there. Uh, that's what, remember, that's what's on page 414 of Being in Time. I think it's 414, where he says, the, he does the existential derivation of science, and he says theory and science uh, allow us to get totally deworlded, that's the language of basic problems, and when we're totally deworlded, then construct a theory, a cosmology, which tells us about the world, and that would be access. That, the, the, the practices that enable to do that would be access practices, not constitutive practices. I mean, I'm giving you my reading of Heidegger and, 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 and Tyler's. You, you, you're, looking, are you, you're agreeing with me, I presume. Yeah, well, the, the, he says explicitly in here, by the way, wait, just say, well, I don't want everybody to be confused. He says there is no nature time. And that's like saying there is no temporality in, uh, in nature. Yes, he doesn't worry much about it. That's right. He says, well, surely nature time, whatever it is, isn't temporality. And that's, about, that's all he has to say. Like the, what, what you mean? What's present at hand when you when you uh, behind the hammer when you when the hammer yeah. breaks? Yeah. 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 I like that. Yeah. Yeah. We're back to that kind of movement. I'm happy with that. I'm not pressing him for more than that. Yeah, well, let me know. Yeah. Wait, what did you say you didn't know?
the, 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 let's, the famous quote that you probably may or may not remember from way back last semester, that the real, the reality depends on us and not the real. Being depends on us but not being. Why not movement depends on us. Uh, is, wait, is that right? No, that's what... Uh, the, wait. Yeah, I was going to say, something depends on us. We don't know how to describe it, but movement. It was a, some, something constrains us. We don't know much what to say about it. But, well, but nah, what am I trying to say? I don't know. But movement movement does, do, doesn't depend on us. That's the bottom line. How to describe what does depend on us when it's, it, we don't know. That's... Is that right? But, but okay. Is it? Okay. I, I like everything you say, except do we have passages which make it clear that he thinks that movement doesn't depend on us, that the before and after kind of movement is... Yeah, right, right. But I think, especially with some passages, we have reason to think that something might have changed, particularly in the Eugene part, that changed the quality. So something like fear changed movement, independent of others. Yeah, well, I think that's, that's, that's what he should think, uh, and maybe that's what he does think. He never, I mean, this, just to add another element in this, when I think about Blattner, I always want to say to Blattner, Look, if you think that Heidegger was trying to, dis to derive the fact that our, our practices have to be ordered in the right way so that the causality and the, and the sequentiality of activity is preserved, if Heidegger's trying to show that, he certainly isn't very clear that he's trying to show that, and he certainly hasn't got any argument. Blattner's got one pathetic paragraph where he says Heidegger's trying to show that. And the, the simplest answer, if you're on my side, is, well, Heidegger wasn't trying to show that. Heidegger's trying to show how uh, world time depends on us, and he's, doesn't, it doesn't bother him that spannedness and dateability uh, have in them some kind of succession constraints that don't depend on us. Why isn't? Why not? Oh, now Eugene is looking unhappy. Does it depend on us or does it? I mean, you're saying it does. It does, but it doesn't. I did I say that? If I misspoke, I didn't want to say that. I want to say world time and ah, I see. Yes, I misspoke. Yes, spannedness depend is co-depends on us and on nature is what I should have said. There are these things that there wouldn't be any spannedness and there wouldn't be any. Uh, Dateability without us. In that sense, it depends on us. But I didn't mean expends, depends exclusively on us. I meant that we, so to speak, lay it on to something else, and that something else doesn't depend on us. That's what I think he thinks, or should think, or whatever. Whoa, no, I don't. Ah, uh -huh, that's nice. That doesn't make it very intelligible. I mean, it's a funny kind of meaning. Uh, it's, yeah, I see why you say that. But usually, meaning is that in terms of which, or on, on, uh, in, in, there's we don't know what terms to even use. What? Uh, but, but I am saying it's true that to make our world and our practices, the order or the coordination of our practices intelligible, we've got to bring in uh, nature. And in technically speaking, Eugene is right, when you, when meaning is always that on the basis of which something or other is, un, is understood. And in this case, it would be that on the basis of which constraints on the world is understood. Yeah, I guess I do want to say that, except there's something so, usually meaning is the most articulated and the most intelligible and the most unified. Here, and this is what's giving us all our problems, this, this quote, meaning, is something that's not, our, we can't articulate it, we, we, it's 
it's even literally in unintelligible to us when he talks about it and so forth. So it's a very strange meaning. Uh, you see what I mean? It does the abstract function of meaning. It, it's necessary to understand worldhood, but it doesn't have the, the characteristic of meaning you'd expect, namely, when, when, you, when you give, I'm just, this is like a review. When you give the meaning of care, boy, you give an articulated story which adds to our understanding of care, maps it on temporality, shows why it's at unity, big deal. And, uh, but here, meaning is just a very formal something or other that you have to bring in in order to understand something or other. Ah. Well, I'd rather say that it's, it's the meaning and just say, but it's a very, we, we have very little access to that meaning. We don't, uh, given our way of dealing with things, we can't make it intelligible. We don't get its unity. We don't understand what a now would be out there if there was a now. Yes. Uh, you want to say something? It's true. We, you're, 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 saying, you're saying something interesting. I mean, you, we tend, you just, when you're inside Heidegger, to be so inside Heidegger, I mean, the, the idea that, that he, he doesn't just want to assert that we depend on nature. I don't think anybody doubts that. It doesn't take Heidegger to come along and say that we've got bodies and that they're part of nature. Uh, he wants to explain what aspects of our experience depend on us being self-interpreting beings and what aspects of our experience, if any, and that's what we're unsure about and he's unsure about, don't depend on us as being self-interpreting. And it isn't illuminating at that level of asking uh, to say, yeah, well, of course we, but we've got bodies. It's, it's like Boswell kicking a stone to refute Hume, it seems to be sort of. Uh, I mean, it, the, the, Heidegger is not asking a common sense question and it won't do to give him a common sense answer. Although, it's, I mean, I'm not disagreeing with you completely because the fact that bodies have been ruled out of the discussion in being in time does seem a bit, uh, I don't know, uh, like it might have bad effects on the way the argument works to leave out something as important as the body. I, I just think it helps manifest some of this argument. I see. Okay, but it, you, you think so. I, I, I don't know. Maybe, yeah. Ah, that's what you're leading up to. Aha, ha, temporality is the meaning of care. The meaning, not part of the meaning of care. Uh, doesn't bother me, but I, you, maybe I have to... No, no, I mean, it doesn't even seem a problem. I must be missing it. Let me just say, I mean, temporality is the meaning of care. Meaning, that tells us that it explains why it's a threefold structure, what are the three folds in the structure, how they are unified. It does all that. Uh, it w but that doesn't mean that there isn't more to be done that it doesn't do. Is it to be the meaning of something, does that have to say, tells us everything that we need to know about? It should make it intelligible, yeah. It should, it should make it exhaustively intelligible or just... Well, it should be the, it should be the thing that makes it possible, you say. Uh, okay, makes it possible. Okay, well, it, it is what makes care possible. But it's funny. Well, this is all, you know, I hope we haven't lost you all, but I, I think you can follow this. I mean, it's interesting because, yes, it, it has to make care intelligible and possible. It's the most basic thing, which is just to say that being, uh, the being that takes a stand on its being, when it's all laid out, explains everything about <clears throat> the care structure and so forth, including the the temporality of the care structure and the temporality of the world, that's all true. And now, but let's go through this again. I, because I, you said something that stru stru struck me, but I don't remember now. I said, but why couldn't that just be a lot of necessary conditions, but not, but there could be other conditions. And, and you said in effect, but it wouldn't count as the meaning of X unless it explained everything there was to understand about X. Is that right? The meaning would have to be primordial temporality and nature together. I 
Mercy. Th that would be the meaning of what? Everything. Us, the world. Okay. Because, well, I'm, I'm just not sure how meaning, the, one of the weasliest notions in being in time. The meaning, certainly it has to explain the unity of it and the structure of it and how that structure makes possible a world and now comes the puzzling thing and does it have to explain also the the structure of the world is, is it is it the meaning of it's the meaning of care i suppose it's the meaning of the world i mean because that's the issue is whether all these four characteristics of world are being explained could it be the meaning of care and not be the meaning of the world that's what i'm really committed to it's telling us about the care everything you need to know about the care component is is if he does it, is in there. And, but it's not telling you anything at all about the uh, constraint component. And, but it does, that doesn't keep it, keep it from making a lot, but, but I see the problem because if it's true that you could only make the world intelligible by bringing in constraints, which is what you're thinking I'm saying and I am, then, uh, then there's a big puzzle because then you, I see what you're worried about. Then you haven't really got the meaning of the world because you can't, then we're back to the Blattner problem. You can't explain the, that meaningful structure of the world which he, Heidegger, lays out without, without bringing in the constraint and then you either have to go to idealism and say Heidegger's trying to be an idealist and failed or go to Dreyfusism and say Heidegger was never trying to and now you want to tell me but then he wasn't trying to find then temporality wouldn't be the meaning of everything. Uh, and so yeah, I'm just saying, why not say you're right in Heidegger's model? Right? Well, I mean, the only, well, we, we could, but we'd have to take back the claim that temporality is the, the meaning, right? It, because it, it can't explain certain aspects of the world, and unless it can explain the whole intelligible structure of the world, he's failed. That's big, Bill's big insight. And so I want to say, uh, I, I'm just trying to get used to what you're saying. Every time you say it, it always strikes me as right, and then I worry about it, lose it again. So I, I keep wanting to say, yeah, let's fix Heidegger. Let's just put in the constraint. But then Eugene is saying, yeah, but that, you have to do a lot more than that. You have to put in the whole claim that temporality I explains everything. It's where the explanation buck stops according to being in time. And, if, and that, that where I, I end up just saying being in time is wrong in a way that is just like Bill Blattner. <laughs> That's a funny thing to find myself on the same side as Bill, except, yes, I can't say Heidegger is a realist. I, sh I should say he should have been. Uh, how come he is unsure, I wonder, what to say? I guess he's unsure about whether temporality is the meaning of everything. That, it, that is whether it can be given a metaphysical ontological basis where are the, it explains even the galaxies and so forth, I guess. Uh, and he's, okay, so, so what am I, so the bottom line is Bill and I end up to my surprise agreeing that Heidegger's project is idealism, namely to explain all intelligible aspects of us and the world and nature too in terms of temporality that's the that's the big deal claim and he can't do it uh, and has Bill put his finger on where he doesn't do how he can't do it that surprises me you think so and one part of it yeah the, the part of it he's put his finger on the part that you can't account for why the practices have to be sequentially ordered just out of temporality. The part of it that he hasn't explained, uh, well, it's the same thing. He had, no, no, maybe there's nothing. That, uh, I mean, he should have explained that, and he didn't explain that. That's all I need to say to Bill. Is that right? You look like... Yeah, well, that's right. Well, explaining, that, that's the same. I stopped because it seemed to be the same thing. That is, he, one, he needs to explain why our practices have to be successive. And to do that, he needs both us and nature. 
And he doesn't want it that way. He wants temporality, namely us, to be the basis of everything. Is that, that's what we're, I think that's what we're both saying. Yeah, that's what Blattner is saying. And I think he's right. That's what Heidegger is doing. And then Blattner and I are saying, well, Heidegger didn't succeed. I see. And then Bill isn't saying anything about, and that's because there is something real out there that's a constraint he hasn't accounted for. Right, so, so you're and I'm saying, saying there's more to the problem. Yeah. It sounds like you were saying, oh, it's always fine. We just have to put in a constraint. And Blattner is saying, this doesn't work because we have to put in a constraint. That's right. Exactly. Yes. And Blattner is, is right that given Heidegger's ambition, it, you, it, it fails. And I'm sort of happy with what I want to say. Well, let's give up Heidegger's ambition and say this is a brilliant hermeneutic, phenomenological, existential account of the structure of all of our experience, provided you don't claim that it all depends on temporality. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah, that's a point. I mean, are you saying that's a problem, and why doesn't he... I mean, it's such an obvious problem, and maybe the body is sort of... It put it in under the guise of the hammer. It comes to the same thing. Because there's stuff out there which is so obviously the causal basis of what's going on, and of course he's not accounting for that and can't account for that. Why... This is a new issue about... What, is this an issue about sort of what it is to have the meaning of something and do the job? How, now we have to see if Eugene can help because... Uh, well, okay, first you. You haven't had anything to say recently. Yeah, Go ahead. Well, I, I feel as though I, I haven't had anything to say, very especially because my critique of the name of Spain is last week. So even though I feel particularly prepared this week, I feel compelled to do so. I think that... <laughs> Well, we reduce him and, and refute him, so to speak. Right. I, I feel as though we lose sight of what I at least thought was the most interesting and profound aspect of being time, which is the concept of groundlessness. And that groundlessness is important towards understanding Dasein. Dasein is inter intimate intertwining with the world. And that one cannot do world Dasein and, and seek to find the groundings of Dasein outside the world and thereby understand it. But so deworlding is done on the background of the world. It's not like anxiety, if that's any help. I mean, all these scientific practices in the laboratory and all that stay significant and meaningful and everything, but you get access to entities whose essential structure doesn't have any relation to these access practices. That's, that's the kind of realism I'm thinking he has to have if he's going to claim that deworlding gets us or science, if he wants to be, if he wants to be a realist about science, uh, you, I think you're saying. The process of doing this, though, is resurrecting epistemology, and we're asking about how do we have access to these things. And I wonder if then the, the being in time really had any point. Did he end up where we started, trying to figure out how we get at what's real, or uh, sure. how we really project it? And we didn't really get anywhere at all. We're still asking that question at the end. Of well, that that that's not quite fair. I mean, uh, it's not epistemology because it's not about how minds and subjects get uh, access to mind. Uh, well, maybe it is mind-independent objects. I see what you mean. Okay, touche. Let me think a minute. Uh, uh, I think the answer is something like uh, it is epistemology, but it's okay epistemology because we're not asking about how the mind and, and gets access to chairs. I mean, that's, that was good old-fashioned Cartesian epistemology, how we could, our inner representations got us access to anything. Now we got a very precise question. How does, uh, how do we account for science? How do our practices get us access to 
the kind of entities which are uh, science studies, that's not epistemology. I don't know what that is, scientific methodology theory or something. Epistemology is gone. I mean, that's, you can't have, I think epistemology depends on believing that it's all the inner content of subjects in überhaupt have to somehow get, get in touch with the outer stuff and we're not going to talk about that anymore. So let, put that aside anyway for the moment. I want to follow up. I, uh, his, what's your first name? I forget. You, yeah. Alex. Alex, question. Okay, I think that's fascinating. I mean, and I have to, we have to think about it a little bit. Surely Heidegger, when he says the temporality is the meaning of care, is also fully aware, and if you ask him, but aren't there hammers with causal properties, metal blobs and stuff, underlying the ready to hand, and that present at hand is there all along and somehow is a constraint for sure on the capacities of the equipment, well, what would he say? I mean, I just want to get the terminology straight. He would have to say that isn't a question of the meaning of anything. That's just some kind of fact the, about the world, that there are these things, the, the, the stuff. Remember, reality depends on us, but the real doesn't for Heidegger. Being depends on us, but beings don't. So the, the beings of the ready-to-hand hammers, the causal properties of stuff, doesn't depend on us. And it isn't the job of a uh, fundamental ontology, I guess is the name of it. It isn't the job of his fundamental ontology to uh, explain that there is this stuff and how we get access to this stuff. That's, is that right? I mean, uh, it, otherwise, he's, you go ahead. This is an interesting question anyway. The interpretation of? Of facts. Of facts. Now, I think, I think that's wrong, what you're saying, but if, let me say it back to you and see if I've understood you. You, don't, he, you can't go and say uh, somehow you, there's a kind, there are some kinds of interpretation which fall outside of fundamental ontology. I think all interpretation is part of what he's interested in. But there are some facts, like, yeah, is that what you're saying? Like, like metal is, uh, doesn't break... Uh, the way ice does, those kind of facts are not interpretations and are not part of fundamental ontology. It, it, he can be a realist about them it, in a way that he can't be a realist about uh, time. And if that's because of with all this discussion with Eugene, it, to be a realist about time is a part of the project of fundamental ontology or sorry, getting, getting the right story, realist or not, idealist, whatever. Getting the, getting, seeing the time as the ultimate horizon for making everything intelligible. That he's got to do. But that he's got to account for every fact and its causal properties. That's something he doesn't have to do. So it isn't as if Heidegger, how could you in, in, in Division One know that there were bodies and hammers and not give up your fundamental ontology before you ever even got to Division Two. That's because there's a di it's a different question. Yeah, I, I guess to put it in the language of the thing in here, he says that emotion as a structure of dimension, uh, dimension that gives something to something, he never tells you, he never goes into what the cause or what um, beyond that. It's, it's almost like we have to take that as given. Like yes, now, and now back to that, just a second. Oh, yes, motion. We're back. That I'm just losing track of too many things to keep track of. Now we already said earlier that the motion uh, in this Aristotle story is the is something about the uh, before and after, and and 
he's got to derive the before and after or somehow bring them in to the temporal order, claim that they only are intelligible if you relate them to the earlier and later, and lo and behold, if you're actually counting them, you are implicitly already relating to the early and later. All the stuff I was complaining about now turns out to be on the other side. You, you can't leave these un, uh, uh, untaken over into the world aspects of time out. He, that would be part of his project. If Bill is right, and, and, and Eugene, and I'm, I'm convinced by it now, you're gonna have to, he's going to have to explain, and he does try to explain, how all aspects of temporality are finally back to Dasein. I guess what I'm saying is he doesn't have to account for why dimension. Why dimensionality is wrapped up in anything about Dasein. Ah. Think, well, think interesting. Let me think. He, he does think he does. Why is that? He thinks that in order to order the practices, we've got to use clocks and that uh, we bring them into the story, too. Uh, and now, yeah, but it's so, oh, well, it's hard to think about this. But the motion of, uh, of the clock seems, we're now seeing always, the nature is seeming to be roving around on the periphery and the motion of the sun. And this is Tyler's interest. So what? Well, now let's turn it over to Eugene for a second. I mean, how does the fa how is he supposed to handle motion if he's doing fundamental ontology and wants to say that temporality is the meaning of everything, which is, I take it, where everything what everything period for the time being, everything about Dasein and world. What's he going? What's he supposed to be saying about the kind of motion that you measure with clocks? That's is that going to be. Is that what? He's going to have a hard time. <laughs> okay, well, that was a quick answer. I mean, this is, I see that. Poor guy, he's had a very hard time. Wait, the first, wait, 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 what's your name? Devin. Devin, I'm sorry, I keep always mixing you up with somebody else. Anyway, Devin, your hand is up. Um, Science, the practices of science have the power to do world, yeah. Because I think this is something that maybe I should have brought up earlier. I got the exact opposite impression from Tiger, but specifically in page 414. That's the magic page, right. right. And here he says things like, the grounding of factual science was possible only because the researchers understood that in principle there are no bare facts. Yes, yes, wait, stop, that's right. If I were teaching this, as, and I swear I must have said it last semester, that's already on a stage later. First you de-world, then you re-contextualize in a theory. And he's got this view that you don't just de-world and then there are electrons out there in galaxies. You de-world and then you take what you find when you de-world and you find it, you treat it as evidence for a theory, and then all the facts are theory-laden. He's a... He's a good sort of Quinean on that one. He, he, thinks, he thinks that even when you get outside and describe these electrons as, as with, with, uh, and their essential properties, I'm reading, this is now Greidegger, but I mean, but anyway, we, when you get out there and describe those things, you describe them always in a theory and there are no bare facts. This is the, this is the President Hess, the realm of the President Hess. Yeah, Hans. yeah, right. But No, we've escaped interpretation in the scientific present at hand, and that's why he says, remember, that, that science tells, shows us what the intelligible, the un, I'm sorry, is science explains the unintelligible. That is, and that's exactly why there is no interpretation. Understanding, this, he's making this contrast, which is common done in Germany at the time. The understanding, which is in the social sciences and the human sciences, makes society and people and psychology and history intelligible. Natural science makes them unintelligible. It breaks it away from all human meaning and all interpretation, where interpretation means drawing out the implicit meaning of this activity that we're in and so forth. But I don't want to go back. Devin, we can do it in office hours. I mean, this is it's going to be a tremendous relapse if we go back into this. Uh, somebody had a hand up. You, uh-huh. Why does the constraint have to be present? I mean, is that something that's essential? I mean, is, is it some type of movement or something that we're describing towards um, I don't see what 
Movements are present at hand, too. Pre all that present at hand means is not t tied into the referential totality of equipment, but have being a substance with properties. Uh, so mostly it's like hammers and metal, and, and not even hammers, of course, but, but blobs of iron and stuff are present at hand. And something like the pure present at hand, which is more extreme than substances with properties, is what you get when you de-world. And motion is going to turn out to be if the, uh, p purely present at hand in that it doesn't uh, connect up with our purposes and for the sake of. Okay. Well, gee, what time is it? Huh? There's still time. Yeah, Tyler. Well, let's see if we're taping it anyway, so I, I get nervous when I, because I think this is interesting stuff. I'm just curious, is it really working? Yeah, it's working. Go ahead. Because why? That's, that seems like too, too small a problem. Is that what you're thinking? But you don't believe that, you. You, by now, I'm beginning to see what each of you's own obsession <laughs> is, and, and sooner or later, you're going to do that. Go ahead. That's right. That's a, yeah. Okay, well, ah, the event, there's something like the event at the end of your life. Well, it's you are, what you really are doing is disagreeing with Blattner on death, which I think is a good place to disagree. He's got weird views about Heidegger on death. Okay, let me repeat this because nobody's going to hear this on the podcast and wonder how we got into this. Uh, so uh, Tyler is claiming that Bill's form of non-sequential uh, structure, which is a big, he makes a big deal about how uh, primordial time isn't sequential. And there, it's got to be right, because Heidegger keeps saying that too, but you're saying the, the way Bill reads it is not the right way to read it. That to say that it's not sequential is to say that it's what? It's, it's finite and its death is somehow permeates all of its uh, uh, activity, just like it's throwing us some guilt permeates all of its activity, and they are all uh, in all the temporal dimensions, and that's the sense in which even authentic 
Dasein is not temporal, and or not sequential, and primordial Dasein is just another name for authentic, it looks like. The, the experience, it's funny, you're doing, I, I used to do this myself at some stage, you're doing a kind of authentic, when, when Heidegger says primordial, when, when he says temporality is primordial and, auth and authentic, so Bill is saying it's a structure, and it's a structure in which each element of the structure refers to all the others, and there is no, uh, and that's the sense in which not sequential. You're really saying authentic temporality is an experience or is a way of being, and that's not uh, see, uh, uh, sequential either. And Heidegger seems to be thinking somehow both, that authentic temporality is the way you live if you've got this kind of structural temp this structure. And you're not disagreeing, you're just coming in one stage later, I, I think he would say. Uh, and, but, but the question would be whether you could get any more out of what you've been saying than he gets out of his primordial structure story. How are you going to explain why the practices have to be sequentially ordered? Which, what are you arguing for now? That the sequence is built right into the authentic way of living. You know, I think sequentiality is built into authentic and inauthentic. Well, I, I just don't know what to say about that. I mean, I would... Uh, are there quotes from Heidegger that suggest that that's what he thinks? I, I, not the kind of quote I would notice. For me, yeah, I think it's shocking. At 477, I think the page where he sort of, he sort of mentions the blackness of dimensions. Of being in time. Yeah, yeah, I remember that passage now, and that is a strong argument. That's where he, that's the fine, and the finite is part of that too. It's finite. Where are you going to get that if you don't bring in your way of understanding death? Uh, yes. Uh, but it's an explicit argument in which we account for the sequentiality of ordinary time on the basis of a loose sequentiality of finite time. Um, a, a kind of sequentiality of finite time. But I thought there was, you don't agree with Will that, 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 Primordial temporality is non-successive, non-sequential. Well, you do, but in an experiential way, not in the bill way, not in a structural way. I don't know, I mean, they, and Heidegger does, it's your, on your side, a side which I don't want to be on, Heidegger talks about every once in a while our allotted time, or a few times he talks about that, as if there really was this sort of sequence of, of I don't know, moments or something, and we've got a certain number of them. Is that follow too with the, with the body story? Eugene is trying to object to that, aren't you? Yeah, 
Oh, does he have a story about that? Yeah, some, yeah, something in there about that. But I think the question is actually, you have to have people trust the man. Yeah. Like, you're going to have the same problems no matter what state you're living in. Are you going to make it all the time? Are you going to make it all the time? Are you going to make it all the time? Are you going to make it all the time? I can repeat it or they can hear it. I'm just saying, it seems like it doesn't make that much difference what state you bring it in at. Like, whatever you bring it in, there's problems with it. Why does Gaza have anything like that or anything like Syria? Yeah, that's why I read the last Does he ask that? I remember he says we've, I've always been struck in the last paragraph, he says we haven't said a thing about consciousness in this whole 400 pages. We ought to mention it and do something about it. I thought that was pretty funny but, uh, uh, and nice. But I don't know about this thing about what you're saying. So you can't just, I mean, we, we, we going back into this other place we can sink into, you, you can't, you don't distinguish death from demise. I can't understand how you do. I mean, it's some event in the future, which is going to happen someday. It's not an event. Well, just because you're not going to be conscious when it happens. That doesn't seem very important. It's, it's something, it's an event in the future which is coextensive with an event in which Dasein loses consciousness, is what you're thinking. I mean, you can't, that is a, not very... What? What's that? Yeah, there's no. There's an event in the future of sequential time at which Dasein will no longer be, and that's not demise because Dasein isn't around to experience it. But it's still you. It's putting your death off into the future in a way which Heidegger, I thought, considered inauthentic. Well, it isn't going to happen now. That event coextensive with the moment when I'm not going to be, but it's going to happen someday. That's not what you're supposed to think, I don't believe. So that's why I don't buy this. But we, we shouldn't go back over it. I mean, but anybody who's writing a paper on it should find it interesting. Uh, I mean, which is? Because the, but the, let's just repeat, because for him, primordial temporality is a structure. It, and the structure is all, it, the elements are in no way lined up successively. Right. So he said he can't, by definition of habitat, he can't derive anything from it. So he gets it. Yes. So if anyone actually tries to um, show how you get habitat, when Heidegger tries to show how you could have it using your argument. Well, I, on my argument, I just sort of gave because you, it, you've got to do it in terms of the ultimate structure of Dasein, which is thrown, falling, projection, as he keeps saying. He doesn't say getting born and dying. Uh, that's too ontic. That's too temporal. You get born at a certain moment. And, and you may not be there around when you die, but you're certainly sort of there when you're born. Or maybe you're not, but it's, there's a moment coextensive with whether you're there or not when you're born. And this is, and he thinks, and I, I agree with him, that's not capturing, throwing, falling, projecting at this abstract structural level that he thinks Heidegger wants to do it. But all these are all sort of amazing, unsettled issues. I think everybody's looking pretty exhausted, and we've covered all the obsessions and, all, and, and new material too. So I think we should stop. Uh, but, and notice, I mean, I'll make a little final oration. Oh, no, I, may, would I have a little thing, and maybe I would... I wonder if we've covered this. Wait a minute. I mean, if, if not, I can bring, with it next, bring it next time. But I wanted to say this, that remember now we're going to leave all this murky stuff behind, so it's a good thing we spent a long time on it today. We're going to the pure ontology, which is probably very hard and abstract in a new way. For next time, we're going to talk about temporalitate, this higher order form of some temporal something or other, which is supposed to explain the unity of all these no kinds of temporal something or others that we've ta talked about. That's the aside. That's right, isn't it? The next time is temporality. Okay, so prepare yourself. Don't expect this, somehow that to go right on from where we are. It's a kind of radical, different issue from where we are. Okay, okay. That that's it. Now I want to before I go on to the temporality, which the, 
which I'm going to keep calling temporality Tate, because I can't, which is the German, because I can't keep calling it temporality with a capital T. That's too much of a mouthful. There are two totally different German words. Zeitlichkeit gets translated temporality in here, and temporality Tate gets translated uh, tempora uh, temporality with a capital T. We'll just have to fix that. But I did find one thing I want to do is to go back before we go on to something I found in uh, an, an essay that Heidegger wrote in 1925 in which he talks about time and, and uh, realism in science. I don't know if I ever showed this to you. Have I? We haven't talked about it, but I think I know. You've seen it. So I copied it because it, it's so relevant to what we've been talking about. Oh, that's interesting. Give me back one. I didn't bring it with me, the book, but I don't need the book. So, uh, but I'll wait till you get it, and I'll just fill you in in the background of where we are. Um, So, starting at the top of 171, it, it, there's a sentence that's cut off, but it isn't important. It starts where we want to start. Philosophy is observation of the world, disclosing it in terms of its being. Here, the real being of the world is nature. This is, this is going to turn out to be not what Heidegger's doing, because we have to read it. The real being of the world is nature as that which always is, a science of the world is in the first place, therefore, an unlocking of nature. And that's still, that the Greeks could do that. Nature has to be made present and accessible in its perceptual being and regularity in such a way that all those moments are excluded, which now, now comes the important part. Um, this is how we deal with nature. Nature, well, let me think of it. Not I can, just a second. No, that's still, the, the Greeks already have, are getting a view of nature which leaves us out of it. So let me go on. Nature has to be made present and accessible in its perpetual, continuous being and regularity in such a way that all of those moments are excluded, which, through conditioning our access to the observation of nature, interfere with it. So already in Plato, for instance, you get the idea that <coughs> you don't, you want to contemplate it in pure theory and not uh, in, in involving perception in your body. This tendency first developed in such a way that rather than erecting a nexus of particular laws, it secured fundamental concepts. This happened in Greek philosophy. So they've got their own view of nature, but that's not what we're interested in. But the next sentence, which is important. Modern physics, le and this is, remember what I'm trying to argue so you can listen in the right way. I want to say this is going to cast light on Heidegger's claim the, that there are time-free movements of nature and that we can have access to them and our access can be totally contingent, that is, in no way affect these laws. That's what I claim he should say if he's going to be a realist about science. And he does say it here. He says, modern physics led to the discovery of laws of motion, defining them in a way that was free of any reference to the contingencies of our access, measurement, and defining of them. So that's, that's exactly the point. And then he thinks the theory of relativity, far from making the laws of nature or the, law, or the laws describing the time-free movements of nature uh, uh, relative to us, relativity makes the, determines an abs what, what counts as absolute motion. So the theory of relativity took seriously this idea of an absolute knowledge of nature. It's not a theory about the relative validity of physical laws. Rather, it, it inquires to those conditions of definition and measurement that make it possible for nature to be grasped purely in terms of itself. That is, that's what I keep wanting to talk about. He wants to talk about, the, the, say, electrons, or in this case, space and time, as they are in themselves purely in terms of itself and for its laws of motion to be understood. And that's all I want to read. So, so there, the, the laws of motion are going to be these time-free descriptions of change, but it's going to be change without 
respect to us, without respect to now. There's no now in the laws describing the movements of nature. And it won't have in it earlier and later. Now, there's a place in here which I marked in my copy, which I left behind on the, one of these pages where, but I, I want to talk about this, not in cl class, but you might notice it if you read it. He talks about science. I wonder if we can skim it. Talks about science discover, de describing things in terms of the earlier and the later. And uh, I would have hoped that he would have talked about it in terms of the before and after. Let's skim it down for earlier and later. I tried to find the German. What? Really? And it, that's nice. Where is that? I see. But you got there without any earlier and later. It may be that it's not on one of these two pages. It, I'll, I'll talk to you about it later. Anyway, I want. To, I'm trying to track down the German. It would be what? Vorher and nachher would be one possibility, and then it, but, but and that's and what he would and that could be translated earlier and later, but it would could also be translated before and after. Where's the before and after now? In the last paragraph. Okay. It says Aristotle is what is counted in motion with respect to before and after. Ah, yes, that's that's the whole discussion of Aristotle that we've got in the basic problems too. That's. That's on the right track, Heidegger thinks. But somewhere, oh, here it is, got it, middle paragraph. Thus time, even thought of as the time, I'm at the beginning of the middle paragraph. Thus time, even thought of as the time of nature, does not have to be conceived of in an absolute metaphysical fashion. This is one of the basic discoveries of the theory of relativity. Physical time is one-dimensional, irreversible, is a one-dimensional, irreversible multiplicity of earlier and later moments. That worries me. I really looked all over German Amazon trying to find the original paper that the footnote tells this is from. Um, but each now is unrepeatable and so forth. Uh, we just have to look into that. Uh, but in general, I mean, if that says earlier and later, then that's important to worry about. Because if he really says earlier and later there, then I'm, I'm stumped. I, or, or he's confused. And this is uh, two years before being in time, but uh, I, I just don't believe he's going to say that. He knows already, presumably, that uh, earlier and later are relative to a now, and now is something that we, we bring to the time-free movements. I can't believe that he said that. But I, if, I, the, if this weren't the last lecture I give, in fact, I'll tell you, I've all got, I've got your email addresses. If he really did say that, I'll send you an email telling you we're, we're back to square one. And, that's, and uh, that's the best I can do. Let's hope I don't have to. Um, okay, anybody want to say anything about that? I mean, of, of all people, I think Jamie might want to because he just wrote his honors thesis on this issue. Do you think this is a problem for, for the... He, he has the interesting thesis that Heidegger is not interested in the, in itself, sort of a metaphys... He's not a metaphysical realist about anything, not even about the thing science studies, and his thesis convinced me that Heidegger doesn't care much. You'll notice it goes by in, in two sentences. He doesn't care much about whether we've got access to uh, the necessary laws of, the, to the laws of motion uh, that make our practices for gaining access to them, namely doing science and so forth, contingent, that is irrelevant to these time-free motions, which we get at by way of these practices. The, the Heidegger does, I think, I think believe it. But James convinced me that Heidegger doesn't care much, that it only gets mentioned for one page in Being in Time, and in this article, only for a few sentences. But uh, I do think it looks like he's, he's talking like a realist about science, at least for a sentence. Uh, we could talk about it later. Yeah, okay, because it's a big. It, by now, it's a big issue. After I've mean, written 60 pages on it, you're gonna. We can't answer. Gonna, one sentence is not going to overthrow your view. I, I could, I'm sure. Okay, so now then we're going to go to the temporality passages. I brought along the German for that, though I have nothing in mind in case something like that earlier or later comes up. Where this time I will be able to at least settle it. 
Okay, let me just explain, before I even start trying to lecture on this, it's, a, it's really providing me and sort of forcing me to realize how I approach something that is so difficult and so abstract as these pages about temporalitate and about uh, présence and so forth, that they are really dense and hard to understand. I don't know how you feel about it. How many had a chance to read the, what you were supposed to be reading? Not so many. Well, then I will ha I will be, I'll read passages that will help you understand. And part of what I want to talk about, I didn't assign. And it turn I sh realize now that I should have. Only then I look out at your hands and I realize now it doesn't matter whether I did or not. You've got, <laughs> you've got other jobs to worry about. But, I, so, but I'll read passages both from what, we're going to, what you should have been reading after page 30, what is it, 305 or something like that. 302 is where I, I'm, I'm going to go to. But there's, there's stuff between where we stopped and 302 which is important to read. But here, my method, and this is what you, and you have to help me with this, or, e, or learn that this is the right way to do it, or not the best, the best way to do it. I don't think there's any right way. The best way to interpret Heidegger, but you know I'm always saying, and at, and at least I have Heidegger on my side sometimes, say it's the phenomena that you've got to get in mind. You can't understand these strange abstract terms, and without the phenomena, you're just throwing them around, as, as there is a whole school of Heideggerians who specialize all their lives in throwing around these fancy terms, who think that the, his book, Contributions to Philosophy, which has more fancy terms thrown around in more ways, is his greatest work, even greater than being in time. But I'm trying hard to understand this by f thinking of what it is he might be talking about when he's doing it. And hopefully, if I get it right, that's going to be helpful to understand why he says what he says. And, and on the other end, and if it does help us understand what he says while well, he says, that's good evidence that this interpretation is getting it right, or at least is a good interpretation. So, and you, I, mean, I can't just jump in and list all the phenomena at once. They will come by, one by one, in what I want to say in, say, the next half hour. So let's start on 274. Those of you who have, lots of you have basic problems now, or, or more of you anyway. Um, and so, and, all, and you, you, this isn't in the part that Tyler Xeroxed, I don't think, because it wasn't on the syllabus. But, so those who have it, have it. Uh, and so on 274, there's this really dense uh, paragraph, which I think resonates with a paragraph in Being in Time. And to, I think that what he's talking about, no, let me read it first and then, then I'll tell, no, well, that, then you have to listen differently. I think that what he's talking about, the phenomena there is familiarity as the background upon which all of our understanding of ourselves and entities take place. And after I read it, I'll show you the place in being in time where he says very similar things uh, and he says it, he's talking about familiarity. That would be nice. That would be a phenomenon. We know what, pheno what familiarity is. He's given us a good example in being in time of a room. So anyway, here we are. I'm going to read on 274 the end of the last paragraph of section 19, all starting in the italics. Temporality, remember that's Zeitlichkeit. That means the, the, the temporal structure of Dasein, Zeitlichkeit is. It's this ecstatical way of being that we are. Temporality is the condition of the possibility of the constitution of Dasein's being. Remember, in the language of being in time, temporality is the meaning of care. And care is the meaning of Dasein's being. However, to this constitution, there belongs understanding of being. For the Dasein, as existent, comports itself towards beings which are not Daseins and beings which are. Accordingly, temporality must also be, and this is going to be very important to get clear about, must also be the condition of the possibility of the understanding of being 
that belongs to Dasein. Getting the phenomena right or is tied up with hearing that phrase, the conditions of possibility, right. I'm going, the, when we talk about the condition of the possibility of the understanding of being, you, you, the, the distinction between Blattner's approach, which is going to lead Heidegger into idealism, and my approach, which makes it at least com incompatible with realism, turns on, or will make a, make a big difference, how you understand that. But right now, I'm just going to read it. Accordingly, temporality must also be the condition of the possibility of the understanding of being that belongs to Dasein. How does temporality make such understanding of being possible? How is time as temporality the horizon for the explicit understanding of being as such? If being is supposed to be the theme of the science of ontology or of scientific philosophy, sort of, you, you need to get, you need to be able to theorize about it. In, in its role as conditions of the possibility of the understanding of being, both pre-ontological and ontological, we'll call temporality, we'll, sorry, let's try that again. In its role as a condition of the possibility of the understanding of being, both pre-ontological and ontological, we shall call temporality, temporality-tate. So temporality, which is the structure of Dasein, when it's the structure that, that makes possible, in some sense, the understanding of being, we're going to call it, and, and therefore is the basis of doing, is, is pre-ontological, because it's got in it an understanding of being, and it's the basis of doing ontology, we're going to call that temporality. Now that is pretty obscure, and, I, and I'm reading into it the only something, at least, which I can make sense of. And, and happily, this is a better example than anything else I'm going to say in the lecture. It looks like there is a phenomenon that he's talking about on 119 of being in time, which is just what this paragraph is talking about in a much more abstract way. And so I'm going to read it, that last paragraph. That wherein Dasein already understands itself is always something with which it is primordially familiar. So I'm going to claim that familiarity is the phenomenon, and that's the on the basis of which we relate to entities. This familiarity with the world does not necessarily require that the relations which are constituted for the world as world would be theoretically, should be theoretically transparent. However, the possibility of giving these relations an explicit ontico, uh, ontologico existential interpretation is grounded in this familiarity. So it looks to me like the, the, the giving an ontological interpretation is what this paragraph is about, and this grounding in familiarity is the conditions of the, what he calls here the conditions of the possibility of the understanding of being. Let me go on. Uh, and this familiarity, in turn, is constitutive for Dasein and goes to make up Dasein's understanding of being. So there you see, it's, it's temporality is, turns out to be the conditions of the possibility of the understanding of being in, in uh, basic problems. Here, I think, familiarity is the same thing. It's doing the same job. It makes up Dasein's understanding of being. This possibility is one which can be seized upon explicitly insofar as Dasein sets itself the task of giving a primordial interpretation of its own being and the possibilities of that being, or indeed for the meaning of being in general. That's ontology. So somehow the, the familiarity is, makes up Dasein's understanding of being, and therefore if you do a study of it, you can do you do ontology. You, you, under, you could, when you push it all through, the, as he does trying to do the all, uh, he doesn't do it, but he, he could do the past, present, and future the way he's done, the, he'll do the present. And he will, in principle, if you, if you get the understanding of being, then you get the understanding of all the modes of being, 
I've said this before, I say it every once in a while to keep my own sanity, then you would get the understanding of being ready to hand, being present at hand, being Dasein, and uh, you would have a general ontology, except there are even more basic issues, which is what we're going to come to. I mean, you'd have the first stage of doing an uh, ontology. Then you'd need to explain something about what makes that ontology possible. We're not ready for that yet. But, but what he calls here conditions of the possibility of the understanding of being, I think, is familiarity. And why, that, and why is that important? Well, because if you hear conditions of possibility in a Kantian way, which you would and should, I mean, that's it's Kant's phrase, then it looks like it's a Blattner claim that there is some kind of dis structure which Heidegger is getting at, which is what ontology wants to describe, and which uh, makes possible our experience of objects and of equipment and others. It's going to turn out, of course, it has to do the same job, make our encountering of all sorts of beings possible. But there are two ways you could make our encountering of all sorts of uh, being possible. One would be to have a kind of categorical structure which makes determinate, as, as Bill says, all uh, the various modes of being. And that's the easy thing to say. That's what you would say if, we, if, if, if you were reading Kant, as Blattner has for years, as, as, ever since he was an undergraduate here, and, and reading it into Heidegger. But it would be a radical different thing to say that the condition of possibility really means that phenomenon on the basis of which you are able to have all the modes of being or all the forms of intentionality, as he'll put it later. Uh, and it's a big difference because that's not a structure. Familiarity is not a structure. Familiarity is a very, very basic phenomenon. And it's only on the basis of familiarity with rooms, for instance, that we can encounter chairs and walls and windows and so forth. But that's not like saying the familiarity is a kind of structure which structures objects or equipment, say, like chairs and uh, floors and walls and windows. Do you see what I mean? Uh, and I think it's, it's going to turn out, and so if you, you, it's hard to know what the phenomena is he's talking about in on, two, on 274, but it must be the same as 119. I hope I've at least convinced you of that. I mean, it does the same job. He uses the same words. It's all about finding out about the understanding of being. So that, and, but it's, it comes right after the discussion of the phenomenon of world. And I think that it's part of the, part of what's going on is he's describing the, a certain aspect of the phenomenon of world, namely that it's familiar and it's the condition of the possibility of encountering anything. So my first idea, uh, the, the, uh, the Tyler, good. Okay, well, I think of a structure as, as conceptual. Uh, I mean, in Kant, the, the, at least the structure is conceptual. Uh, but go ahead. So I, I, and I think of the structure as somehow abstractable from what it structures. For familiarity is, is he says, in, in it, he, that it's pre when in basic problems, I'm going to come to it later, but he says it's pre-objective, pre-conceptual, and there's the third pre. What would, oh, and pre-ontological, whatever it is that this, on the basis of. Can you, can you say that about uh, a structure? Yes, it's something Dasein does. But uh, I, I would have thought that was, I, was, I thought that was on my side. I don't think one does a structure.
okay, I, I got to think about this. I mean, an existential is a structure because it's uh, the abstraction from the existential, L E L. And, uh, but I don't see that familiarity is like that. I mean, it's, it, it's fami familiarity doesn't seem to be an existential, it seems to be a phenomenon. Uh, It does involve certainly a t a t an, a an activity, a temporalizing activity, uh, some pressing into the pressing into possibilities and thrown into moods. Though, but those aren't structures either. It seems to me, those are more phenomena. Maybe we're not arguing about anything. I don't know. But don't. But it seems that uh, when when Blattner hears, remember the definition of being in being in time. It's got this half a sentence of Dreyfus and half a sentence of Blattner. Being is that on the basis of which beings are already understood. That's my version. That's familiarity, for instance. Uh, it, and then comma, that which determines beings, being, ter determines beings as beings. That determines seems so strange. I mean, I don't see that that on the basis of which beings are already understood familiarity determines beings as being, determines as a Kantian notion. It's that there are these conceptual structures which, which literally structure the, the phenomenon. You're looking worried, uh, both of you, so there's probably something well enough very serious to worry about. Maybe there's a non-issue here. I, I, what do you think? You're looking like you want to say something. Eugene, do you? I don't know. Yeah, but I think the difference is getting into you th I you think the difference is getting into stuff. You're not seeing a difference either. Huh. Hmm. That's a problem. Like a What's that? It's not like it's a chaos. Right? There's a, no, 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 familiarity is certainly not a chaos. It's got a lot of, you could say structure, but it's not, uh, but it's, not, I mean, does it matter that whether the structure is conceptual, abstractable, uh, and so forth? I mean, familiarity's kind of structure is a kind of structure which you can't abstract from the the room. If it's a familiarity with a room, it's 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 certainly not conceptual. Uh, now, maybe uh, maybe Blattner's a, a straw man. Maybe. I mean, Kant certainly has a structure. We, we aren't disagreeing about that, are we? That the separable from what it structures and conceptual and so forth. So it's just a question of whether Blattner, when he says that it's a structure which determines... See, I, I guess here's another way to put it, and then I sort of give up. The Voralf hin, which is this crucial word that, the, that we're worrying about, it, that, which I take to be on the basis of which, which maybe it helps to say, which I hear as the background of the, the holistic background of coping practices. Bladner always says in his book, in terms of which, as soon as you go to in terms of which, it sounds much more conceptual. And you say, it's that in terms of which we determine entities as entities. Boy, that's a funny way of describing the, it seems to me, the practices uh, which form the background of our the holistic practices which form the background of our specific intentional practices. You don't hear a difference, or you think I'm making it up, I, I take it. Maybe it doesn't make a difference, but I think Glenn is onto something when he says just that there's structured activity on the side of God, which is the ultimate basis. It's not structured, Kant is a structure, but Kant is. But then if we have to describe the basis of everything, it's going to be an activity of God by which it should be understood as structured. God is a phenomenon in the sense that it has. And the structure will be this threefold temporal structure. Not cognitive structure, but structured activities on the basis of which. So it's closer to Kant. Well, what if I just took out the word and said it's activities on the basis of which? What does it add? I keep, that's what I, either it seems to me it adds nothing to say structure or it adds something I don't want. Okay, oh good, okay, it's based in, a, uh, maybe that's a, the way to get the two views together. It's based on, a, on, on practices in the background 
Dasein practices in the background. It's based upon them. That's the upon which that we can articulate and talk about. That's true, because he says you can make it the basis of an ontology. So I guess all that's left of my view is I want to make sure that, that we don't just start at the second level, where we've got something that we've already articulated and are now uh, making an ontology, that at the very basic, very most basic level, it's uh, a holistic bunch of activities that can be articulated. That's all right. Maybe both of you want to say that. Maybe I. Maybe Bill wants to say that because he does take a talk a lot about practices. Yeah. Self what? Self projection. That's right. That's right. You think of a projection sort of thinking like projecting a picture on the wall, and that's that's right. Don't think of the projecting your particular activities into future events. And it's true now that temporality is. What now? Projection of Dasein's activity on? Well, I guess, well, he says this is on page 307. Okay. Let me look at, wait, let me, I'll get to 307. Yeah, I'll put this, wait, I want to put this away. And I want to look to see if, if we're, what's happening here, just so how, how discouraged to be. Oh, it's still working. Okay, 307. Here we are. Okay, let, let's, good. Let's go on. So, so whatever and whenever understanding exists, we ha, we are here disregarding the other moments of the Dasein. This understanding is possible only in temporary self-projection. Dasein exists as unveiled because it makes possible the Da and its unveiledness in general. Uh, and what do you and what do you get out of that? Whoa, 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 that's a hard place. But where are you? Because we all ought to be looking at that. Okay, that's on page 308. Where? Uh, the first paragraph in the middle. Okay, uh, I mean, that's way ahead of where we are, but let's see if we can deal with it. If we define temporality as the original constitution of Dasein, and thus as the origin of the possibility of the understanding of being, uh, let's talk about that for a minute, the origin of the possibility of the understanding of being. So Dasein's constitution, namely taking a stand on its own being, is the origin of the possibility of the understanding of being, where the understanding of being is uh, the I, I think the background coping practices, and that's all right then. Okay, so Dasein takes a stand on its being through doing all these specific things on the basis of some background familiarity. Okay, then temporality, that's his uh, temporality-tate, then temporality-tate as origin is necessarily richer and more pregnant than anything that may arise from it. And 
what we have to we have to get here step by step because it, it's not obvious at all what temporality is ever that not certainly not here uh, uh, I'll try a little further to myself so I go home No, let's wait. We have to wait to get there, uh, because that, though that's it's so hard. And then he gets these summing up paragraphs that condense it all into making it even harder. Uh, you, you look like you want to say one more thing. Does what? Now that's right. Temporality is where the buck stops in these levels. So the temporality is the uh, is a rich uh, is a rich something. Says I don't think of the word is structure. What is it? It's a, it was right where back where where you were reading a minute ago. Where were we on three nine three eight? Yeah. You rich temporality is richer and more pregnant than anything may arise from it. So I'm going to argue or try to show or claim or something that the, what you've got to take apart this rich temporality into several different phenomena, which he gets to be distinguishing as he goes through here. Uh, but I can't say yet what, and maybe we'll agree then. I mean, and, and when you put all these phenomena together, you get temporality, and temporality is that... Uh, somehow activity of Dasein that makes the understanding of being possible, which in turn makes the encountering of particular beings possible. And why we get these two levels of possibility and no, no less and no more is very hard to understand, but he, he tries to explain it. Okay, Any, anybody else? Tyler, more, yeah. Right, you say that we're trying to discern where the infinity of Well, that's surely one of the things we'd better do in here. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, like, does it stop with an activity of Dasein? In this case, temporality becomes projection. Yeah. Or does it stop with a phenomenon which is irreducible to an activity of Dasein? It seems to me if it stops with an activity, it's Latin correct. It's basically a constant fiction. And so when I hear you talk about phenomena, I hear you trying to stop the regress to something other than the activity of Dasein. I, I think about. I have in mind what I, I have to check this on what I have in mind. In fact, I don't think uh, the richness of temporality is an activity. It's sort of aspects of an activity or so, uh, put together. Uh, well, let's let me try it the other way. What activity is it? That uh, you th you think it's an activity. Last week I would have said it was the temporal primordial temporalizing activity. <coughs> but that looks like that's uh, the the zeitlich kite with its ecstasies and horizons. It looks like it looks like it ended with this activity of Dasein called temporality. Yes, then it looked like let's just review. It looked like the bottom line in the, in ontology was the Dasein as a being that takes a stand on its being has the threefold ecstasies of the past, present, and future in their non-sequential form, and that each of those has a horizon, that is, something in the world corresponds to each of those things in Dasein in a way that they can't be separated. That was the bottom line. That's what we, we agree at the end last time. And as such, it looks to me like a non-cognitive Kantian picture, basically. A non-cognitive Kantian picture. It is so it's funny that it happens, and I noticed this time reading through, sometimes it looks like that it is a sort of co correlative structure between the ecstatic structure, which is due to Dasein, and the horizontal structure, which is due to the world. And it looks like every ecstasy has a horizon, and sometimes it looks like the ecstasy sort of reaches out to a horizon, and sometimes it looks like it makes the horizon, because sometimes he'll, he's always taking the horizons back to the ecstasies. You, you, you've noticed that too.
Right, I agree. Where we're going to find something which is also given to the activity of God. Good, absolutely. And then it wouldn't be Kantian. No, no, but you, you're on the right track, and it's not, I mean, I, it's, the difference between an activity of Dasein and the phenomena, I mean, the, the, the activity is also a phenomenon, I think, uh, uh, that, so that, but the, But there are phenomena that are not activities of Dasein, but are correlative with activities of Dasein. That would be the non-Kantian side. That would be the side that makes the horizon equally important to the ecstasy. And sometimes he does talk that way, and sometimes just when I'm thinking, oh boy, he's got it, he goes back to say it all goes back to Dasein's ecstasies, which just happen to have horizons. But, but the ecstasies are, and Dasein are more basic than the horizons. And then it sounds Kantian. And if you, if you if you have a Kantian thing which doesn't have any more a conceptual structure, but has a kind of activity that goes back to the basic way uh, being that we are, uh, it's so why he doesn't see or want to say that the one of our activities is certainly taking a stand on ourselves, and that gives us the ex, the three ecstasies, but it couldn't do it if it weren't linking up with. Uh, world, that was the horizons. I know you don't mind that. That's your, you want to be a realist of some sort about it and not have it turn into Kant. Uh, we, well, we're going to go back over it. I've got candidates for what the, the, on the world side can't be absorbed into activities of Dasein, which really belong on the side of the horizons. I'll tell you, I don't want to keep them up my sleeve. Two, I think he's getting at very, very deep and fundamental phenomena and I think one of them is affordances, that there has to be solicitations in the world to which Dasein is responding in its activity. That would be way down in a kind of ontic level, but there on some abstract level, there has to be, or abstract is probably not the right word, on an, on an ontological level, there's where we're talking about the background instead of talking about dealing with particular objects, there still are, I think, something like affordances. And the other thing I think that, that, that he's got is that, well, that's the main one. The other one may be on the side of Dasein. It seems when he's talking about the unready to hand and how you recognize something that's missing, he's got a view about the readiness of Dasein to, to cope with the things or to... Uh, find its way around in the world. And the readiness is another something. And the, the readiness is on the side of Dasein, that, but I guess, on, on, on the side, and what I, like the ecstasies. And I would, I'm trying to find out what in the world he thinks, if anything, and I think he does seem to think, is over on the horizon side, namely world. Of course, self and world can't be separated. And of course, it's all being in the world. But uh, it looks like for him, being in the world is finally really Dasein. Dasein is being in the world. And somehow the world gets played down, and the being that takes a stand on its being, Dasein, gets made absolutely basic, more basic. And that's what I wish he wouldn't do. Of course, maybe he does it even though I wish he wouldn't. And maybe there he does it even though later he wished he hadn't. I mean, there's, this is pro tied up with, presumably, why he doesn't go on with being in time, that he's falling into giving a kind of priority to Dasein and doing what he calls fundamental ontology, which is tracing it all back to the fact that there's a being that takes the stand on its being. Uh, and he does, and later he'll see that he gave up being in time because he was falling into the ruts of the tradition. I take it that may be what he's, do, what he's worried about. Anyway, let me do it step by step, keeping our eye on the ball as best we can. Uh, to what extent, what, well, why does he need to bring in temporality at all? 
if it isn't that he's trying to get the world and Dasein balanced and the ecstasies and the uh, horizons into a uh, phenomenon uh, or a structure, uh, probably a phenomenon that has a structure to keep track of both of these of us. Uh, so he's trying to find a phenomenon that has a structure that is more basic than the structure of Dasein with its uh, ecstasies correlated with horizons. And that structure is temporarily Tate. So let's go on and see if we can do it. I mean, this is so hard. I mean, if you can't follow what's going on, I don't know whether it's my... F I'm, I'm, if it's my fault, I'm sorry. But, it, but it, everybody's got to help to try to make it clear. I, I don't think I'd do it alone. But let's, let's see what we get. Um, so I, where were we? On t uh, I was reading 276 way back there. I have to catch up or go back. And I think I did... I read... So there's a lot about understanding there on 276 as coping, of course. So and the un and it's in the context of talking about the understanding of being, because the understanding of being is the most basic background coping. I think that's what that's what I think being in time says, and that's what I think this says on 274. But he's, it says it much more obscurely, and. And the understanding at the bottom of 276, if understanding is a basic determination of existence, as such it is the condition of the possibility for all of Dasein's particular possible man manners of comportment. It is the condition of the possibility for all kinds of comportment, not only practical but cognitive and so forth. Now, that can, be, that can cut both ways. I mean, that certainly grounds or the, the understanding of being and it makes the understanding of being a kind of coping, but it makes it all we're on the side of Dasein, because it's Dasein that's got this understanding of being. So if he's going to get it out of falling into Dasein, he's got to do something else with it. And then I wanted to go on to 279. Something that I think is important, though it may turn out not to be, uh, but on 279, I want to read it. This is uh, it called the chapter or the section called Existential Understanding, Understanding of Being, and Projection of Being. It's still got to do with the relation of the background coping to having an understanding of being in it. Now, the Dasein is being in the world and in equal originality with its facticity, a world is disclosed and other Daseins are disclosed and interworldly being, beings like us are disclosed. Uh, the Dasein understands in equal originality the understanding of existence, the existence of Dasein and interworldly beings, all of those. At first, however, now comes the part I want to read. At first, however, the understanding of being Dasein and of things extant, extant in here is present at hand in, in the other. Oh, so let's read again. The understanding of being of, the, of Dasein and of things that are present at hand is not divided and articulated into specific modes of being and it is not comprehended as such. Existence, being existent, or uh, th that is, uh, that, that's existence is Dasein being extant, that is, being present at hand, being handy, <laughs> that is, the ready to hand, all, he's listing all the modes of being. These are not conceptually comprehended, each in its own sense of being, that they are, they are understood indifferently in an understanding of being that makes possible and guides the experience of nature and the self-apprehension of the history of being with one another. So what I want to say is, if th this is again this sort of background finding your way around in the world, which is something which is not separated out, but is uh, 
which makes possible in the sense of guides the, our experience of the of everything. I think all of this is, is, is very similar to being in time, and I don't think it's, we need to, to read it. It's because it's all doing, he's, just, he's explaining the understanding of being, which is fine, but it's the temporality, which is one level more basic that we want to get to. So I'm not going to read that. Uh, I'm going to go to 289. Okay, yes, here's one of these places where it looks like the world gets priority on 289, the bottom paragraph. We understand ourselves by way of things in the sense of the self-understanding of everyday Dasein. To understand ourselves from the things with which we are occupied means to project our own ability to be upon such features of the business of our everyday occupation as the feasible, urgent, indispensable expedient. Now that get, looks like it comes back to us. The Dasein understands itself from the ability to be that is determined by the success and failures of its commerce with things. The Dasein thus comes toward itself, this is where it looks like the other side, from out of the things. It expects its own can be as the can be of a being that relies on what things give or what they refuse. That sounds more like these affordances. It is as though the Dasein can, can the Dasein's can be were projected by the things, by Dasein's commerce with them, and not primarily by the Dasein itself from its own peculiar self, which exists and is always dealing with things. Now, I don't know how and why, that looks, that sounds right, and that seems like it makes it e equal the way things and Dasein contribute. I suppose you like that, uh, Tyler, then. That seems to be doing, giving more credit to the things than usual, and I... I think that that's, but I don't know if that, but that keeps getting taken back in such a way that I'm not sure that it's, that it's doing a, <coughs> a, a big deal job. Uh, it may be just existential is, is what, this para, what this section is about, but I'd like to use it to say what I wanted to say. Uh, so then we get, then I was going to read Being in Time 119, which I read a long time ago, and Tell and show you, but nobody doubts it, that what Heidegger's talking about, he calls, but it's just in case you want to look it up, 281 and 282, he talks about the pre-objective, pre pre-conceptual, and pre-ontological, that that's what he's been, ta what he's been talking about. Uh, and he talks about openness, functionality, contexture, contexture significance, and worldhood, openness, and transcendence. Those are all important ways of describing the fact that Dasein is open to and encounters entities. Uh, they all seem to me, this is on 299, they all seem to me to be put together in, in familiarity. Uh, with, with, uh, the whole list is on 299, where he says, about 20 lines down, equipment and the, and the ready to hand confront us in the horizon of an understood world. No, it's coming from the side of the world there. If it's horizon, it's always the side of the world. Equipment and the handy confront us in the horizon of an understood world. They're encountered always as interworldly beings. World is understood beforehand when objects are encountered. I didn't Oh, I didn't start, I, I wanted to start one sentence before that. In dealing with ready to hand equipment, <clears throat> Dasein always already understands functionality. That the Dasein returns to beings of that sort only from its antecedent understanding of functionality, contexture, significance, and world. Being must stand in the light of, un of understood functionality and so forth. Well, I think, I think that, fam that familiarity is a rich notion which, 
needs all of that. It, all of that is in familiarity. The functionality, the holism, the significance, and worldhood. And that's fine. I mean, I, I, I don't think that's controversial. It's just that in being in time, he just dumps them all into familiarity, and here he <coughs> sort of spreads them out. I don't have anything to say about that. Uh, 284. And then, oh yeah, and then comes these fast two paragraphs at the end, just when it looks like he might as well be talking about familiarity, and he's already done it, and he says so at the, on 301, the end of the top long paragraph. We call the unity of these relations the Dasein's being in with the sense that the Dasein possesses an original familiarity with itself and with others, with entities and extant. This familiarity is as such familiarity in a world. That's the, the same claim as in 119 in, in, in being in time. So you can put them all together and call it familiarity. And now comes these fast paragraphs where it turns out that familiarity gets spelled out. It doesn't seem to be basic. It seems to be spelled out further in the Well, where shall I read it? In the structural ones? And now we're back to the, to the ecstatic, the Zeitlichkeit, and the, that is the temporality and the temporality structure for the last paragraph, where he seems to be getting, I presume, thinks he's getting, at something that explains or is the, makes intelligible familiarity and all these other things he's been talking about. But I'm going to read some of it. The ecstatic character of time makes possible the Dasein's specific overstepping character, transcendence, and thus also the world. So notice there it's the ecstatic character and you don't even hear about horizons. But of course soon you'll hear that the, each, each one has a horizon and that, that seems like a good idea. Uh, so a little further. Uh, as removals too, and thus because of the ecstatic character of each of them, they have a horizon which is prescribed by the mode of the removal. And removal is a funny term. It means that you're putting something at a distance. The, the, the ecstasies go out to something that isn't Dazan, which is something in the world. Uh, the, carrying, the carrying away the mode of the future, past and present, which belongs to the ecstasies themselves. Uh, each ecstasis as a removal to has at the same time within itself, which is odd, because I would like to think that it has it outside itself, but has within itself and belonging to it as a pre-delineation of the formal structure of the where to of the removal. We call this wither of the ecstasies the horizon or the horizonal schema of the ecstasy. This is all extremely dense, but it seems extremely going in the Kantian wrong direction. It's all, it keeps getting, it, it, ecstasies are what's important, and then they, inside these ecstasies, or you know, implied by them or something, is the, is the world. Um, each ecstasy has within itself a complete determinate schema, which modifies itself in concordance with the manner in which the temporality temporalizes itself, the manner in which the ecstasies modify themselves. Just as the ecstasies intrinsically constitute the unity of temporality, so in each case there corresponds to the ecstatic unity of temporality, a unity of the horizonal schema. Well, that's when, you know that's gi giving them equal, which is where they should be, it would seem. Uh, and then in italics, the transcendence of being in the world, meaning that the we that there's an opening in which there can be intentionality, there can be encountering of entities, and that that world is more basic than and makes possible the encountering. The transcendence of being in the world is founded in a, its specific wholeness on the original ecstatic horizontal unity of temporality. So that's, that's still temporality. Now comes the next section where it gets harder. Temporality Tate. So the title of the next section is, and, is, and that's where you start in the assignment if you did it. Uh, 
temporality, temporalitate, and being. So it says the task now is to comprehend how on the basis of temporality that grounds Dasein's transcendence, the Dasein's temporality makes possible the understanding of be oh sorry, the Dasein's temporalitate makes possible the understanding of being. So far we've seen the temporality with a lower t makes possible the understanding of being. Uh, and but now Temporality Tate makes possible the understanding of being. What's going on? Why do, why do we say it that way? Let me read it again. On the basis of temporality that grounds the Dasein's te uh, temporality Tate makes possible. So it's somehow the temporality Tate is going to make possible the temporality that makes possible an understanding of being, I guess. Yes. And now, and we ought to be able to do ontology right off. You mean? Yeah, I, I exactly had the same feeling. I hope somebody would. You, it seems like there's a, a one level too many of explanation that there's we've already got to the to the basis on the basis of which every kind of intentionality is possible everything that shows up can show up there's a clearing namely in which they show up transcendence and now what in the world does he want more uh, I, I want you guys to help me yeah Ooh, that would be very very bad does he say that where is that? The first sentence? The task now is to comprehend how on the basis of temporality that grounds the Dasein's transcendence, the Dasein's Zeitlichkeit makes possible the understanding of being. So that is really weird. Yes, on the basis of... Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Hey, I want to give you the German because I, that first sentence is so strange. That, can you pass this back to, to Eugene? The first sentence is so strange that maybe it's wrong, but <laughs> that would help because I don't understand how on the basis of the temporality that grounds the Dasein's transcendence, which was just what we've been hearing about for the last 20 pages, the Dasein's temporality-tate makes possible the understanding of being. That is an incomprehensible sentence. Uh, so That's what it says. Yeah, what okay, well, then I don't have any idea what that means. Why is it so weird? I mean, it's just the same paragraph for saying on the basis of the type, Dasein is always already an understanding of being. Right? On the basis of the type, the Dasein has an understanding of being. Yes, and now comes then how does temporality take come in? Temporality take is also the conditions of possibility of understanding of being, right? So they're both the conditions of possibility of understanding of being. One goes through Dasein. One is supposed to be a condition prior to the early disclosure of Dasein. So but it seems to be it seems to be on the basis of temporality that temporality take does its job. It, how can it be prior? That's just the Eugene question. How can it both be prior to it and uh, do it? I mean, how can how can temporality be the basis of the understanding of being and also the basis of temporality-tate? Is that what... I'm, I'm, I got lost. Which is already the condition of the possibility. No, that's the thing. It's like it's such a story. Like you already got the story about how it does have understanding of being the type of thing, and now it seems to be saying uh, there's more to that story than you know, temporal state and it's talking about the conditions of possibility of the thing. You look like maybe the Germans helping or something.
Mm, 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 mm. Boy. And we can't say that he wasn't that he didn't have time to write this book. I mean, the, the, it would be easy if this was Division Two being in time. We could just say, "Poor Heidegger, they just didn't have time to finish the manuscript." But he, this is he had plenty of time to finish the manuscript. It took him about 50 years before this was published. I mean, he didn't. This didn't get published right away. This is a course he gave right after being in time, but he could revise it and do whatever he wanted. Anyway, so he must mean what he says there, but I don't know what it is. Uh, so let's go on. Maybe it'll get clearer. It didn't get much clearer to me, I'm afraid. Uh, so where are we? On 301, we've got there. Okay, so now adding original, very, I'm, here's my version of it. I, adding the, that this originary temporality brings back the threefold character of Dasein's temporality and the correlative temporality of the world and claiming that this ecstatic horizontal temporality is even more basic than familiarity. Oh, that's, no, that's all right. That's, th that he's been doing, that the horizontal temporality is, explains even familiarity. We can do that. But what, what it looks like uh, this other stuff that's coming in here, about not, about not ec ecstatic horizontal temporality, which is fine, remember, that's the name for the way Dasein becomes a clearing or an opening in which you can encounter entities. Now we've got this new story that we need, we need something else, namely temporality, and that's what we're trying to understand. Uh, does it help to read the third sentence? I suppose not, but I'll read anyway. In connection with it, that is temporality, we have already we have always already oriented our considerations toward the question of the possibility of specific understanding of being, namely the understanding of being in the sense of, of presence at hand in the broadest signification. Wow. Why is that? If anybody knows anything, if anybody thinks they've understood this paragraph, they should come and help. Uh, if not, I'm just going to go on reading it until some. You, 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 Tyler's got more to say about this than, than any of us, which is good. Yeah, I don't want to say that. I mean, I don't know what to say, but that somebody could say that. There's two readings of that passage. One is that Wait, we, the Heidegger in Being in Time. Oh, no, Here, okay. I, I was thinking of the one in Being in Time, where the where he gets on he gets to ontology straight from the understanding of being to ontology. The one I read earlier on, and but the, okay, well, I'm sorry, I just got sidetracked. Let's. What's he doing here? Okay. I think so. Right. 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 something up. 
Well, that's nice that's if we can make that work. So, okay. So, and I think there's a, and that's sort of what you're doing with the garage point keyboard here. But there's there's just this jumping upon which um, the garage point keyboard is sort of projecting upon. But that that dictate doesn't capture the relationship between the upon which and the basis upon which we're doing our specification. Okay, so that's one line. That's Tell us another line. I think the condition of the possibility of Dasein's temporality, namely, namely that it has something to project upon. So that's the first one. The condition of possibility is like the fact that there's something upon which it projects. Okay, and that's the might, first one. We might think temporally take as the relationship between our device of type projecting and the upon which we project. That seems plausible. We certainly have to go there. I think he's also saying that there's a condition of possibility, a further condition of possibility, of the device of type projecting upon. Well, it's it's a it's beyond being the yeah. good, as he says. Well, yeah, things. and it's uh, like the illumination in the room. This light, it's the clearing. It's the light which withdraws and lets us make makes everything intelligible. And why he needs that, which is all when he hasn't already got it. But I but I think I see what you mean. That it's something from outside the practices of Dasein has to provide this illumination in which all the, even the practices, even the coping which makes us understand being, can only take place in it. I, don't, I, I see that, that that's the structure of what he's saying, it's as a possible structure it's anyway. It's a very sort of vulgar story. Like, like that gives you the opening, which is God's and we are the opening. And it gives you intelligible entities. Uh, roughly, for entities to be intelligible in an opening, there has to be something in the middle. Uh, only by having an opening in which entities can appear, does it become permanent. But two, there has to be light, um, which makes the opening permanent. Well, okay, I mean, Eugene wants to say something about this, I see. Um, yes. 274 goes against that. Right? 274? Okay, let's go to 274. Against the light version, okay. Okay, temporality Tate is the condition of the... Where, where are you... Okay, by the way, you have the German. Uh, where it says temporality in the sentence I just looked at the, is the condition of the possibility of Dasein's being. That's Zeitlichkeit. Which, uh, which sentence? That's right. It's, it's, he, they, he puts the German in, so then I believe him. Uh, so don't, I mean, didn't you just read that as if it was temporality or did I mishear hear you? Uh, on 274. Yeah, wh what did you read what you said on 274? Ah, okay, wait, I get to get there. Its role is the condition of possibility. Okay, yeah. We shall call temporality So then that's interesting, isn't it? That just says, uh, it, it's the same thing, but it, we're giving it a new name because we're giving it a new function, or we're calling attention to a particular function, which we, in fact we've already described. Right. And we've described a function, now we're going to tell you a name for something when it's performing that function. That boy, does that make it a lot simpler? Right. And then again, the, the section 20, the second sentence, when temporality functions as such a condition, we call it uh, temporality. Gee. Right, so yeah. So all this that we've been reading about, the way temporality with a small t 
structures the understanding of being is temporality. We just going to call we, why we shouldn't do that. Just makes when uh, uh, <laughs> this is making Tyler go crazy. Okay, why not? Yes. Yes. But they aren't two different things. This passage says. This passage says it's one thing with diff- two different functions. Yeah, and which which opens a clearing in which we can encounter en- entities. Go ahead, Eugene. Yeah. Well, we could just be naming them from the point of view of their function. One of them opens up a clearing and makes intentionality possible. That's one function of this. I'm going to call it familiarity stuff. And the other, that, there, that the familiarity stuff is what makes ontology possible because it's, as you guys kept insisting, has a structure which we can spell out in a, in a science of being. And then we're going to, and when we're treating it as something whose structure we can spell out in an ontology, we're going to call it temporality tape. That's, that's how you, Eugene is reading it, I think. And that's, it seems like that's what he's saying, but it seems like such a perverse and useless thing to say, to introduce a whole fancy new terminology just to describe a different function that you've been describing already, only you haven't given it this name. Yeah, yeah. Well, I see that if you bring in light, you go, you, it's not going to be th- that we're just renaming things. But he looks as if he just says the role of condition of the possibility of the understanding of being both pre-ontological and ontological, we will call temporality. And, and we've been just discussing that role, and we discussed it fine in being in time on page uh, 119 without ever having to bring in this technical term. And that's weird. But so, uh, anybody else who wants to join in, yeah, go ahead. Where are you? Where are you? This is 302. Because I don't understand what you're saying, but that's probably because I'm not on 302. Okay, let's go to 302. Now tell us where you are. Of, of temporality, the, 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 the yes, and and then the, there we haven't even gotten to temporality. That is not a capital T yet. Okay, well then, what do you add? Why is he adding this ca- capital T at this point? Are you are you trying? Are, are you saying that we need to explain how come that all these horizons, all these ecstasies have horizons, and that we sort of need another something or other to explain that? That would be an interesting move. Is that what you were saying already? That seems to be a new possibility.
well, under a new something. Let's go, we don't want to call it a new horizon, or we go, he warns that we go into a regress if we do that. Uh, but but it's, uh, 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 some new some new something or other, which we call temporality. But does he ever say that he wants to do that? Is it, I don't remember. Yeah. Right? He's certainly not in being in time. In being in time, he just says, bah, every ecstasy is a, is a removal. It must be a removal to something. Whatever it's a removal to, we're going to call that the horizon. And no problem. And now all of a sudden, he's got a problem. How to get the ecstasies together with the horizons. Well, he's got another two years. He could get a new problem. But uh, I don't see it yet. between the ecstasies and the horizons. Where, where's the quote? That's so interesting. I mean, that, if that were true, that would certainly be helpful. Where do you get that? That's when I think I got desperate for affordances, that there, there's something out there that is soliciting me, or so Dasein. Dasein is coping with something. It's got an ecstatic structure that uh, enables it to encounter things and cope with them. But things have this other aspect, namely they solicit us to deal with them and cope with them. And that's what temporality tells us, is how... It, it fills in the horizon in some phenomenological way as not a projection, but a response to a solicitation. That would be turning him into Merleau-Ponty. I would like that, and, and, but I don't know if there's any... And I have down here sort of passages which I think might be read that way, but I see what you're saying. Well, I, I have an idea about how to deal with that as a problem. So let me stop there, and I'll because we need. To, I'll try to put in some text. But first, I thought I saw another person who wanted to contribute to this incomprehensible discussion. No. Okay. Well, then we'll go on. Uh, I have to see where I am. So we're at the bottom of 302 with that complicated worry about what's going to explain what. So you think, I gather, uh, tell me your first name again. I'm still... Alex. Alex? Okay, Alex. You think, Alex, that this soup, the sentence that comes close to saying what you just said is five lines from the bottom of 302. It must now be shown explicitly how the understanding of the readiness of readiness to hand uh, is as such a world understanding and how this world understanding as Dasein's transcendence is rooted in the ecstatic horizontal constitution of Dasein's temporality. But he seems, I mean, I still don't, I mean, he doesn't seem to think there's any problem. It's as if he thinks that he just has to do what he's done already in being in time and in here. Uh, has he, what's he going to show? How uh, the, the world does a,
We temporarily take in being in time? If it was doing anything, I think the best guess would have been it posited these two different types of temporal etching, and somehow they have to come together. What two different modes of temporal etching? So oh, yeah, authentic, authentic and inauthentic. No, so you get the authentic and inauthentic, which he thinks are unified. But he thinks that actually doesn't, those two modes of temporal etching can't account for the multiplicity of ways in which entities show up in their modes of being. It's either ready to hand or present. So he has to tell us. Okay, I mean, go ahead, Eugene. You, I can see you want to say so. Well, Alex, go ahead. Well, stop, stop. I'm lost. I can't find you. We're on bottom of 305. Yeah. Where at the bottom of 305? Uh, when we describe the handy, that's starting there. Okay, now go ahead. Well, let me let's get, let, read it. Start over now, where you were. And presence is a dimension of, of uh, temporality. And, and it's going to make something intelligible. You're, you're on, a, on an important track. What are we going to make? We, we understand the handy as a mode of being of handiness. This antecedent understanding of the handiness of the handy is we get thanks to temporality. The understanding of the handiness of the handy. So weird. I mean, we've understood that since back in the beginning of being in time. It's practically the first thing in being in time tells us that what we encounter most of the time is the handiness of the handy. Uh, maybe it's understanding the handiness of the handy as a way of being. I'm just trying to desperately generate a problem. Yeah, you got you got to generate a problem. <laughs> no, go ahead. What are you going to do? Does he? Yeah, so that's, what, that's why we have to do the temporality and everyday concerns. Ah. But there, I mean, all of those things, it, the, the, in Division 2, it doesn't go, we need to understand uh, temporality and everyday concerns, how I can see the horizon come together, and all that's a big problem, and how to solve it after they get later. Right? It goes, uh, there's a temporal problem of the transcendence of the world, here's the solution, here's the temporality of everyday concern, right? Here's how we make sense of all these things. That's what it's supposed to do. I, I mean, I didn't, you didn't hear you well enough. Say it again. I just didn't. But it's not like, it's not like Division 2 is setting up a problem that he thinks he's only going to solve later. No, he looks like he thinks he solved it in Division 2. Yeah. It? yeah. And, and here again, it looks like it's, uh, it's the same thing. So on the, on the, on the 302 side, oh. um, the, the second sentence of that section, he says, the most original temporalizing of temporality as such is temporarily tape. So that's again, it's the same, it's, it's the same thing, right? So temporarily tape just is I don't see where you are, but I'm happy with it anyway. Uh, section 21, the second sentence. 303, did you say? 302, the second sentence. The ecstatic character, let's see, uh, of, 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 oh, oh, I see. Oh, I got it now. Okay, the most original temporizing. As such a simple. Temporality Tate makes possible the understanding of being. The most original temporizing of temporality is as such is, it's like the same redefining again. It's saying that that aspect of temporalizing, which we've already discussed, we're now going to f focus on that aspect, and then we're going to call it uh, temporal temporality tape. Is that Yeah, that's right. And but it, it, it's calling it, giving it a new name because now we're interested in its uh, what? How it does that. How it does it. 
Okay. Yeah, you, uh, Alex again. Whoa, whoa, whoa! It doesn't say it to me. I, where do you see oh, the? I'm sorry, I'm 305. Sorry. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Where on 305? Okay. I never found that sentence. Tell me again where it is. Okay, I see. Way down. Okay, just a second now. The now is the determination time. Yeah, but that's a way off different issue. I mean, that tells you how wrong all the traditional people have been, period. Yeah, but it, it, he's, he's got to do, be doing more than answering the tradition because that got answered in being in time already. I mean, that we aren't going to have any super supra-temporal and, uh, and now series doing the job of explaining worldhood. What? And he's just giving it a new name. I think that's what we're converging. Well, I see. Now, there, Tyler, we can't. There's a, so, there, so why not, Tyler? I don't, I don't know what to think. I'm, I'll say I'm neutral. What's that? It's a name for primordial temporality under the description yeah. of, of basis for ontology, something so like that. Whenever we see any, any formulation which is something like temporal escapism um, is, is primordial type of thing, we should not allow ourselves to collapse into the book. We're not going to do that. Just as before we had said primordial time is type of thing. And we said we call that the type primordial time because of the book. And he has an argument about how, why it's just. Okay, well then we have to understand what we've added. So either... Okay. Yeah, well that, that does seem like he might be doing that. Yeah. be nice. I'm just bringing in my desire to find phenomena that I can already understand. If the, he was saying both that we need to understand sort of how the world uh, solicits us to make our projections, that would be the uh, the afford the you know the yeah the well solicitation story, and the light would be something like the 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 holistic. A uh, bunch of all the affordances. I mean, there there be two. There would be two things. We need to understand how existential, particular things, solicit us to cope with them, 
and we need to understand how there is some holistic background which, uh, in which all these particular ones are intelligible. That's the light. <laughs> is that sort of the structure you would like? Well, I want some content for the light. That's what I'm struggling for. I want to know what phenomenon it is. It isn't Plato. We, we agree. But the structure, I want the structure to be the same. But temporally stated, it's a formal condition of possibility of letting it And then you see that obvious phenomena. But there's actually no concrete phenomena. Hmm. In order to think of an encounter with an encounter that could be in an opening, you have to think of light. You have to think of that light as given outside of God when it's in the light. Well, I, uh, yeah. That is why? That is a primordial temporality story. That's supposed to be how primordial temporality is. Temporal uh, space is it? No, it's not primordial temporality. It's not supposed to be what solves the temporal problem of the transcendence of the world. It's the clearing I, I, in that uh, there. And the clearing seems to be the same as the light. So he, is that what you mean? Uh, uh, I, guess, well, I guess, yeah. It has, it has the horizons already. It has the horizons, and it's uh, the background, the sort of intelligibility. That's the. It, 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 that. I wrote in my margin. Where is it? That where it sounded just like the clearing when he talked about the light, and he calls it. Uh, where is the light talk? It, it, at Plato talk. It's when he finally sort of tr transforms Plato into his own story. Somebody must be able to find it. It goes on for several pages. I lost it completely. You got it? What? My notes say it should be on 282. 282. Is that where he got the play? He gets to Plato at the. Oh, here it is, 281. For I got near the top, five lines down, for I can comport towards beings only if those beings can themselves be encountered in the brightness of the understanding of being. This is the necessary condition uh, in terms of fundamental ontology. It can be expressed by saying that all understanding is essentially related to an affective self-finding which belongs to the understanding itself. It's funny, it goes off into talking about mood and stuff at that point, which is not... Is that what you think is okay for what you want to say? Okay, no sense is needed to make clear how immediately in our attempt to get beyond being to the light from which and in which it itself comes into the brightness of an understanding we are moving is one of one of Plato's fundamental problems. I'm going, to, I'm going to give a wild interpretation of this, which I, I mean, don't, don't all throw things at me. But I mean, uh, there is one issue which he could be worrying about, I'm going to try to spell this out, which has not been faced at all. And that is, well, how are we conscious of all this? Uh, of course, he's not going to be able to say that. That consciousness doesn't show up in the book at all, except in the, one of the last sentences of Being in Time, in which he says we ought to talk about it sometime. But, so he's not going to say, how are we going to become conscious of all this? But that's got to do with the illumination. It's sort of, it's sort of it, what, well, what is it? How, let's try next. Well, how do we become aware of all this? Well, that's getting closer. If you're not aware of the, of the equipment and aware of the present at hand stuff and, and aware of the... Uh, affordances, you, you're nowhere. And he hasn't talked about it because he wants to stay out of that. That's 
falling back into Descartes. So it's not awareness. So let's back a little safer. Maybe he's talking about the way you have to take account of the door. Remember, I talked about this a lot earlier. As you do the two go out, even though you don't have to notice the door, be aware of the door, be a conscious of the door, nonetheless, the door had better be, maybe, illuminated for you. I mean, you can't go out the door if in some sense you haven't picked it up in its intelligibility as the to go out. So I copied my favorite sentence in here. What is first of all given, and he says every once in a while that he's talking about what is antecedently uh, there. So what is first of all given is the four writing, four going in and out, four sitting. This writing, going in and out, sitting and the like is what we are a priori involved with, what we know when we know our way around. Maybe this is a story of the way we are taking account of all the stuff he's been writing about as we know our way around in the world, and he can't call it consciousness or awareness or noticing, so he'll call it the way our illumination, the way uh, our uh, activity is illuminated. Does that make you, how do you feel about that? Is that what being in time says story? Is that what being in time says? I don't know. I don't find it in being in time. Yes, I think it is, except that uh, it is and it isn't. It manages to talk about all the time somehow they're showing up, but it doesn't really talk about the what it is for them to show up or something like that. It just, and now I guess, I'm not sure he's talked about it now, given it a new name, illumination and so forth, but it looks like, I mean, I'm just trying to say the only thing I can think of that he hasn't talked about already in being in time explicitly, even in a formal way, is the fact that we are in some way or another aware or taking account of all this. How does it show up in being in time? What's it, what language is it? Isn't that minus? Minus. Ah. Ah. I doubt it. I think minus is more on the side of authenticity, and it has to do with my calling. This is a different comment. Well, yeah, I, I think well, this is, some of you are going to find this a little off the beam for a minute, but I think everybody's got a calling, even when they're uh, not listening to the calling of their silent conscience, letting the one drown it out. So I think, mine, I think minus is way over in that sort of existentialist Thing. I don't think it's mine. It seems odd to think that it's mine. It's just that I'm taking account of the door as I respond to the two go out. It doesn't seem very mine to the two go the two go out. Anybody's two go out. It, it, it could be a very dasman to go out that, that, that I'm responding. So I want I want something like how it is that we are taking account of all this. How it is that these things are showing up and. But I must say, I don't see the temporality really contributes anything to how, we're, how things are showing up, except name it, or the illumination maybe names it. Uh, uh, Alex again. No. Um, I guess I'm trying to boil it down, obviously, it's just about Heidegger and faith. Yeah. Yes. It, it, it worries me only that I don't see that it's explaining anything. It just seems to be naming something. But he thinks, so we've got to be careful. I mean, he thinks that he's doing something besides just rename familiarity. He thinks he's explaining something about familiarity which he hasn't explained before. And well, I, I can only say one more thing. I mean, the two things it seems to me he hasn't explained 
but I'm not sure I can map them onto what he's worrying about, is the holism of all these practices, how they all hang together in one unified world that we can find our way around in, instead of just being coping with you know, hammers over here and with people uh, I in the classroom, you know. And so there's some, th some unified phenomenon called world, and I don't know if he thinks that he's done a uni tell us a story about that. Uh, yeah? No, not yet. I want to go on. What? Wait, the two of the two. And the other one is, again, I think that he's put something like the awareness of it, of, as we find our way around in the world, we're responding to the to go in and out and so forth. And there must be some way that we're, I hate to say it, experiencing them, uh, and that he wants to do something. But I don't understand, I'm afraid, how the temporality hate story does something for either. Jason, yeah. The, 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 it's through history our practices have become more and more inter, interdefined and unified. Possibly that would be a Hegel-like move. I mean, just to sort of look at the phenomena, how do we know that those are used to go in and out of rooms? Or now, but that's not, that's an epistemological question. That doesn't well, I mean, interest me. For, for how do we account for the practice of going in and out of rooms? Is that based on our historical... Well, it's not how do we account for it. How do what's how is it how does it show up for us? What is it what is it for it to show up for us? And and that's one. And what is it to be integrated in a referential whole? I mean, the, of significance. That's I've got quotes about this where it looks like the the the, the Zeitlichkeit has something to do with the, the the significance story. But anyway, you want to say something, and then I'll get back to my quotes. Dasein in its unity, but how about the world in its unity? The, the world that I'm finding my way around in, which he talks about. That the world is a characteristic of Dasein, right? Yeah, but somehow the unity of Dasein, namely what it gets when it's authentic, it seems like you can't get out of that the way all these practices hang together so that I can find my way around in the world. You're talking world. about the unity of Dasein with its world? That oh, that unity, yes. Yeah, self and world get unified. So that's, the, that's the transcendence of the world, right? That's the that, the, when, when he's got it, the way we, yes, he says self and world are just two aspects of the phenomena being in the world, and we, that's we are the world existingly right. story. So we did all that. We did all that. Yeah. Uh, we did it without asking just how we are aware of, and what I'm trying to put in there, I mean, we are the, the world existingly, yes, that is, and what does that mean? It means at least this, that we are defined by a for the sake of which, and the practices all end up in a for the sake of which, and it's the same for the sake of which. We've gone through it, and therefore it's uni unified. That's fine. But I still think it, you need a kind of question, yeah, but how, are all the, how come all the particular practices add up to one world of significance? Where did that come from? That doesn't seem to follow from the fact that there's a bunch of for the sake of witches in, out here, so to speak, and a bunch of Daseins taking stands on their being, how come that meshes like that? The, 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 the temporality Tate answers that as I doubt. I mean, I don't know. I don't see how it answers it. It seems, if anything, maybe names it. I saw a hand over here. Did I? Did I on the periphery? Okay, Jason. I think the practices are uh, the world. I mean, when you find your way, when you find your way around in the world, you find your way in a, not just practices, in a coherent, interrelated stuff of practices, equipment, other people, uh, roles defined by the, the the one. All that goes to make up the phenomenon of world. I I take it. Well, I think it's, you want, I see what you mean, uh, yeah, there's a, uh, but I, maybe it's more what I said to Eugene is appropriate, not that the practices are all unified, because maybe they aren't. Maybe they're practices and of the, I don't know, the, the bikers, which just aren't unified with the practices of, of, the, of the 
Christians or something. So, but, but maybe the right thing is to say we want to understand better how self and world are unified and, and why it should be obvious that there's a, there's a for the sake of which for every, for every Dasein and an in order to for all the streams of equipment and the streams of equipment and the uh, and Daseins all get connected in, in a way that, make, that works. That I'm not sure that what to make of that because I don't think he's got an answer to that if that is a real question even. Yeah. Well, I did. I mean, I sort of accepted it without saying clearly enough that I accepted it. Yeah, that's when I said, you know, maybe the bikers and the Christians aren't really unified, but a lot of the Zitlishkeit, the customs that have come down to us, have gotten more and more integrated. I call that the Hegelian sort of thing. So that's a, so when you ask sort of how come all the practices don't get in the way of each other, you can tell a historical, sociological, Dasmanish story. Pragmatic. Pragmatic. So then, but I stick to the other thing. I mean, I think he's got a problem of how he just neatly made self and world connect. And, but I don't know. Let me, let me take time, because I'm going to be unhappy if time runs out. I have quotes that sort of, sort of go in the direction I'm trying to go, so I want to at least read them, and then we can see if they do or don't work. So let me find out where I am. Mm. So do we, I mean, we are all agreeing the temporality grounds familiarity, which grounds the understanding of being, are we, in spite of those weird sentences in which they, it isn't clear how they all relate. Temporality is that on the basis of which there is familiarity, and uh, on the basis of familiarity, we encounter the various ways of being. I, I, never mind. I'm, that's regressing into our discussion. In our discussion, I want to go where I am now. So we got to Byzance on 309. This is in the actual reading, so f everybody should feel at home now. This is the stuff that you suppo supposedly, at least, tried to understand. Um, <coughs> Well, here's an interesting one. Under the light of the, our discussion, it now seems to me to be m mean something different than I would have thought. Namely, but I'm just feeling unhappy that what's happening with this. Is it still recording what we're talking about? It looks like it is. Yeah. Okay. At the top of 309, the, it, that I now think this isn't what I thought it was. I thought it was... Uh, well... Let's read it and see what it is. The handiness of the handy, the being of this kind of beings, is understood as presence. Presence which, as non-conceptually understandable, is already unveiled in the self-projection of temporality by means of those temporalizing anything like existent by means of whose temporalizing anything like existent commerce with entities handy and extent becomes possible. Uh, so that, I mean, I, I marked that, I guess, because I couldn't tell whether that presence is, an, is, is, is part of temporality, right? So it looks like now he's supposed to, he should be contributing something new uh, there, and, but, it, but I haven't understood it there yet because I don't see what, what, what's being added. So I was going on trying to find out. Uh, it's, it seems like what makes our openness to familiarity possible, I said. Let's see if we can a answer that. What could that be? Ah, yeah, well, here I am going off into this thing, which I already did, but I hope maybe I've got pages now. Th then I said, we're awareness of th our things, uh, and we're going to describe the passage which I thought I sort of understood something was 309, and it looked like for a while there was a phenomena he was talking about, about two-thirds of the way down. And it was when he says he's going to talk about presence and absence and affordances, I think, something like affordances. So in, in, on page 309 in the second paragraph, about 50 lines down, 
We do not always and continually have explicit perception of the things surrounding us in a familiar environment. See, that got me off thinking, gee, he's, he understands that we sometimes have explicit perception of the things in our environment. That sounds like Merleau-Ponty more than Heidegger, even mentioning that we perceive the things. And then he says, going on, certainly not in such a way that we would be aware of them expressly as handy. So now we're going to talk about awareness. And we're going to say, well, we're aware of handy things, of, of, you know, ready-to-hand things, but of course we're not explicitly perceiving them, that is, noticing them, nor are we uh, aware of them as handy. That's this business of the two go out. You don't have to notice the door. You don't have to be aware that, that it's functioning equipment. It is precisely because an explicit awareness and assurance of their being at hand does not occur, that we have them around us in a peculiar way, just as they are in themselves. Well, that's good. I mean, that's just to say that we don't, we've got them around us, and we cope with them, and we take account of them, but we don't have to be explicitly aware of them. In the, in, in the indifferent imperturbableness of our customary commerce with them, they become accessible precisely with regard to their unobtrusive presence. Well, all of that is already in being in time, but it looks like he's coming back to this, this issue, and it looks like it is a kind of story about how we, I want to say in some minimal way, take account of the things that we cope with. The presupposition for the possibility of the possible equanimity of our dealing with things is, among others, the uninterrupted quality of the commerce. It must not be held up in progress. That's fine. Um, in Dewey language, he's talking about un ongoing coping. It's amazing how similar they are at that point. At the basis of this undisturbed imperturbability of our comments with things, there lies a peculiar temporality. Well, now we're going to see if we can get Zeitlichkeit in here. A peculiar temporality which makes it possible to take a handy equipmental context here in such a way that we lose ourselves in it. So he said already in being in time that we, when we're coping, are absorbed and lose ourselves in the hammering or whatever. Now he says that, I don't know whether it really answers anything, but there's a peculiar temporality, a peculiar dimension of temporality Tate, which is what makes it possible for us to lose ourselves in things when we cope with them. At least there's a phenomenon there. I don't understand what what he's doing but naming it, but he's got something there. So let's go on. The temporality of dealing with equipment is primarily an, an presenting, but according to what was previously said, there belongs to it a specific presential constitution of the horizon of the present. So we're in the horizon business. This is all sort of as near Merleau-Ponty as Heidegger's ever going to get. So we're uh, the constitution of the horizon of the present on the basis of which the specific presence of the handy in distinction, say, from the merely present at hand, becomes antecedently intelligible. There's the antecedently. I mean, so what is first of all given is the us immersing ourselves in going out the door. That's, that's the, I think that's the bottom line, and maybe it's more bottom, maybe, than anything he says in being in time. The undisturbed character of imperturbable commerce with the handy becomes visible as such if we contrast it with the disturbed quality and so forth. Well, that's it. So has he added anything to being in time? Has he told us that, that, that at least that, there is a, that we have to explain absorption and uh, ongoing coping and uh, a capacity, it's a capacity we've got and we're going to call it uh, presence and, that's, and we're going to focus on it because... It's a capacity we've got that lets us uh, take account of the horizon, what, what the horizon points to, removes itself to. So we now get to take account of and get absorbed in the ready to hand. That's presence, that's a, a part of temporality tape. Is that, I mean, I don't think I'm making it up. I'm just not sure that it's getting us anywhere that we weren't already. Uh, let me, I'm going to just finish. I've almost got to where I... Uh, so there's one more move, just as long as I've got them all. There, there's another thing that he's going to add here that I don't think he ever added. 
which is uh, how it is that we deal with things that are absent, equipment that is absent. He says we, we experience it as absent, it gets in the way and all that. But then he starts asking on 311 about the phenomenon of absence. Uh, that is, it's, there has to be some kind of expectation for something to be experienced as absent, and that is in italics, the top of 311, a specifically modified horizon of the presence, of presence. And what it seems to be, it's a special horizon called absence, now all spelled funny. And I think that is, and then skipping a little, if circumspection letting function were not from the very outset an expectance, and if this expectance did not temporalize itself as an ecstasis, in ecstatical unity with impresenting itself as a uh, pertinent horizontal schema, if that weren't all there, antecedently unveiled, first of all given in the ecstatic unity, if Dasein, that couldn't happen if Dasein were not a temporal Dasein in the original sense and so forth. So I think all that means that, is that we have a kind of readiness along with the fact that we, that things solicit us and let us become absorbed in them that's one of the things that happens that he's talking about. When the things aren't there that we are ready to, get, to deal with and become absorbed in, then we have a kind of readiness, and he's never talked about that, a kind of readiness which is our relation to something absent which we were expecting would be present, to account for something experienced as missing. And maybe, I mean, what I'm happy about is at least I think I see the phenomenon is near the surface for a change. Now, if we can just relate those phenomena to, some te for, to what temporality is supposed to enable us to understand that we haven't understood before, we'd be in, in good shape. Did, did anybody want, yeah, did, uh, well, okay, Alex. Okay, sounds plausible. That's what I'm saying too. It's missing. And how could it be missing if unless we had a readiness and expectance, as he calls it, to use it. And, and, and that's somehow going to be called, par sense, that's, that's a, a dimension of primordial temporality which he hasn't talked about in being in time. That's, that's all I can say about it. And you better have it. And, it. and if you have a notion of presence and absence, these two funny words, then you have a way of explaining aspects of the use of the ready to hand, which he hadn't explained in being in time, and so that there's some excuse for giving them a new name. I mean, at least they, they're, they're new phenomena that he's introducing, and he's claiming, and this is, I don't find it very explanatory, but he's claiming that uh, some, what are you going to call it, some, uh, I would don't want to say structure after all the trouble I went to to get rid of structure, some what? Some, some aspect of Dasein's coping capacity or something like that is what he's interested in. And presence allows him to describe aspects. It, it's a rich phenomenon, remember, he says. So why doesn't it include readiness, for instance, and uh, solicitations and significance, which is how they're all interrelated? All of that has to go into our finding something either ready to hand or missing. He just produces missing in being in time. He doesn't say, well, how can Dasein cope? How can Dasein uh, experience missing? I find, I find myself talking in awareness and experience terms, but I think it's all right. Okay. In the now, you want to say something, right? Really? Uh -huh.
I was trying to do that. Well, ah, ah, I see. Well, I guess I want to put presence on the side of world. That's the affordance side. That's definitely on the side of world. But I do want to put readiness on the side, the absence part on the side of Gaza. alteration in the in in the way the world shows up. So the reason yes. when my hammer goes missing is not because I changed my projected structure. You know, That's good. It's literally as if something in the underlying became absent, right? That's good. That's good. The world looks like it lacks something. That's in the the look so of the world. How about I, 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 I'll meet you halfway? How about a correlation between that and our activity? Because they have, I mean, we have to have a readiness, or think, or the world isn't going to look different. I was ready to. I got to sw switch to Sartre. How many know the famous Sartre stuff about Pierre in the cafe? Anybody? He obviously got it from Heidegger. This well, I don't know. He didn't read. He didn't read this, so maybe he got it from the phenomena. But anyway, once you're looking for Pierre in the uh, cafe. And now in my terms, you've got this readiness to see Pierre, and he isn't there, and now everything looks different. The cafe looks like it lacks Pierre, and it looks like it takes both. It takes something on from the side of the world, namely the, the world without him, and it takes something on the side of us, namely readiness to see him, and that's all right. They, I mean, uh, I think it's enough if Heidegger keeps you know the world side in there and doesn't reduce it to the readiness, which I almost did. Uh, and the, what was the other thing? Oh, yeah, and the two go in and out and so forth. That's certainly on the side of the world. And if I'm in the, uh, and if I'm dealing with things as to go out, then he has to have a story about how that, I can do that without, now let me think a minute. Uh, Well, I'm projecting going out. I'm trying to think of the parallel. I'm projecting going out, and that amounts to respond. And the world then shows up as two go out, and I respond to the two go out. I mean, if I if I'm not projecting going out, then the door doesn't show up as the two go out. But and but I can project all I want about of two going out. And if there isn't any door, then there won't be any experience of. Uh, anything affording going out, you've got to have both again. So I would like to think that presence and thereby as an example of temporality Tate is an example of the phenomenon that, he's, that he wants to get at as the basic way Dasein, in coping, Dasein is the world existingly. It has a lot of structure and he's trying to tell us the structure. Now, the question is, how does that relate to what he says about the temporality as this sort of more fundamental phenomenon than, than uh, temporality? Uh, it is more fundamental, but in a kind of phenomenological way which might not be appropriate for this very abstract discussion. I don't know. Tyler probably thinks it's, it's not. Like what? I know we're at the extremes of formal and phenomenal now. Okay. But roughly, I can buy into your story. So there's a meshing of a readiness, but a real underlying um, presence or absence. They need to mesh. And temporality is not an activity um, of God. Uh, temporality takes the first. It's not an activity of God. But it's the get conditions of possibility of those two things meshing. It's just formal. It's that which we have to think. There must be 
say something on the basis of which the real underlying alteration of the door being there or not being there somehow meshes with my making the door present. That's how it's taped. You can't get that meshing just on the side of Playboy's face. There's no guarantee that it will meshing. That's how it's taped. It's just... Well, why? I mean, that's interesting. Well, but why leave it formal? I mean, it's, I think there's nothing wrong with it being formal. But then, and maybe that's all he's saying in here. But, I mean, once you've got the form, we, I think you're saying somehow we can't fill it in. The phenomenon couldn't live up to what the form is asking it to be. And I want to say, sure, we can fill it in. I just filled it in. And, and, but, and you, why not? But you might be right. He isn't filling it in. I'm putting it in. Uh, And with something wrong with what I filled it in, with something that has too objectified it or conceptualized it or something. Some basis behind that. So what we want is your phenomena in which two things have to mesh. One of the phenomena is on the side of the world, so it's not just us not doing stuff to you and against Wagner. But then we, we have to stipulate, we have to think something outside of Dawson's activity that brings them together. Um, but the only evidence for that thing, Kemper will take, is the fact that they are brought together. But there's no further phenomena. I'm trying to see if I, yeah, I get used to it and, and it's okay with me. Uh, Okay, I agree, and I think, I mean, and, and, and that, I would say, is the minimal, at least this much. You know, in a formal way, Heidegger is trying to fight his way out of idealism, namely grounding it in uh, temporality with a small t, which is a structure of Dasein's activity. Uh, that's, and he's trying to explain why or how or that. I guess maybe that there is always a horizon tied up with every uh, activity. And he needs that to, he's got this phenomenon of m something being missing. Once you've got gone that far toward the phenomenon, it seems to me you ought to be able to, allowed to go on and give the phenomenon that makes something missing, uh, that makes it possible to experience something that's missing. But anyway, certainly the formal thing is in there, and I'm glad. And... I want to fill in the phenomenon because I just, if there is such a th formal something or other, then either, but this is what I just realized listening to uh, Tyler. I mean, there are two possibilities again. Either Heidegger just isn't telling us because it's not his business to write the phenomenology of perception and so forth, or it's something we can't think and conceptualize and point to. I think that's more what you think. And that would be something like the way the time-free movements of nature can only show up for us in the clock and already counted as nows. And that you can't talk about or think about or make intelligible the time-free movements of nature. They are unintelligible, Heidegger says. They just have to be there to get to mesh with our concerns in order for there to be a clock, in order that we can count the nows. And maybe here again, we're going to say something like, well, you can't really talk about what it is about Dasein that makes it able to experience something that's missing, which I call readiness. That's too psychological and too much cognitive science. We don't know about that. But there has to be, there has to be something that Dasein is open to when something is missing. And we can't say anything more about how, how Dasein has that openness. That's what you think. And that might be true. Uh, th that's fine. And then, uh, and the other one was what? The, the was, oh, the affordances. Again, maybe that's who existential. After all, we want to stay on the level, uh, if we want to stay on the level of world, that's not what we can do. But we shouldn't stay on the level of world. The surprise end story is on the level of coping with particular equipment, it seems to me. And if it is, then you want to know how that particular equ equipment uh, manifests itself to Dasein or something like that. And then I want to talk about solicitations, 
But I, then I want to say, well, Heidegger, instead of saying Heidegger says you can't talk about it, Heidegger just not, is not in the business of talking about it. He's not going to give a cognitivist account of the existential fact that, uh, what now? That uh, there is on the side of the world, uh, if I don't say solicitations, what do I say? It's all right? Okay, then there is on the side of the world affordances. That's fine with me. Okay, it's just time to stop.